Hello and welcome everybody to day two of the Mythic Dungeon International. I'm your host, Doe. Along with me are Nagura, Zyronic, Tettles, who can only be described as, as swarthy, I would say, with, with the amount of buttons un unbuttoned there. You're going for a very swarthy look, the windswept hair, a kind of almost pirate-oriented look, which if we go to Celia's Gambit, would seem appropriate. Wouldn't you agree? Can you can you just can you spell that word for me? I have to Google it real quick. <laughs> uh, it's like S W A R T H Y, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Do we have the definition card for that's... Swarthy up there? That's uh, uh -huh. no. I Did I get that wrong? Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, anyways, <laughs> there is no Sully's game. No, there is that's not what I was thinking of at all. <laughs> there is a Streets of Wonder. My vocabulary the, is not very good. As the first <laughs> anyway. dungeon today between Echo and Yappers, <laughs> and uh, I think it's going to be very competitive. <laughs> It certainly will be, that's for sure. Well, yeah, that's right. We've got six matches today. We've got our upper bracket semifinals, and we've got uh, you know a bunch of and elimination matches down in the lower bracket. How can you follow that up? The girl, what, what do you feel we're going to see today? Is, is it going to be some close-up? Right, we're going to take a look at the uh, dungeons first. And as you can see, we will be starting out today with streets. So, can't avoid it. It's happening. Yeah. The music will I mean... be played. We haven't seen streets at all yesterday, right? And everyone kind of wondered um, what Echo is doing in streets because it was a time trial dungeon and they were, I think, like a couple of minutes faster than everyone else. So everyone is kind of expecting uh, to see uh, what exactly they're doing uh, in that dungeon for it to be so much quicker than everyone else. And that's exactly what we're going to be playing first. And Echo has to play this dungeon. They have to show their strategy. Of course, we have different affixes compared to the time trials. So it might not be as quick or it might be different. But I'm definitely very excited to see what they uh, have to show for us in the dungeon, what their secret strategy is. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and you can only hide stuff for so long, right, Zyronic? I mean, at some point, like, even though obviously Echo is favored as, like, the, the best team definitively in this group, you're going to need to kind of reveal what some of the plans are, right? Yeah, and of course, as you go further into the bracket, you're not really going to be able to hide strategies so much because the quality of the team will get better and better. In addition to the streets and Gambit, however, we're also starting to see Court of Stars enter the, the pool of dungeons for almost all of our matches today. And... It could just kind of be a dark horse pick for some of these teams. Could be a dungeon that maybe they've practiced and don't want to get banned. So I'm actually interested to see whether or not teams will actually focus their bans on Court of Stars or if they'll leave it open and kind of just roll the dice. Important to mention Court of Stars does have a different affix than everything else. Doesn't have that encrypted affix. We're using Infernal, which is slightly different. Essentially gives you a little bit of a buff going into every single boss. Yeah, and uh, so the question is, like, it's, it's not... Uh, that difficult of a FX to deal with as far as like you you know you don't need to like learn a huge new skill then again like it's not something that you've been able to practice on live for a little while like is just banning court of uh, stars the way to go like or do we run into situations where both teams think they ban it because it's blind bans and then they end up playing it anyway like do you think we're what are the what's the likelihood that we're actually going to see it today I, I think that if there was a team that's going to play it it would probably be echo um so like I, I would I would have a high expectation that ha they have put a decent amount of practice time into it. For one, they did TGP. Um, the squad did... Most of them did the TGP together. There was a little bit of difference. But at the same time, they have a long history of uh, playing in the MDI. And so Court of Stars is a dungeon that they've played a lot. Uh, on the other side, Yeppers, it, it just kind of comes down, at least in this series, to how much they've practiced it. I could see Court of Stars going through um, from this section, though, as like a, a missed ban. For some of the other matches, it just really kind of depends on their experience with the dungeon, how often mm -hmm. they've played it, how, how much they've practiced it. I do think that overall, though, the Legion dungeons are probably going to be some of the most commonly seen bans because teams just have less experience on them because they haven't practiced them in multiple years, basically. True enough. Well, here's our bracket for today, of course. First, we're going to see Echo versus Yepers, which you mentioned already. Then it's going to be Baldi taking on Evolved. Then down in the lower bracket, we've got Apes Together Strong versus Dwarf This, Witness Cuties versus Incarnation, and then, you know, we'll see where things end up after that. Uh, it's it's going to be a lot of eliminations today. Obviously, the teams that do get knocked out have that chance at the last chance qualifier later on, but uh, you, you don't want to get sent home this early, do you? 
Yeah, definitely not, because in that um, last stand tournament, there's of course going to be all those teams that didn't make it in the normal groups, plus also additional groups that can qualify that uh, weren't part of the group stage at all. And at that point, only one single team is going to make it out of that tournament, and that's not what you want to see. So they want to go as far as possible in this uh, group stage and want to get top two, so they don't have to think about that last, turn turn last stand tournament and immediately go to the finals. Yeah, exactly. The route is, is easier that way. But Th if you had to pick two teams to get through in this group, like Echo, but then who's the other team that goes through? Is anyone is anyone bold enough to make a prediction right now? Ooh, hmm. that's tough. Oh, the winner, it's the winner of the upper semis, uh, which is the, the yeah. it's the winner of the next round is what I think is going to be my favorite. So the winner of Baldi versus Evolved. I think that yeah, I would personally I have to put, I would have to put my wager on Baldi that that team was okay. complexity last season. They made the global finals. I, I think that they have like some of the most MDI experience compared to where Evolved is. Ooh, quarter stars did get Ooh. banned by well, Yuppers. Unfortunate. I'm surprised yep, we that got... a hall spend by Echo. Really? Why is that? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking they would ban Spires or Theater of Pain because I might be wrong on this one, but when I, whenever I think of Spires and Theater, I think the that's not like their strong suit when it comes to Echo, because those dungeons are not as open, they're more linear. Uh, of course, in theater, you can choose which path you go, but there aren't that many like different trash pulls you can do. And I think Echo is really good at figuring out very efficient routes in more open dungeons, like halls or um, streets even. So the fact that they're not choosing to ban either of those, it might just be a strategic thing. Maybe they want to hide their hulls strategy as well. True. Uh, that is something they have done yesterday, right? So not sure what their ideas behind this. I, I do think that hulls is one of those dungeons that basically every team has like a quote good halls of atonement too. Mm -hmm. And with the dungeon being so short, there's not a lot of room for like variability in regards to pulls. And if uh, the two teams were like running similar routes, it could be one of those things that just like one or two issues of sanguine healing could cause um, some problems where Echo could potentially lose a map in Halls of Atonement. So I think that the ban kind of makes sense in sure. that yeah, front if, if they're yep. if they're worried that Yepers has a similar route to them. Yeah. We've seen Sanguine already make a, a pretty big difference yesterday in some of the some of the dungeons, so it, it wouldn't be surprised to it's it's not a big surprise to try to avoid it. Although we still do have Sanguine to deal with on Spires, so like you can't avoid it completely, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Think, uh, we haven't seen Halls at all, right? Like Halls is not definitely yet. one of the most difficult dungeons with Sanguine. I think it got banned versus the in the Incarnation series by Evolved as well. So I think that we've the two times that we've had potential to see Halls of Atonement, we have missed it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure we'll see it eventually, but we're going to start things off with Tazavesh Streets, Echo versus Yeppers. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. I, I'm really happy with what they did with Tazavesh splitting it into two dungeons like this. Um, I feel like it's a pretty good split where they did it. Uh, I enjoy both dungeons, and I'm really excited to see what teams like Echo and Yeppers can do here. You know, I 100% agree. I like the uh, the sort of upper-lower split that we've gotten from dungeons kind of like Junkyard and Karazhan back in the day. Mechagon and Karazhan, rather. Having the five-boss streets and the three-boss gambit, it really reminds mm -hmm. me a lot of the upper-lower Karazhan, and I think it's a pretty solid style. Just kind of a boss rush streets and then a really quick trash run in the, uh, in the gambit. Yeah, they both have very kind of unique characteristics, for sure. Uh, I, as far as streets goes, though, I, I'm curious, what, what is a moment on streets that you think might trip people up more than anything else? Mm -hmm. Anybody. Oh, gosh. It, it's really hard to tell. Like, streets is such a... It used to be much more difficult. They nerfed it a bunch of times. Um, but there's so many trash pulls that on live servers um, are really, really hard to do. I think it's and the first... so many different moments where you could say this is probably difficult yeah. um, to execute on the MDI. So I'm having, I, I think just like everything is difficult. Like even just the first boss room, um, like how many officers are they going to be pulling? Like how, how are they going to be executing all of that? Uh, yeah, even the first boss room is something that I think could be difficult for them. I, I actually 100% agree with that. I think the first boss room is probably going to be one of the hardest points because, like, are are they pulling all that trash into the boss? That's like not really a thing yeah. that you would ever do on live because all of those casters are so scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's that. The, the, like like both of you guys mentioned already, the first boss room that is probably the most like mechanics dense trash in the dungeon. But then there's also like slight little like nuances to the dungeon that teams have had to figure out how to do. Like for instance, 
having to deal with the uh, the bizarre RP is definitely something that takes a little bit of nuance and skill, and that's something where usually I think teams are sending their healer with a woe drifter buff over to that section of the dungeon, and they just kind of solo that while their team is dealing with trash somewhere else in the dungeon. I'd huh. love to get like a POV of the healer doing that while the team is dealing with something else. Yeah, I wonder what we're going to see as far as uh, the uh, relics go, too. Like, uh, what are we going to see skipped? What are we going to see buffed? I mean, like, the skips are the big thing, right? Um, but some of it some of it just gets a little bit chaotic, you know, when you're trying to, like, deliver the packages to the various vendors and things like that. At a, at a high key level, that can get a little bit crazy sometimes. Yeah. So, I feel like it, that it, could be a moment, too, where, where bad things could happen, you know? In addition to that, uh, teams on live are starting to pull, like, the core hounds and the mini bosses on the left side coming out of the first boss area. I, hmm. I have a strong suspicion that's not going to be the case for the MDI, though. I think that the MDI teams are all... You almost universally going to go to the right side and just get like more efficient trash count pulls because the stuff to the left, while it is like on a per mob basis very efficient, it's not super time um, efficient in that way. And they would rather like do like okay. a triple trash pack pull on the right side. But if they do go to the left, I'm, I'm interested to see like where they're going to be able to or the, where they're going to look to get the remaining around 20% of their enemy forces that they're going to be lacking. Yeah. yeah, that's a good good point. I think a lot of the trash in that final boss room area is definitely something you can get it from. It's just a, there's going to be a matter of backtracking if you don't go to the mm -hmm. left, right? It's a little weird mm -hmm. that way. It is. It, it, there is so much backtracking in this dungeon just because of how like where the three bosses are positioned. So I think that backtracking yeah. is almost almost inevitable. Well, we've already seen backtracking used as well to you know stack certain relics in, in certain ways. So, you know, maybe that's something that now with that's the true. new FX, that's something teams are going to be wanting to think more about in terms of what can we stack, you know, if we leave some stuff until a little bit later. We saw that yesterday in, uh, what was it, Sanguine Depths uh, a couple other times. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Seemed pretty effective, too, if you can do it right. Yeah, well, one thing's for sure is Echo is definitely a massive favorite, not only because they are Echo, but the time trial times between these two teams was just vastly different. Echo had a sub-12 minute time in this dungeon, whereas Yepper's wow. had around, I believe, a 16.30 or so. So, hmm. I mean, all signs point to Echo playing clean here and kind of dominating this, but you never know. You know, li live dungeon play has trumped even Echo sometimes. I mean, I mean Yepper's also like, has never know. two... Ye Yepper's has two Echo members on their team. That is true. I think there's uh, some leaking going on from strategies. <laughs> That's not what I was implying. <laughs> mm. Not at all. <laughs> Sharing, they're going to do the same exact route. Yeah, I'm sure everyone's just like uh, talking together over uh, dinner about it. Yep. Yeah, Miris is actually coaching for both teams this dungeon. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I gave they're you the worst strategy. In, in one voice channel. <laughs> yeah. We'll just know who his favorites are, but who he gives the worst route to. Yeah, we were Dude. ready to get started, and then there was a bit of a reset. So that's what we're waiting for right now. Is waiting for the keys to get, uh, you know, whatever they need to do with that to get both teams back and ready to go. And as soon as they are, we'll get into the dungeon. Shouldn't be too much longer here. But are we thinking just quick two zero for Echo? I mean, is there obviously Yepper's talented squad as well? But uh, you know, what what do you think? Two zero, or is it a chance? I do think that. It's very likely to be a 2-0 in my opinion, but there's an opportunity uh, for Yappers to win streets specifically mm -hmm. because they are so quick, Echo, in this dungeon that I think the, um, uh, like the possibility that they make an error is really high because if they want to go super quick and they do those like really insane pulls that they did in time trials, it might work for them in time trials, right? If it's a really risky strategy sure. where they have multiple tries to execute it, but they only have one try in a tournament, so maybe it's not gonna work out, and they have a they have a full team wipe somewhere, and then Yepers has a chance to actually catch up. In addition to that, uh, just to double down a little bit, I, I think that if Echo does win the streets, they will probably 2-0 just because of how difficult Spires of Ascension is on this on on this uh, affix set. It's tyrannical yeah, sanguine storming. Enough. It's it's a really difficult dungeon to execute clean. Echo is obviously like one of the top teams they've won so many different mdis i, I have a strong suspicion go. that they will be able to pull out a a really good spires of ascension if we make it or whenever we make it to map two and so yepers really needs to win tazvesh streets so this is data from uh, live actually which is kind of interesting the average runtime 36 minutes 26 seconds that's a little bit longer than what we're probably going to see today i uh, average just 7.4 that's i feel like that's less than i expected <laughs> honestly 
I think that fastest yeah. <laughs> runtime is about to get blown out of the water too. <laughs> We're not yeah, going to see a twenty-nine yeah. minutes. Twenty-nine minutes. That is the. Uh, that's the fastest wow. live okay. time, really. Yeah, apparently, that's really long. <laughs> huh. That's uh, still a two chest, though. Pretty sure, right? Yeah. What's the timer for so. streets? Interesting. It's like 40, 39? That would make sense. I want to say it's, it's in the 39. high 30s, yeah, which would be a two chest. All right. And now, what was Echo's fastest time in time trials? It was like, Well, what, it was a 60? 21, but it was 12 21. minutes. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. 12 minutes. Wow. And it was it also... 45, wasn't it? Um... Uh, do I remember wrong? don't remember but also to play devil's advocate with what you were saying Nagura, about you know their time trial times being they have, they have a bunch of practice runs and you know they could try over and over again we've been saying that same thing about echo for like the past three and a half years yeah <laughs> and they just always play true, true. the same way in tournament anyways and make it work do so sometimes have like full team laps the thing is they're so good that reco recovering mistakes as well yeah so even if they have like a full wipe somewhere, they are so quick to get back to uh, where they were. And if the other team isn't like right on their heels, then Echo is still just gonna make it probably. Yeah. So, yeah. Could be. Well, you never know. Maybe somebody could get their music wrong. You know, it's uh, it's like the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> but like, uh, you know, maybe True. somebody just f slides yeah. the wrong direction. You never know. Yeah. You, yep. you never know. <laughs> I, I also know. wonder about the comps as well because in the time trials, both teams were playing. Not Decay, Holy Priest, Warlock, Survival Hunter, and Havoc Demon Hunter. Hmm. And I do wonder if they switched it around because it's fortified in the time trials versus uh, Tyrannical um, on live servers. And again, both Hunter and Warlock have been nerfed uh, hmm. since then. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm not sure if there's something they're going to change. I, I, I don't think that's. I mean, they're still good. But... <laughs> yeah. I mean, most people bring the Rogue yesterday, too, so. Yeah, yeah. True. Rogue, Rogue is really good. I, I think the I think the Havoc Demon Hunter was just more like a buff bot, right? It was just there for the, yeah. the Chaos brand because it it does yeah. add a lot. It actually adds a lot of value to the Survival Hunter's damage as well because um, a decent a bit of their DPS comes from Wildfire Bomb, which is uh, fire damage. And so, like the the Havoc DH is pretty valuable. I think the the Rogue is only brought in dungeons where they actually think they, they need the utility, the control of the Rogue. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Havoc Demon Hunter plus the Blood Decay is definitely a higher damage comp, hmm. while they switch to the Vengeance Demon Hunter plus Rogue if they think they need more control, right? Because Vengeance Demon Hunter probably does less damage than Blood Decay, but provides the buff anyway, and the Rogue does less, well, less damage in comparison to like a Havoc plus a Blood Decay, um, but provides more control. So I do think that's kind of what they're thinking about. And I think for Tassavesh, Tyrannical 22, with the ethics that we have, I think they can go for a full damage comp, technically. All right, fair enough. Just blast through the trash and then just kind of do the extra damage on the bosses. Makes sense. Yeah, maybe even pull some trash into bosses, you know, just AoE yeah. it all down. Especially if it brings along some relics. No, yeah. we'll definitely think... see a lot of that. Oh, yeah. The real question is like, what is inspiring due to streets? So since it's like a brand new dungeon, uh, for a lot of different dungeons, you kind of have a good idea of like what inspiring uh, makes really difficult in these keys. Hey, ready to go. But uh, not a lot of practice has been dealt with here. All right, enjoy. We are getting started. We'll check back later. We'll see who takes it, Echo or Yeppers. All right, so it looks like Echo is sticking to that same comp, the full damage comp they played in the time trials, while Yeppers switched out the Demon Hunter for the Rogue. So that is a lot more control that uh, the Rogue is providing, but you don't have that damage buff, the magic damage increase on their damage dealers, and uh, probably also providing a little bit less um, overall damage, but more single target control damage. So we'll see how that uh, works out for them. But uh, yeah, let's see how big of a pull they're going to be doing here in this first boss room. I'm expecting Ooh. just about everything in the first trash room for Ooh. Echo here on top of the mini boss. And they'll probably end up popping Lust here too. They did pull the mini boss in, but they haven't popped Lust yet. I wonder if they're saving that just for the Tyrannical boss right afterwards. Definitely have to be considering that. But I mean, it's kind of crazy on the Tyrannical affix when, you when you're running this insane DPS comp. You really don't have to worry about the trash staying alive for that long. So everything will just kind of get blasted down. It's, it's pretty ridiculous that the amount of damage you put out, even without Bloodlust, which is ridiculous, um, specifically the Warlock of the Street. Yeah, and they actually did see the Inspired mobs. You can see that Security Guard there in the, the start, and also that the Specialists have been seed, and now they're pulling them in with the boss. So 
They also focus down Ur and Vi, meaning they have the haste buff plus the, uh, the cooldown reduction as well. So really well done by a lot of control. It looked so easy as they just walked in and they weed it down. There was actually a lot of thought, a lot of control in that pool. They executed perfectly. <laughs> POV we have of clicks just bathing in that weapon for forever. Just Warlock things. <laughs> don't have to worry about anything. You just press Dark Packs and don't worry about actually taking any damage for a little while. Now, there are some optimizations you can make with this boss where you have your DPS players stand in the center of the room and the tank and kite the boss in a circle around the group just to make sure that that shield is never facing any, any of your DPS players. But uh, looks like they're not really opting to go for that right now. And I imagine about 40% here, Echo is going to be pulling the boss into the rest of the trash here. And Right on cue, here we go. The second trash pull is pulled. They'll probably pull those two uh, commanders near the end as well at some point. You can see those specialists coming in as well. And this is just, again, making sure you get as much funnel damage on top of these bosses as possible. If your Warlock can cast Rain of Fires, that's much more procs for their force set. And you get a lot more effective damage out of those Wildfire Cluster Bombs that your Survival Hunters put in now. Yeah, and Yappers not too far behind either on their side, as they also did already engaged the boss, they are also slowly pulling in trash into the boss uh, with the inspired mobs that they have seen earlier. So uh, definitely doing similar things, just slightly slower or slightly um, smaller pulls from the start. But not too far behind at all, and they're doing a really good job executing this as well. Yeah, and they're, they're opting to go for the exact same style of pull here. Boss gets a little bit low, go ahead and pull it on top of the second set of relics. Refresh those buffs on your characters. You know, looks like they're going for the drifter here. Yeah, both teams actually ended up going for the Drifter here, and they're going to be using this to skip, I imagine, pretty much all the way to the Bazaar. They might deal with a little bit of trash here, maybe get a refresh on the Relic buff here, or they'll just let Zelia start doing that RP. And you can see yeah, Zelia off in the corner of your screen yeah. did enter that Bazaar to start that trash RP. Yeah, so keep in mind, there's no healer now with Echo here, so they have to do this without a healer. Of course, Blood Decay really good at surviving on their own. But uh, some of the damage dealers might not have such a good time, so they need to make sure they're using their um, defensives wisely to stay alive here. Um, but Sally are now already back, so managed to yep, actually really quickly, um, as he's already back at the group. Yeah, I think he just got oh. the very first weapon, right? He, he, got, he started the RP and Disoria. got the first item on the ground. The Disoriate did cause clicks to pop his pod tender, so yeah. he doesn't have that cheat death avail available to him. But honestly, trading a pod tender instead of a death is pretty useful here to keep the battle as and whatnot. And they reset the world drifter, so the second everyone is stable, Zalia can go back and do some more of that RP if he needs to. And that was really well done that they reacted so quickly. You can see um, clicks did proc his pot. Uh, Jinji immediately used his turtle to not die because, of course, when the tank is disoriented, that means that the, all of the mobs will stop attacking the tank and will hit whatever else is the second person in, ag in the aggro list. So clicks going down, Fragments using darkness, um, Jinji uh, using his turtle to survive. Oh, look at this pull from Yepers. Get that look at what they're doing on Yepers' side. Every single trash pack in the room on top of the boss. This is nuts. Wow. They don't have bloodlust for this. They're just going in natural. Just, just the cooldowns they have. You can see they have two herb dismantlers, so they're going to go for double herb buffs. If they can pull this off, this will be an incredibly huge time save for them. I don't believe Echo is going for this. Yes, they haven't pulled the boss. They're just doing all the trash. But their tank is died. Actually going down oh, no. for you at first. There's no way they can recover this, I don't think. They do have a pot tender procced on the Warlock, so he cannot use the Battle Rest to get the Man. tank back up. And that is a full team wipe. That was a really cool like effort, I think, though. Because if they can, if they could have executed this, I think they could have caught up to Echo uh, from the time that they have lost her in the, in the first boss room. But yeah, this is a very dangerous uh, pull to do. And uh, it's just a lot of pressure in the tank, especially. Yeah, really unfortunate to see that not go for them. They were so close. Most of the trash was like sub 20%. I think it was the double or dismantler that ended up being the end for Roth there. But a little bit of tech coming out from Echo here. You can see that they have one of those overloaded male mentals banished off to the side at around 1 HP. The trick there is when you kill those male mentals, it drops a haste bubble on the ground, which is just a massive haste buff for anybody that stands inside of it. If you keep that alive for the boss, you can just... Kind of go crazy. Sorry, can we get a Fragments uh, POV? Oh, that, that, uh, that'd Fragments be great. just went down, and he, I think he's doing something. Is he released what is when he they had a battle rest available? So I was oh, thinking that he maybe. Hmm, he's back. He just went. He just went through the portal. They had the portal unlocked already. Okay, I guess uh, he just didn't want to wait for a rest. Hmm. Okay. 
They don't want to waste the battle went down. Was, I guess. But may I, I thought that he didn't even go down during the trash. Like maybe he was somewhere else. But, uh, I might have just like not seen him. I wonder. Either way, they are now fighting the boss, and Yefers is doing similar pull again. They had killed off some trash in the room, thankfully. But of course, they have to pull the boss again. They still had to err. Sam going Leo? down actually for Echo. They have to get a rest up. Okay, there we go. Celia back up immediately, uh, using that um, soulstone there. Thankfully, they didn't use it on Fragrance earlier. Otherwise, this would have been uh, really bad for them. But everyone is back up. This boss actually does a lot of damage uh, on Tyrannical, so they hmm. are they have to handle those bombs as well. Um, Oh, they, they managed to throw them from really far away. Is that how it works? Oh, I guess yeah. they threw them to a person that was standing there. Yeah, Celia. So I wonder, it almost looked like they were considering not doing those bombs for like the first 10 seconds mm -hmm. there, and then they realized, oh, our damage is low. Because you can see that they had this, both teams had this strategy of chain pulling the male mentals in so they can stack those, those haste buffs on top of the boss to kill it as quickly as possible. But I guess the damage just wasn't quite there for them. That might be something that they could optimize a little bit going further. Or maybe it was their strategy in the 21 that they did for their uh, time trial runs, but it just won't work out in a 22 tyrannical. I would love to see that be a little bit more optimized. Maybe they just didn't play it as perfectly as they could have. They also already have 82% trash, so they're like basically done already. They, of course, still need to do um, three bosses that are left. So they're on their way to uh, just get that done. Back-to-back -back bosses. Maybe there's some trash they can pull on top. Um, is there actually? Because they can't really pull that much uh, onto the next boss, right? So maybe onto this? You can pull trash on top of this boss, but I would assume that now would be the one doing it, unless Jinji would be misdirecting it to him. Hmm. Let's see, there is a misdirect. There's a misdirect. Ah, uh, it's just for oh, the no. boss, though. Okay. Okay, man. So, unless there's trash off to the side that we don't see coming in right now, then uh, then we're just dealing with this boss solo. Oh, no. Yeah, first having a full team wipe again on that boss. Boss was on 5%, 3% HP, and they unfortunately did not manage to finish off the boss there. Uh, so, yeah, just... Yeah, they, they were just missing CDs as well, right? They wiped on that previous pull, and then they tried again because they knew they were behind now, so they have to do that same pull again without some pull bands available, and it just caused them to wipe there at the very end. But uh, yeah, Echo doing a lot of damage to this boss, they did kill Vi again. Um, so definitely valuing Vi really highly um, compared to some other teams, just uh, focusing her a lot. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think that makes sense, right? On on bosses, Vi being a 45 second long buff of haste is probably the most valuable single target damage. I mean, Ur is definitely yeah. still good, but unless you're like... I, I feel like in MDI, your cooldowns are so planned in advance that getting an Ur buff to use an extra set of cooldowns on a boss is probably not the play when you're planning on using those cooldowns on the next pull. So it makes sense for teams to value Vi, especially in like one of the tyrannical keys. Yeah, I think so as well. Um, he's definitely very valuable for a lot of the damage dealers. Even though Ur is really good for damage for Sally as well, right? For the Kyrian Holy Priest, Ur is really is a lot of damage. Um, but even without Ur, Sally is doing 8k DPS here, uh, while also providing PI to one of the damage dealers. So yeah, just big value from that Holy Priest. And we have to get through one more boss. Um, this boss fight actually taking quite a long time. It, that's why I assume on fortified times were so quick because they just uh, because the bosses didn't like, take up so much time. Because there are a lot of bo bosses in uh, in streets. Looks like uh, Echo have studied up on their Dratnos expert routes here. You can see that they yeah. killed the second boss right in the corner of that doorway there. This is incredibly useful if you're the person who has that that gluttony debuff that gives you a damage buff every time you soak an orb. It puts all of the orbs in one centralized place so that you can very quickly go over and get, as you see on Fragments there, a 13 or a 14 stack of the buff, giving you a ton of extra damage on this boss and just making the boss last much less time than otherwise. Yeah, also interesting that they give it to uh, Fragments on the Havoc uh, demon under there. Of course, you can give the buffs to multiple different people by giving the buff around, but... Uh, so now, I don't think that's going to be <laughs> as useful. Uh, but yeah, I, I assume Venthyr, Demon Hunter are doing quite a bit of single target damage here as well. Oh yeah. No, I mean, Look at Bloody Gate, 12k DPS. Yeah, Bloody Gate is not okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Let's just let's just quickly I look agree. past that. <laughs> Yeah, the Vinthyr Havoc is actually a really interesting choice that I've seen come out from a lot of players. It's, it's such a consistent single target DPS option. Not for a fight like that, where you have multiple targets that you have to swap to, because you can only really apply the sinful brand every so often, right? But on just pure single target, it's pretty consistent damage. So giving it buffs is pretty useful for just tyrannical bosses. Just waiting for the door to open to go into the Oasis here, though. It looks like Fragnance um, was still finishing the event there. And I wonder if that's maybe what happened earlier, that he just didn't, that he was supposed to finish the event earlier when they were doing the trash uh, in the second boss room. And he went down and then they just decided to do it after. Because hmm. that's, that could explain why he died earlier. I'm not sure what the, what the Demon Hunter tech is though, uh, because um, apparently he can somehow skip, I guess he shadow melted. That's, that's it. He just shadow melted it off. That, that fixates you when you Maybe. Uh, yeah. pick up the, the gift. I actually, next time we see Streets, whenever that might be, I'd love to get a POV on the solo player as they run away from the group and see what they actually do. I want to see what the strategy is for teams to deal with, specifically what teams are doing for the Oasis RP that you have to get to. But now we're on the band, boss, and let's see who picked up which... Instrument is very important. We do see clicks on this. This is saxophone, right? This is not that kind of I, that's a big saxophone if that's what it is. Yeah, it is very big. It does look like one. <laughs> now is, of course, uh, playing the guitar, it looks like. <laughs> Who's the drummer? Oh, the, the healer drummer. is that always the worst. drummer. Yeah, the healer is the drummer. <laughs> they give everyone else the buffs. I always pick the one on the right. I don't know what it is. I just I just go to that spot. I don't know what 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 is the one on the right. It might be There's a singer. There's a singer, guitar, saxophone, drummer. We'll we'll yes. see whenever they they have to go to their positions after they deal with this trash, right? Maybe it's a trumpet. Oh, I think there's two saxophones. Ginji is the same as clicks. Oh, are there? I think so. This looks similar, at least. Oh, it's a trumpet! Oh yeah, Sax saxophone, trumpet, guitar. Oh yeah, it is a trumpet, it's a little different. Oh wait, hold on! <gasps> screenshot, screenshot! That's a rare one, I got it, I got it. I got it. <laughs> nice. Putting it in our production channel. Perfect, alright. So they had to use another rest. I do think... It's a very common theme to see the priest go down, actually, uh, in most MDI groups we've seen so far. And it makes a lot of sense, right? I think they are pretty squishy. Like, I'm not saying that they're, like, bad players, but so many of the damage dealers have... I mean, look at the Warlock, right? It's really hard for a Warlock to die. You have Pot Tender if something goes wrong. You have uh, Unending Resolve. You have uh, Death Pact, which is literally just, like, a full HP shield. <laughs> and uh, Fragnance also has lots of uh, survivability. Hunters, I guess, don't have too much. They have the turtle. But yeah, Holy Priest, they are pretty squishy. Yeah, I think, think about it. they also have like the worst defensive cooldown in the game, right? Desperate Prayer, I think, is the, yeah. pretty much the only thing they have, which is like, oh, wow, extra HP. Uh, that's cool, I guess. Oh, there's the Warlock Gateway tech. Such a good gateway to get to get back up that without having to go around the staircase. But uh, just need trash percentage now. Where's that going to come from for Echo? Are they just going to do one last mass pull in this section of the dungeon? That's the only thing I can think of that they could do here. Yeah, I, I think that would make sense um, because obviously up on the last boss area, there's no trash uh, you can pull unless you can maybe snap something up somehow. Uh, but no, it does look like they are just pulling some trash here. Um, line of sighting everything to gather it up. Let's see what they pulled. Some smugglers, some wise guys. Yeah, this is not enough, right? They, they're gonna have to do another pull after this. Yeah, maybe they just do the mini boss. Yeah, that's, that's so inefficient, though. Hmm. Yeah, it seems a bit weird. Now they're pulling the mini boss in. Um, interesting. I feel like this can't be the strategy that they used in the 12 minute time in the streets and time trials, right? I mean, definitely not. We're already at 
16. <laughs> I mean, it is tyrannical, as I said, and the, the bosses, of course, because there are so many bosses in this dungeon, I think tyrannical just makes it harder to get such a fast time compared to 45. Um, but still, I don't think they did this on 45 on time trials, this pool. Okay. So knowing what we know about Echo, what do you think the chances are Mira's told them, hey, Yepers has 14 deaths, let's not show our strategy? Okay, so I would say that's a really smart decision, and I've said that many times, that teams should do that. Um, but Echo has, in many interviews, Echo has always said um, that they are not actually changing their strategy, even if they're ahead. They just say... Okay, so we have this strategy, and this route, and we are doing it, no matter if the other team is 20 minutes behind. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Get a PV. Okay, you said that a few times. Get a PV of the Warlock right now. Oh, it's too late. Okay, so they're at 96% trash. He put a portal upstairs, there we go. jumped down, a snap. and then he snapped trash up on top of the boss for the last 4%. Yeah. Be by That's a really up. cool tech. Okay. That's where that extra trash comes from, so maybe that is a little bit of their strategy. Maybe they could probably do that with a lot more trash if they wanted to, right? Yeah, you know what? You might... I think so. That might have been what they did to get this fast time. Just snapping a lot of trash from the bottom room up here onto the boss and then just aliing it all down. Wait. With the... <laughs> is this boss dead? To... I don't know. What is going this is, on? Uh... Wow, okay, they do have Bloodlust, right? But... Yeah, I'm surprised that they managed to get this boss done so quickly. Wow. And then they also have a gateway tech to just go ahead and get right to the boss. Of course, you can gateway through, through the beams. Wow, that that was a very fast zombie. Okay, so you know what? I think we're kind of on the right track here. I don't think this was their complete strategy, but I think we saw little bits and pieces and hints at what their strategy might have been to go as fast as they did, because one dungeon level plus tyrannical does not equal six extra minutes at a time. But regardless of how they did it, Echo does take the first game of the series against Yepers and goes up 1-0. Wow, that was uh, incredibly quick, and there was some incredibly interesting stuff going on in that, too. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, one of the most <laughs> echo runs I've ever seen. I think there was, was definitely cool. some forbidden tech that was uh, shown <laughs> off bit. there. Yeah, some weird stuff that they were doing. Was was there in the last boss like? I honestly don't know how fast you can kill that boss on Turnigal, but was there something that they used from a mop maybe? Like some uh, some buff that you can somehow get, or I don't know. How did they do so much damage to that boss? Was it just normal damage? I'm I think, not sure. I think it's just because they have all their CDs up. Um, Maybe? Mm, Could have been. It, that plus Lust, it, it, it kind of makes sense that if they have everything available... It's a containment available... cell. <laughs> is that just from the first idea. boss? <laughs> it, I... Containment cell. Is that, is, that the, is that the cages? Oh, it's just oh, the first right, boss. Right. Oh, it's, okay. it's, the, yeah, okay. it's the cage for the first boss whenever the boss is like... Uh, uh, swirling his sabers at you, isn't it? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, right. I thought that there was like some hidden tech. Oh, uh, yeah. I forgot about the damage hidden, does, yeah. Hidden tech for 86,000 damage. <laughs> 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 it didn't do that much. Very, very <laughs> hidden. It's a percent or two, you know? <laughs> hidden until now. Revealed. There you go. So, again, the oh, yeah? compared to the live data, uh, guess what? Echo's pretty fast. <laughs> Average time 36 okay. minutes live. Echo gets it done like, what, 18? <laughs> Fastest run, 29. So 18.41 versus 29 minutes. It's a cool 11 minutes faster than the fastest time ever recorded on live servers. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, what a run. I think <laughs> Yepers would have beaten that fastest run time as well, even with their... I, uh, yeah, I agree. Oh, I agree. Yeah. They're white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They definitely could have. It was, it was just a couple things. I mean, it was really that first wipe for Yepers that kind of ended yeah. the possibility of that run being close. You, you hate to see it, but um, I mean... Even still, Echo just seems untouchable right now, you know. Yeah, we can take a, we can take a look it at is... some of those uh, that wipe as well. Were you saying to mm -hmm. I just wanted to say it is interesting that the Eppers, uh thought, or for sure they can do this pull, right? This pull with the boss room where they pull the whole trash on the boss, mm -hmm. because otherwise they wouldn't have tried it, right? And they can execute it. Uh, so it's interesting that Echo didn't do it, right? Because usually when another team does a pull, uh, then Echo would do it as well. So either they think it's too risky, or they just don't have the cooldowns up at that moment, or, I don't hmm. know. 
It seems like Echo likes to take those risks, though. You know, they, they like to put together yeah. things that are intricate, high risk, but high reward. Let's take a look so, at some of the replays here. Here's the, the, the cursed replay with the, the wipe I, for Yeppers. I actually think that this is a really good pull, and like Nagura was saying, it, it's, it is very high risk. Double Ur, and then you get this mail order. Ideally, you would like to have this mail order, or maybe somebody with like an immunity um, to be able to deal with this. But oh, the quaking, oh. dude, oh, just look. Like, oh, the the, the oh. quaking is the end of the pull. It's, oh. it's not even that the pull is bad. It's just the quaking insta kills it <laughs> before anything else happens. Roff ends up dying to a quaking plus mail order catastrophe, and it's like, oh well. I mean, that was the end of Ur, quaking and that and the mail order. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. So uh, beyond that, there was a lot of really cool stuff that Echo was doing in this run. So first off, tanking that robot in the corner, it allows uh, Fragments to just basically get 15 stacks instantly whenever he steps on top of that robot. Um, you see Genji right now in the buff frame, he has 20 stacks. In addition to that, Fragments and Genji at some point went off to the side, killed a Woe Relic, uh, meld plus feign <laughs> death to the, the remainder of the trash oh. pack, and then they had this Woe Drifter uh, just patrol from across the world into their room and then they were able to wo in. wo drift her out and now in addition to that we saw this with clicks leaping off the ledge and then coming back and then just snapping a bunch of trash onto the final boss uh, for the remaining four percent enemy forces that echo needed there was a lot of really weird and cool stuff that uh, we did see from this route i don't know how much of it you can use in like normal people keys but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a point yeah cool. I mean, it's that's why we love the Mythic Dungeon International because you get to see things that uh, that don't look like they should be possible, right, Zai? I found the tech. I know why the oh. boss died so quickly. There was a okay. mob in okay. Streets of Wonder, and then, remember, this is new to everyone here, so we're tr kind of remembering trash mechanics here. The enforcer in that trash has a mechanic called or a spell called Force Multiplied, which makes everything near it deal extra damage and take extra damage, twenty percent extra damage, oh, and that also applies to go. allies. So you snap that mob ah. up to the boss. Boss takes twenty percent increased damage. Oh, that's what okay. it was. That's what that's what that snap tech was. Wow, that's the echo diff right there. <laughs> no kidding. Well, I'll leave it to Echo to uh, to figure it out, right? They uh, they dominate Tazvesh streets. We're going to Spires of Ascension next if we need it. Theater of Pain, but uh, this Spires this has been a little bit of an nasty one too. I mean, we've seen Sanguine be a problem for for teams on this one already. Yeah, I mean, yesterday we saw Evolved win versus Incarnation in the Spires key. And their rando was 23 minutes, which is still pretty long, I would say. I, I think Spires generally is a long dungeon, and uh, even in the MDI, we haven't seen like super fast times uh, com if you compare it to some other dungeons. But I do think uh, Sanguine definitely slows this key down quite a bit um, because we've seen so many uh, pulls where, you know, trash gets pulled on top of bosses in the MDI and you just nuke everything down but with Sanguine all of a sudden you have uh, big issues doing so on Orifrian, right if you want to do right. a spear pull even on the first boss if you want to pull stuff on top you have the Sanguine everywhere and then the mob is you cannot control where the boss is flying to in the first boss room so um if there's a Sanguine pull and the mob flies in there you have a problem right so Sanguine definitely an issue and I'm interested to see how Echo and Yeppers are handling that dungeon we saw multiple robots recharging in sanguine pools uh, yesterday, so hopefully we can avoid that kind of thing today. But uh, I, you know, it's it's hard to kind of ask like what Yeppers needs to do to to compete against Echo because Echo seems to have all these things that people have never seen before. Obviously, Spires is a dungeon that's been run like infinity times by everyone at this point, so there's going to be less of that here. But at the same time, like it's it's so tight too. So if you're Yeppers, it kind of just feels like you need to play like the best flawless run you've ever played in your life to have a, a chance of kind of like staying with it. Is that accurate, Tuttles? I, I, I would tend to agree with that. And it comes down to just like Nagura mentioned, just the sanguine management. Um, mm -hmm. I, we saw it yesterday in the Incarnation versus uh, Evolved series, just some of those Goliaths bathing in sanguine. Whenever that <laughs> happens, that is basically just a minute and a half penalty. So it's very easy to see like deaths uh, in, in understand how much time that's going to end up costing you it's not always easy to see like how much time sanguine can cost echo has always been one of those teams that's just crazy efficient with how little and how minimal sanguine healing that they get from run in and run out and for yeppers it comes down to practice it, it really just depends on how many hours they put into the spires of ascension this dungeon's a big time sink and like <laughs> i i would have maybe have banned this dungeon 
personally, I understand why they banned the Court of Spires, yeah. but the Spires of Ascension is such a heavy time sink where it's like, I could put 20 hours into this dungeon and still just feel like I'm, I've just sanguine healed every single mob and not be happy with my run. I mean, maybe it's just kind of a, a, a comfort thing, too. I mean, maybe they just do feel like this is the dungeon that they have more experience on, that they have to do less kind of, like, thinking on the fly. Whereas Court of Stars, obviously, that's something that you haven't really been able to practice on live for a long time. I mean, you can put in some practice on the tournament realm, I believe, if I'm all right. But uh, it's still going to be something that's, like, outside the norm, you know? So I don't... It's I, I doubt we're going to see it play today, but uh, I, I hope to be proved wrong. Yeah, same. I'm actually like... kind of surprised that that Yepers was the one that banned the Court of Stars, right? Because they've got Lazel on their team, who's somebody who was a Mythic Plus keyer back in Legion. Somebody that probably has the MDI route still stored in their MDT somewhere. So, yeah, <laughs> unfortunate that that was banned. But this was a nasty just set of dungeons in general, right? Sanguine Spires or Halls of Atonement? You have to choose one to ban against Echo? I don't know well, what I Three dungeons with Sanguine in it. Yeah, I mean, right. that's... Uh... Which is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most annoying FXs to have to pl try to play around because there's just so much that can go so wrong so fast with Sanguine oh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, three dungeons with it, that's, it's going to be tough. Yeah, especially on these uh, MDI pulls that they're doing, right? Usually yeah. when you do a live key, you can try to pull mobs that are like equal HP and then it's easier for you to kill them at the same time and you just handle the Sanguine kind of like bolstering. So you just try to kill it at the same time, so Sanguine is not an issue. But on these MDI pulls, when you just pull 20, 30 mobs together, there's bound to be some mobs that have more HP than the others, so they die quicker, and then there's some mobs who don't, who can't be CC'd, right? Like the Goliaths in this dungeon. So if a Sanguine pool spawns underneath a Goliath, it might just heal for an hour because it's standing there and it's casting and you can't move it at all. Mm -hmm. So you have to manage the Sanguine before uh, they die. So when you have like Nox, like Shining Force from the Priest, for example, you need to make sure you use it before the mobs die, um, because you cannot actually displace the Goliath. And that is something that's very difficult when you have lots and lots of mobs on top of each other. In, in addition to that, like the Kyrian Spears are abnormally tricky to deal with because they stun the mobs for such a long time. True. And with things like Serve Hunter and Warlock being into the meta, where AoE packs just kind of melt with the amount of AoE uh, like trash pulls just end up melting with the amount of AOE that those classes provide. It can become problematic if, like, an Ether Diver, like Nero was mentioning, just the mismatched HP. Like an Ether Diver and a Goliath, if they're in the same Kyrian Spear, the Ether Divers could just heal those Goliaths to full if you're not careful. Right. Well, it's a major concern. We'll see who ends up taking it. Echo versus Yepers, map number two, underway. Enjoy it. We'll check back in in a little bit. Alright, so we see a Windwalker on the upper side. Interesting. So LaSalle playing Windwalker while Echo chooses to play the Rogue on Fragments. Otherwise, the same comp on the teams. Both of them doing a really big pull here, just pulling kind of everything together. Echo decided to kill the Ur Relic while Yepers seems to be. Was it the Woe Drifter they killed? Uh, well, oh, Zatsy going down too. Off on them just yet. Yeah, Zatsy goes down. It's another angel. But it doesn't seem like it's going to be that big of an issue for him. He can just release and run back really quickly here. Um, yeah, he did do that. Okay, instantly released. Because, you know, most of the most of the danger of the pull is gone. But the death there, as well as just the general uncomfortableness with the trash mobs here, maybe a little bit of sanguine healing, means that Echo deals with this pull, like, 30 seconds faster. They're already going to be on to the next trash pull before Yepers is even finished with this one. Yeah, that was incredibly quick by Echo. They, I think this might be partially the rogue uh, difference here because they just have so much single target damage for those higher HP mobs. And now they're just pulling the whole boss room. This is so dangerous because of Sanguine. You have to be very careful here on where they were killing these mobs. You can see they did kill a Vi this time around um, compared to er earlier. And they just have all their cooldowns ready again. You can see Clicks doing so much damage with the, that Infernal that he has popped. And they also use Bloodlust for this pull as well. They're trying to pull to kill the mobs on the side where the mob doesn't fly to, or the boss doesn't fly to. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they've been doing a good job to get the Sanguine pretty far away. Yeah, you really have to make sure that it's completely out of the range of where, of where that mob could fly to. Otherwise, it's just going to heal. That's very close. Is it in Sanguine? No, it's not. Just barely. Man, Oof. I could swear that it's touching the edge of that Sanguine pool, but it's just barely not in it. 
that could have been really bad for Echo there. The boss could have easily healed for a solid 20 or 30 percent there, which is not what you want to see in a 23 tyrannical key. But man, just playing on the edge there and getting away with it. I mean, a team like Echo doesn't need to get away with that, but I guess they just did. <laughs> Isn't that Sanguine Pool that they spawned from the Goliath also in a somewhat dangerous, or he was in a somewhat dangerous spot, I guess? It's gone yeah. now, uh, so it's not gonna uh, happen. But Yappers now also pulling the boss. They didn't do that big pull. Of course, they lost a lot of time on the first pull. And they also killed Woe on the first pull, which did nothing for them, really, because it doesn't, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't speed up the angels, right? Um, because you can speed up the angels with, like, some beating roar. Is what people say. I'm not sure if that's even oh, that true. Was... I mean, it was like. I'm that's pretty what I sure. I was saying the whole time. That's... I was like, this is not true. And people are saying, no, it's true, it's true. So I was like, fine, I guess. <laughs> I think there's a certain amount of like boomkin hate that was going out where people just decided, hey, let's just gaslight all the druid players by making them believe <laughs> that their their stampeding roar makes the mob go go even faster. I'm I'm pretty sure that was a that was a joke. And you know what? Honestly, it's my fault too. I'm one of the people that said it just for fun because. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I never you know. really believed it, but at some point, even I was like, I mean, maybe. <laughs> Either way, we do see Echo have uh, down the first boss, and now they they did a no, they didn't do a pull on on the left side. Sometimes we saw teams um, immediately after the boss go to the left do a pull there, but they uh, walk to the right, pull those stealth class, unless they pull the trash over. But I don't see any um, other mobs here. I only see the Praetor and the stealth class. So it looks like they haven't really pulled anything else from the left. Yeah, so judging based off of the route that they've gone for so far without going to the left after the first boss, they're probably going to be gearing up to do some big pull in the third boss room. That's typically what this mm -hmm. kind of routing means. The biggest problem with that that I could see is that usually you commit a Kyrian Spear to helping deal with that pull, but the problem that we've gone over so many times in the two days we've had this week and talk about Spires of Ascension is that Sanguine plus Carrion Spear doesn't go well together. If you kill one mob in that Carrion Spear a little bit too quickly, you're just going to heal everything. So hopefully they've got some strategy, and knowing Echo, they probably do have some strategy to deal with that. Otherwise, it could be an issue. How did Evolved in Incarnation deal with the Angels yesterday? Because I didn't uh, actually see that part. The, uh, the three angels in the last boss room. Evolved did all three of them at the same time. Okay. Yeah. And they managed? Yep. Executed well? Perfect. Yeah, nice. It was perfect. Okay, so I do think uh, that is definitely something Echo is going to do as well with uh, with one spear. The other spear, I don't know. Their Praetor is actually a really high HP. Um, this is actually something that we haven't seen from Echo that much. This is kind of inefficient, right? Having those Praetors um, so high HP still. Usually they're really good at controlling the Praetors, making sure they're staying in the, the trash group, making sure if they jump out, so they, they, they grip them back in or they knock them back in. So a little bit of... of I don't want to say it was like a big mistake or anything, but it definitely cost them, I would say, 20 seconds to, to finish off these Praetors. Uh, that usually would be in the trash bag. But yeah, first, unfortunately, having some issues on their side. Yeah, not going perfectly for them. More deaths on the board. The trash pulls after the first boss are not going well for them. Fortunately, you could just release and get right back there. It's only like a two second run away, but more deaths on the board, more death timers. It's not what you want to be. Not that situation you want to be in against Echo, who are going to go for the craziest pulls in the world. And you can see, once again, going for a massive trash pull that we normally see a Kyrian Spear committed to, but because it's safe, they cannot use it here. And it's in incredibly dangerous. You can see clicks, once again, on the Warlock, using that pod tender, that cheat death. But you can see the problem that happens here. If that, if that golem, that Goliath, starts recharging Anima whenever a mob dies on top of it, it's going to heal. Luckily, they got away with only about a 20% heal on the Goliath there, but still, that's going to be another time loss, and all these trash mobs running around, not being put together by the Carrion Spear, is just more time lost here for Echo. Yeah, definitely some time lost again. Thankfully, it did survive, though, because that looked really sketchy there for a moment, uh, when we saw the pot drop and Sally drop really low as well. I'm not sure it was actually a cast going off, uh, or if it, would, if it was just... Um, the, the caster mob that just casts dark flashes all the time. Either way, they did manage to finish it off now. 63% trash. Um, they're going to be skipping that um, last two trash pack here that usually is uh, just very inefficient to deal with. Um, so they're just going to be moving on. Very likely also skipping the next trash pack too. 
because that also is one of those inefficient uh, packs to deal with because you have that AoE damage reduction on uh, one of the mobs. So in the MBI, we've seen a lot of skips or they decide to just pull it on top of the boss. Then it's not as inefficient, but uh, we'll see what they do now. Yeah, there's a few different things that they could do, right? Um, we saw the strategy yesterday from Evolved where you deal with that very first trash mob after the second boss that has a pack of relics in there. You can kill that woe relic right away, give you a woe drifter that you can just then skip right to the third boss to deal with the hurler packs if you want to. Um, you can also you also have access to pretty much all the trash in that third room at that point. They could go for that, but I just have a little bit of a feeling in the back of my head that Echo's going to be going for some crazy pull in that third boss room just to get all of the remaining trash that they need before they go to the final platform at the very top of the dungeon. Remember, you need a little bit over 87% trash count before you have enough trash to where those three angels will finish you off for 100%. So they still have about 24% trash count that they need to get before they're, they're home free. Yeah, I think you might be right. We've seen uh, this pull be done in the MBI a couple of times, but we've also seen teams fail to this same pull that we just talked about. So basically they go up the stairs and then on the top of the stairs they'll pull like three packs together uh, with a Helion in there and a bunch of casters as well. And sometimes they will commit a spear to it, most of the times uh, they will. Um, and they haven't used stairs yet, Echo. They have two spears that they can still use. They have a bunch of Kyrians, so it's no problem for them to carry multiple spears around. Um, one of them definitely want to stay for the angels. It would make sense for the triple angel pool. And then one spear they might be using for that uh, big trash pool we've just talked about. Uh, Echo, uh, I mean, clicks getting hit by one of those projectiles, but thankfully did survive. He doesn't have a pot available, so it has to be a little bit careful. Yeah, and remember, yeah, it doesn't have the pod tender for another like six or seven minutes, so probably not going to have that until they get to the very end of the last boss. I mean, it's just still so useful, though. I mean, not not having to commit a battle res to a character and just getting yeah. a cheap death out is so useful. Of course, you hate your life when you're in that pod tender, but because it's a 10 second pacify where you literally can't do anything, but definitely better than dying. <laughs> I still can't believe, because I, I was playing my Warlock a little bit that I hadn't played in a while, and I played Dreamweaver for the first time, because that uh, Soulbind is completely useless for Moonkin, because uh, you need the damage from Nia. So I was playing Dreamweaver for the first time, I had this pot tender for the first time, <laughs> and I fell off a platform in uh, on Pantheon, and I was like, oh, I'm dead. And then it ported me into the middle of the room in my pot tender, and I survived Wait. afterwards. Uh, ever since then, I'm really? like, okay, this is broken. Yes, <laughs> apparently you just don't die if you have pot tender and pantheon if you fall off. <laughs> well, I didn't know it worked that that's way. That's crazy. That's yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that is pretty nuts. <laughs> wow, I'm actually kind of. Right? I I never tried that before. All you right, should. well. Let's see what Echo plans on doing, because they still remember, they still have to get about 24% trash count here. They're going to have Genji run off to the side, pick up that Kyrian Spear, which means they should have two Kyrian Spears available to use. They're not going for the Woe Drifter here. They're just going to be skipping around the side and then probably using a Warlock Gateway to get up from this point onwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see what they plan on pulling. I think you actually have to pull every single trash pack in this room at this point to get 24% count. So let's see how they plan on doing it. Alright, so they're pulling the left pack with the relics in there, they're pulling the goliath oh as well, and it looks like the helion from the middle too. So this is a very difficult pull that they're executing There's the here. Spear. There's the spear coming out. They have to be very careful with Sanguine though, because a lot of the mobs have less HP than that goliath. But thankfully the healing is a little bit out, so maybe that is not gonna be... The goliath is being focused so much, but it healed a Ooh, lot. It healed 30-40% HP. And the Helion also healed to full because it jumped into uh, one of the Sanguine pools there. So they are, again, lost some time with the um, Sanguine. And they have to be kind of careful with the rest of this pool just because uh, there's a lot of AoE damage going on. So if they heal one more time, this might be a problem. You can see everyone dropping kind of low. But... I mean, that was, yeah, that was fine. That was actually almost the worst case scenario. They had both of the Helions left alive with the Goliath at yeah. the end of it. And they still managed to live through it. With all of that trash that they've gotten, I believe the only thing they need left now is both both packs of Usurpers, and then they're at the 87% trash count they need. Echo manages to do the thing that none of us thought was possible and uses a Kyrian Spear on trash and doesn't really wipe to it either. Huh. Yeah. Yeppers unfortunately having a full team wipe there on their side, but at this point, like, I've just been looking at Echo just because 
Even if Yepers has a perfect run there, I don't think they are gonna be as fast as Echo because that strategy is just incredibly quick and efficient. Of course, they did have some issues, right, with the Sanguine here and there. Um, but other than that, this is a really, really risky but very fast route in comparison to what we've seen um, yesterday. So really well done. They do have the 82% now, so they can move up. They still have one spear left. They're going to be using it for those angels afterwards. They did kill um, Bai again, it looks like, so they have that uh, haste buff again. Uh, moving the boss around a little, they, do they need another set of usurpers? They need 83, right? Yeah, they need to do the 4-pack. I was a little bit off on trash count. So, oh, oh, we're, we're pulling it in right now. Wait, are they pulling oh, yeah. it in right now so they can get an Ur plus Vi buff during the damage amp? Ooh. Oh no, I don't know if they I don't know if they have the damage to get through that just yet, but I mean this actually is relatively safe because you can have now mass grip the crash mobs to somebody else whenever whenever mm -hmm. they're about to die, and that way you're not worried at all about the same one. You can see both Zelia and Blitz are standing out and oh we just mass grip on top of himself. Okay, cool. That was perfect. Oh, and oh yeah. didn't didn't get a tick feeling. The boss moved out of it. So, I yeah, it didn't take it in tick. Yeah, that was that was great. And they also I believe got the buff for that as well. That's again, I mean, Echo just playing around with Sanguine like it's nothing. Like they they're just so confident playing with <laughs> with that mechanic. So much safer as well from the runs we saw yesterday. Remember to compare the time to what Evolved got yesterday. Their overall dungeon run time for Spires of Ascension was a 23 minute run. And that was only with three mm -hmm. deaths, so relatively clean overall. I don't remember them having any too, like, too many major healing going on with Sanguine either. So, I mean, Echo is just on another level with the speed that they're getting through these dungeons. I also want to point out just uh, how good the Rogue is here, I think. Because the pulls that they are doing, like these big pulls with the Goliaths in there and the Helians in there, I think having the focus damage from the Rogue is incredibly valuable. Because uh, the Goliath just barely survived when all the other trash died on this earlier pull where they speared. I think uh, there was just like a slither of HP left from the Goliath, like maybe 1%, and then it healed to 40 because it got like one tick from all the Sanguine pulls that dropped. But just a little bit more damage than Goliath and it would have been fine. And I think that was mainly just fragments uh, focusing down that Goliath. So, and the Helians, they, they actually waited for them to not um, be stacked with the rest of the trash group, so they just stacked the Goliath with all the lower HP mobs, the Helians were out, and then they just needed to focus down the Goliath, so all of the trash mobs died at the same time and there's no Sanguine healing going on. And yeah, then they unfortunately missed it by like 1%, but other than that, uh, just really well executed. Yeah, I mean, all that being said, the perfect run so far from Echo, the zero deaths on the board, all of that could be nullified with the next pull they're about to do right now. This is by far the yeah. most dangerous pull in the dungeon, pulling all three of the angel mini bosses at the same time. They do have his carry and spear available, and it looks like they have every single cooldown across the board, but we've seen this particular pull wipe so many of the best teams in the NBI. Let's see how it goes for them. Yeah, they're gearing up. Uh, it's actually, now a... They are really gearing up for it. now an issue there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> they're really they're getting waiting. ready. <laughs> Okay, what it's they possible waiting they're waiting for one for a cooldown. Maybe some cooldown. Yeah. Maybe if it was like ten seconds on a cooldown, they're just waiting for it. They know that they're ahead at this point. So there we go. Now they're pulled it all together. They did pop the bloodless as well. We use all CDs here to be able. Actually, Jinji holding on. No, never mind. Everyone is using their offensive cooldowns here to make sure um, they finish them evenly. The spear is also being used that they still have left. And yeah, the most important thing is to finish them off at the same time. Otherwise, of course, they will heal to full HP. Uh, Sanguine not going to be an issue here, because if the Sanguine pool spawns, then the other mob already healed anyway at, this, at that point, probably. So I uh, just want to make sure you kill them at the same time. One of them actually really low already, it looks mm -hmm. like. You have to finish them off. Oh, wow. Oh, just okay, there we no go. No problem for Echo. <laughs> just, yeah. just nothing, n no issues whatsoever. Just clean execution. I mean, do you really expect anything less from these guys at this point? I mean, the amount of times that we've like cast doubt on this team and they've just kept kept playing at this level throughout all these years is, is so ridiculous. I mean, I think the only time we've ever seen them pick up was last year, and they came back clean. So no surprises here for Echo as they just put on a clinic in the Spires of Ascension. All they have to do now is get through Devos, and man, it's just so impressive every time. Yeah, that was really well done. Of course, this boss is still a um, tyrannical boss fight, and it's also a 23. 
So you can see they actually do take quite a bit of damage from uh, the abilities that this boss is doing, but it really shouldn't be a problem at all for Echo. The most important question is how fast can they kill this boss though? Because uh, again, looking at the time that we had yesterday from Evolved, uh, Click's actually going down. They do have a battle rest available, they have to use uh, the Blood Decay Rest stereo. Click's is back up. Having the Vi um, mob just jump around there with the stun cast can definitely cause some issues. And also randomly shooting people, right? Like the, the um, ability that this mob casts also on random players. So if you have an overlap that is bad, maybe with the AoE uh, going off from the boss, or maybe having a debuff, the magic debuff that does some damage as well, uh, it can cause some issues. But it's I think they are delaying this kill on purpose, yeah. right? On the Vi. Just they, another optimization. Um, didn't want to. <laughs> yeah, they want to have it for phase two. So they're just keeping it alive here until the boss comes down, so they have to haste up for the second phase, just, again, to get more boss damage, to be faster than this boss. Yeah, I mean, just showing off all of the optimizations here to go as quickly as possible, and if they're clean here, this could easily be a sub-20 minute Spires of Ascension, which would be pretty much on pace with some of the fastest runs we've seen in every single NBI season of Shadowlands so far. Just, I mean, I hate to sound like a fanboy, but they really are just showing us why they're the best MDI team in the world right now. Yeah, they are doing an incredible job, especially in this dungeon. I mean, we only have, we have this one signal death that uh, just happened on clicks there. Uh, other than that, very, very clean. And I think the pot tender just came up as well, right? He just I don't see the debuff any. Oh, yep. you can only see two debuffs, right? It came up, but I it came assume up a it is couple up. minutes ago, I think. So how did he just die through the pot tender? Is that even possible? I'm pretty sure it works like every cheat death, uh, where if you die to like a massive overkill, it won't proc. And so he wasn't. In, huh? What happened to Clicks? I, I didn't actually did see it, but I'm sure Tattles is going to show us. Tattles has to show us Click stuff afterwards. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happened there. <laughs> yeah, Tattles really better show us what happened to Clicks yep. in the uh, replays later on. Are right, you think he got that? We want to see what happened to Clicks. I, I clicked on the replay channel when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this boss is taking a long time though, right? I think when, when they pulled this boss, they were 16 minutes into the dungeon, and now it's uh, close to 20. And if you compare it to Evolved, 23 minutes is what the Evolved took. Um, definitely still, you know, a difference. There's still like three minutes, uh, uh, a little bit less than three minutes in favor of Echo. Um, but, I mean, still, I think Evolved um, showing us that they are really good as well. If they can keep up uh, with Echo in the time, obviously not, uh, you know, like this exact same time, but kind of close to it uh, when you look at what Echo is doing. Yeah, I mean, I think there have been very few teams throughout the years that are teams that can compete with Echo when they're playing 100% clean. I think most of our most of our victories against Echo have been when Echo is the one making the mistakes, and Evolved is definitely in that group of teams that can compete with Echo. I mean, being within two minutes of a, of a perfectly clean run from Echo when you've made mistakes yourselves is definitely very impressive. But let's keep the focus on Echo here as they do down Davos and will be taking the first series of the day today. 2-0 against Yepers and putting themselves into the upper finals for tomorrow. That's right. Wow. All right. Echo is uh, a pretty good uh, pretty good team. Yeah, I, I got to say. Pretty pretty solid group <laughs> of players, that Echo. Yeah. Not bad. But that again, like a pretty, pretty clean run. Like a death here and there, but, you know, and, and a little bit of trouble with Sanguine. But I feel like you know, everyone is going to struggle with Sanguine a little bit on this dungeon in particular. Yeah, it's like we were talking about at the very beginning. Spires of Ascension is such a volatile dungeon on Sanguine, yeah. and it's such a big time sink to where if Echo has even put 30 hours into the dungeon, they could still just have a Sanguine heal, and they, it was like a 30-second time penalty that they lost, maybe even a minute time penalty yeah. just to do that Sanguine healing on that one trash pack. But I don't think, I don't think that there's, like, a ton to really hamper on negatively for the Echo run. It was, by and large really really clean like you were saying Doa. right and i mean that's that's kind of the thing that like makes echo the best right is that they can get into these situations get into these dungeons and like where other teams will have those wipes like echo just doesn't it seems like um they they can wipe we've seen them wipe in the past but it's it's it seems like it's much less likely of a chance in other teams and yepers is is a good squad i mean like echo's gonna make anybody look bad right uh, Yepers, is, uh, Yepers is obviously a talented squad, and we were talking about this when you we were watching Tettles. Like, if you're playing against Echo, you really need to like kind of go all out. You really need to try things that you might not have tried otherwise, and that's going to lead to maybe more wipes than usual. Yeah, it 
if Yuppers were doing the strategies that we saw today, if they were doing them back in Season 1 of Shadowlands, you would sit there and you'd be like, man, this team is insane. This is the best team I've ever seen. <laughs> and it's just like, watching it in Season 3, I think that it, a lot of it comes down to the fact that, one, Yuppers is a very new team. Um, they're new to the MDI space. If it And two, they're just kind of inconsistent. It's not that their strategies are bad. Their individual players are all very, very talented. Um, and if they're working together, if they um, they could even take top two this weekend, I think, if they continue to get more consistent. While this 2-0, watching them versus Echo, it looked a bit rough at times, and they had some pretty big wipes like you see here. Like This, this is a very unfortunate situation where they ended up wiping this back. Uh, these, these are things that can't happen, but if they can make sure that their practice uh. can convert immediately to like live results, then I, I expect this team could be um, a top two contention. And then it's ironic, this is the clip that you were wanting to see about clicks. Thank you. What happened? <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, storming. Oh, we got knocked out. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you hate to that see it. That's why his spot sender didn't brock. It won't save you from everything. Yeah. <laughs> you can't dark pack that. <laughs> yeah. You probably could have dark pack walled it, though, if you had both up. But Maybe. The thing um, the where Yeppers <laughs> wiped too, that was actually crazy. Because they, they tried to do the double pull that we have seen before in um, the MDI, yeah. where you pull the left side and you pull the stealth claws, and then you just line up side and pull it all together. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what uh, Yeppers tried to do there, uh, which is a very dangerous thing to do when you have uh, Sanguine. Because uh, those mobs, they don't like to move those skirmishers, right? So very interesting that they tried to execute that. And surely they know that they can if they have... Uh, tried it on the tournament, uh, so they probably have done it and executed it in practice. But Echo didn't want to do that this time around, so I guess they decided it was too big of a risk. True enough. Well, Echo, risky or not, moves on to the semi-final for Group A. Meanwhile, Yeppers goes down to face the winner of Witness Cuties versus Incarnation, which we'll see a little bit later today. Uh, that'll that'll be an interesting one. Um, you know, Witness Cuties, a, a, a new squad coming in. Guild members, guild mates with uh, apes together strong, uh, but Incarnation is going to be a tough opponent, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Incarnation, even even though they're a team that doesn't look that practiced this patch, they're still a team that can play relatively consistently. They didn't look that bad in Spires the other day. They just kind of fell apart at the end of the dungeon. Mm -hmm. I think they could uh, they could pretty easily make a lower bracket run today if they play well. Well, we've seen them. Uh put together really impressive tight runs and things like great push so we, we know they have the ability to play that really like clean style if, if uh, they're pushed to it so we'll see what happens but we're going to take a quick break when we come back it's going to be baldy versus evolved our second quarterfinal matchup here at the mythic dungeon international day number two do not go anywhere we'll return in just a few
Welcome back, everybody, to the Mythic Dungeon International. Doe here along with Dratnos, Tettles, and Mr. X joining us as well this weekend. Uh, we just saw Echo get a quick 2-0, but, you know, I, I think that's kind of what we were all expecting. Uh, you know, Matt, we were watching that one. Dratnos, you were too. Uh, any, anything stand out in that match in particular? We'll go to you first, Matt. I mean, once you, uh, once you kind of get behind Echo, uh, it becomes very difficult to catch up. Like, you have to just press uh -huh. so much harder. Uh, and you already kind of have to play perfect, it's pretty difficult once you get behind, where I think Yeppers is definitely better than what they looked. Dratnos, any any takeaways from you on that last one? For me, it's just like, wow, Streets is actually kind of hard with the way we have it set up in this weekend, and Echo did not look infallible there. Obviously, their run was, was good, but it didn't look like it was impossible to beat for some of the other good teams we have in this bracket in that dungeon, so uh, potentially an opportunity for somebody to maybe uh, yoink a game or a, a match off of them even later on down the line. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of dangerous being that, in that position like Echo is, where uh, everyone is expecting you to perform. You know, it's it's harder to stay on top, I think, than, like, strive to be the best sometimes. And so that that pressure can can affect you. But here's where we're going next. It's going to be Baldi versus Evolved. Uh, both teams oh. ban Mists. Interesting. So we will see Court of Stars oh. then. We just take the first three maps if both teams ban the same one. Remember, it is a blind ban, so that means for this one, we've got Tazvish Gambit, Court of Stars, and then if we need it, Necrotic Wake. Interesting, huh? I'm not surprised that both of these teams uh, elected to not ban Court of Stars. It's like we were talking about earlier. Baldi, a bunch of old people on their team. They all play during <laughs> Legion. They are really, really Fair adept enough. at being able to deal with Court of Stars. Evolved... I mean, they have Shelly and Soda and Alex all on that team. Uh, these are all very storied MDI veterans. Uh, Shelly was on team uh, PogChamp back in the Legion MDI. He got third at the Global Finals as well. Uh, they, like, this is a lot of people who've played Legion Keys whenever they were current. I'm not surprised that the Court of Stars went through. It's only two expansions ago, too. It's not, not that long. Ah, I mean, it's, it's a very it's long not, time you know, ago, Doa. Nah, that's, it's like four nah, that's, years, Doa. It's like yesterday. <laughs> that's, four years is nothing, you know? Well, I, okay, so for, for most people, four years is a long time, but for dinosaurs like Doa, four years, I guess, is just a, a flash in the pan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> relatively, it's it. a smaller it's percentage of his life than it is for us. That's so. true. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's true. By a little bit, a little bit. Doa, yeah. do you remember the war? <laughs> I remember the third war uh, between the Horde and the Alliance. Yeah. Or uh, everyone became uh, friends. Yeah, I the guess. veteran of that. That's how you get extra help on death. <laughs> that's 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 right. That's I was a I was veteran of the third war. Yeah, that's true yeah. for a little while. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. I'm also not surprised to see the mist go like fortified, spiteful mists. Like if you if you <laughs> yeah. kind of uh, you know, have some of those spiteful still up in the maze and you can't go through, you kind of have to either just kill them uh or just kind of you have to kill everything at the right time to go through that, which is a little bit is a little bit tough. Yeah. What, you don't do want to guys... be the team that doesn't ban it, and then you have to play it. Yeah, That's true. What do you guys think about the Gambit um, being on a 24 Fort Raging Explosive? It's a lot different than what we saw yeah. uh, during time trials, right? Yeah, and it's led to some of these games that we've seen in there being much more volatile, I think, especially because teams are going to be thinking about spending a lot of their practice time in other dungeons, right, and not spending too mm -hmm. much in a time trial dungeon. But because the time trial dungeon just has such a different texture, three levels higher and with fortified instead. Yeah, I, I do think that actually spending some time and making sure that you have a strategy that works on the higher key level uh, is something that was important for teams to do. And I'm not sure how many of them actually put in that time. Cause of course there was a lot of other important stuff to do with the yeah. week leading up to this. They mm -hmm. also ran pretty much the same comps in like the time trail outside of the tanks where uh, I believe for Evolve, you had the blood DK and for Baldi, the demon hunter. So. Uh, I wonder on the higher key with the fortified if you see maybe evolve try uh, Baldi actually try and run the blood uh, DK. Is it a little bit better in terms of survivability? Could be. Remains to be seen. Uh, let's check out Tazavesh Gambit live stats for 24 fortified. The average run time 28 minutes and 9 seconds. Good amount of deaths. Best run ever on live 21 minutes 51 seconds. We're kind of seeing uh, those those records blown out of the water today, but but no no big surprise there. I mean, these are teams that are like practicing the same thing over and over again with the same key, the same affixes, I suppose, and uh, they've got some pretty tight runs. No so doubt what about are it. the average deaths to here? They're probably to Goliath stomps on the beginning. Uh, yeah. BPS getting picked up by the tail on the captain boss, <laughs> yeah. um, and then people not damaging the pulsar on the third uh, 
you know, those third ants? I bet it's overwhelmed with overwhelmingly the murloc area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You, you don't, you, your fish stick, you know, spawns behind like a rock or something like that and you don't notice it. And yeah, like, why isn't, why aren't things dying? Yeah. Get a, a surprise Goliath from behind uh, who just kind of starts to yep. run Dude, up and go crazy. It, going from a 21 uh, Tyran during time trials <laughs> to a 24 Fortified, those Murlocs, like, you're going to have to have a lot more control for the Murlocs. And I do actually agree that I think the Blood DK is probably going to be the best bet just to make sure that the mobs can stay grouped up a lot easier and not uh, flee and tear whenever they start to get low and pull any uh -huh. of those uh, pull any of those giants I think that that's something that you're gonna have to watch out for is just how these teams are gonna be patrolling through the first uh, little bit of this dungeon well didn't we see a fury warrior on this uh, yesterday too or, or am I misremembering a, a team ran it in trials uh, okay but they didn't right. run it in the yeah. actual key yeah oh, okay that's what it was yeah I mean because spear bastion makes a lot of sense here too but you know I suppose you do have other tools in that and other classes you really want to bring instead yeah Piercing Owl. Commanding Shout to keep people alive, too, from time to time. Yeah, I mean, with Tazadash, you're stop. not... Uh, it's not like where you're trying to fit any of the Covenants in, right? There's no, like, no, there's bonus. Not. So you can really mm -hmm. kind of play whatever you think fits best here. True enough. Well, it seems like we're about ready to get into the game. Baldi versus Evolved. Winner moves on. Loser goes down to the lower bracket. Um, and this one could be pretty close. We'll see who takes map number one. Take it away. Right, so we have slight difference in the compositions here chosen by the two teams. A rogue for Evolved, whereas the Havoc Demon Hunter on Shaqib Team Baldi. As we get started with a Bloodlust for both teams on a massive pull. Wow, that's a lot of mobs. I'm, oh man, this, uh, I'm surprised that the Goliath is getting pulled in this first pack for Evolved, but not for Baldi. I feel like uh, at the very beginning, whenever you do have all of your offensive CDs, you would rather just grab that Goliath right off the rip. Uh, as opposed to if you feel like you have to pull it later. But this maybe means that Baldi's not going to elect to pull any of these giants in this area. Yeah, you can see Baldi here only getting 21% from their first pull, whereas Evolved got up to 25. Evolved also picked up Woe, whereas Baldi went with her. So they were a little bit more powerful in that pull, but Evolved got that damage reduction, which actually was pretty nice against that second Goliath stomp. Uh, and then they also got to zoom into this next pull. So very interesting and different takes on the first area of the dungeon. We'll see who gets to the boss sooner. because That's really going to be the only way to identify which was actually better. Uh, overall, how do you feel about the difference between the Havoc Demon Hunter versus the Rogue? Because I, I actually think that the Havoc Demon Hunter and like the debuff that it provides, a lot of people talk about Chaos Brand um, as a reason to bring like a Demon Hunter tank to Mythic Plus. I've always felt like that's not really the, the reason that you would ever bring like uh, a Demon Hunter tank, but I, I do seriously feel like this season, the Demon Hunter DPS and like Chaos Brand would be a major reason to at least bring them in this situation. Yeah, I mean, you're just like the rogues, right? You're not going to compete with the survival or the destro on the big AoE pulls. But yeah, you kind of uh, your single target's going to be nice. And when you think about that 5% damage increase over the course of the dungeon, that is quite a bit of extra value. Whereas the rogue is nice because you're providing quite a bit of utility. More like you, ha you have more stops and stuff than the demon hunter, which does at least bring that AoE stun that the comps are sort of lacking. Uh, and you have that priority damage as well available for pulls, I, such as a Goliath, right? If you want to pull a Goliath in this first area, having a rogue that's able to dump eviscerates into it will actually go a long way towards making that possible. Whereas the Havoc Demon Hunter comp, part of the reason that you maybe don't see them pulling that is that they don't have that same characteristic of the damage. I hated that Goliath from the ball, but I don't know if you saw it on the right-hand side. Yeah. It's just, it, it ended up costing them so much time, and while they are running that, that subtlety rogue to be able to prioritize priority damaged it down it felt like it was just so time inefficient and then if you look at what baldi's doing they're literally just like standing over here away out of the out of the range I mean, of all is... the patrols for the goliaths and that like their their murlocs are running in fear like they're they're not perfect with their control on these ads okay that, that kill was sick but they they weren't perfect with their control of killing but I think that they've, they've edged out like a pretty substantial yeah. lead here. And that's basically just a live key strat as well. Just hug left, don't pull any giants. Like if you just do that, that's that's a great way to attack this dungeon for anybody. Dude. They've gotten through the Murloc area with zero deaths as well. The last two teams that I saw in this dungeon had like seven and 11 deaths in the Murloc area each. Look at the difference here between, I mean, with all being involved on zero and one death so far. Evolved still do have a couple more percent to grab, although I think the pull they're currently working on is going to get the most of it. 
There was something super cool too that we saw. Shaq Dolphin, you see his meld is on CD. He actually melded and uh, then the ur buff like applied to him to, to like stealth him. And then he was able to start the RP on this first boss before his party was even finished with the last little remaining bit of the trash. And so that's again, just an MDI level optimization where they are making sure that they start their RP early be to get this boss active because they know that those last three or four Murlocs aren't going to be that dangerous. There's no real point in having them still there. Yeah, but that's the... We think of that kind of thing as, like, rogue work generally, right? But Demon Hunter can absolutely look, do look it as well here. Look at, look at Evolve. This is rogue work right here that, yeah. that's going on. They're shrouding all the way through. How far are they? Are they going to be able to get through on this uh, I. Is this it's certainly what, a question. Mind Soothe, Mind Soothe Gateway or something? What's about... What are they about? Oh, okay. Pull to the oh, side. Oh, pull to the side. Okay. And uh, Fame. Uh, fame Death. Yeah, yeah, turtle yeah, okay, fame. Okay, okay, that works. It. I feel like a, a woe relic would be really nice to have to save time here, but maybe they didn't have a, a way to get a relic in their last couple of bowls. Baldi's opening up again. I, I keep reiterating. I mean, it's massively opening yeah. up massively now. Like, we, I thought that they only had like maybe a, a twenty to thirty second lead on the trash, but I'm, they're about to have like a one boss gap through the first boss. This is absolutely huge for them and now we're going to the second part of um, gambit I, I really am worried i'm really worried about both raging and explosive in this little area because it, at least it's kind of assumed how teams dealt with this stuff during time trials that they were kind of pulling infinite amounts of the trash onto the boss but i don't think that's really going to be a thing in this level and with these ah. affixes all right, well, we make our way into this pool. They are going to just start with... They knew, do need all the trash in the rest of the dungeon, except for that Star Seer at the top of the stairs in the uh, Solia rooms. So they are going to have to pull basically everything here. The Ur Relic is going to be their choice on this pull. And they're not going to try and drag it forward or anything like that. They're just going to take care of this. I wonder how quickly they're going to try and handle the next three pulls and that boss. I wonder if they're going to try and do something crazy. I... I I hope not. Like I, I don't know how reasonable it is to do on a twenty four, but if there's a time to bust it out, it's definitely I mean, the MDI. Yeah, explosive is actually pretty limiting on that boss, especially because it's it's pretty hard to <laughs> yeah. group things and then to also get close to all the explosives. But when you have the levels of AOE damage that you know survival, destro, and cooldowns and PI have well they don't have infernal or meta yeah they don't they also don't have lust so i, I think that probably means they're not going to try and do this all at once or anything like that it looks like it's going to be two pulls and then the last pull will go onto the boss oh no it's three pulls all right it's three pulls but no boss is the, i'm okay uh, with this and the mass script's going to come out you can see a lot of damage is being used here but aoe stuns really good as long as you can kill all these tide sages before they're on stun dr uh, it's really good if oh, you don't God. have that happen and these brackish bolts are going to be very painful. I believe that was their second stun. There's the third on Shadow Fury. So this next thing is not AoE stunnable as the mobs are raging, but they oh. have dealt with the casters, which are the ones that will randomly kill your tank. Although the deckhands also do with the Haymaker. That was a disgusting CC chain. I don't know if you saw it. So they went meta stun into Infernal, into uh, Chaos Nova, into Shadow Fury. That was actually just the most disgusting CC chain I've ever seen. And that it has just allowed them to, like you were saying, that pack, if they don't get that CC chain off perfectly, they're probably going to wipe to it. But they just it just looks so clean for Baldi. On the right side of the screen, Evolved, uh, they did have a death uh, really early on in the dungeon, so that's not a new death. They were able to make it through the first boss, and it looked like, ooh, is their Holy Priest pulling some trash potentially even up to, up to here? Where was he going off to? Hmm. Yeah, it could be. Maybe he's baiting the, uh, the swirls at range away from everybody. Probably. Tidal bursts. Yeah, that's more likely, I think, than pulling another trash pack up. I don't this. see any trash pulls coming up to join this one. Yeah, so it looks like that's not the plan for uh, for Evolved. Let's see how they decide to attack this trash room into the second boss as well. We know a couple of different ways, a couple different teams like to do it. What are they going to do? It looks like they're starting off running over to the left. And it looks like one pull for now. Next pull is Mind Soothe, so it doesn't look like they want that just yet. So maybe this is going to be one trash pull and then the next two into the boss? Or maybe it's going to be even even slower than that. I, I think if they do anything that's any any slower than two into the boss, I think that we're really worried about their time. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that would just mean they're doing this room in more pulls than Baldi, and that's a, a dangerous place to be. Yeah. But, okay, so hey, things... 
Things are looking really good for Baldi. I mean, honestly, the ball is not even in Evolve's court anymore. They need Baldi to kind of make a mistake. Uh, ball, just the way that they dealt with that first area was incredibly, incredibly strong. And now the Baldi boss is getting well. down the second boss. They're looking I mean, the, really good. The execution of that boss fight, like, LePan was just keeping that boss in the exact same spot all the time, basically, and just sniping the ads they were spawning from really long range. Very nice uh, mechanics there keeping that fight from getting out of control like we often see, at least in my keys, happens all the time on that one. You're just running all around the room with ads spawning in all four directions. Alright, okay, so now they skip that mini-boss. Yeah, the, the, the first Adorn Star Seer is, is what you can skip yeah. by getting to 53% where you deal with the first boss. That's exactly what both Baldi and Evolved have done. Baldi now going into one Star Seer, five oh. Trash Mobs, and three Relics. Oh my god! <laughs> Is this quite, is very actually, scary. That's seven. Was, was that the patrol as well? I think it might have been. It so, was the patrol. It was also the patrol. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Trash they... mobs, one star seer, and uh, and uh, and the relics as well. A lot of action here for Baldi, but they are keeping it going. Guardian spirits going to be used on the hand to prevent an untimely demise. <laughs> they have done good job so Dude. far, but now the mobs start raging. This is the most painful thing I've ever seen. So everybody is AoEing this trash pack, and then you see Shakib off to the side, soloing that Pulsar for the Star Seer, while the, the Warlock and the Surf Hunter are getting there, just allowed to AoE the whole entire time, having a nice time, and Shakib doing all of the, the dirty work. Yeah, that's, uh, again, that's just the, whatever DPS isn't the Survival Hunter or the Destro Lock gets to do a lot of fun jobs like that. The rest of the, uh, the survival hunter in the Destro Lock will continue just AoEing in their cooldowns. All right, well, now right. we have that Star Seer almost dead. We'll see if they decide to go into boss or if they want to clean up this trash before the boss pull. Either way, as long as they can kill this boss cleanly, they are so far ahead of Evolved right now. They are going to start with the trash pull. Looks like the pan is inching towards the boss, so maybe it's uh, trash into the boss on pull. Pan's got to watch his health a little bit here, but he has recovered. Vamp Blood and Rune Weapon, both going to keep him very healthy for the next while. Yeah, just as a reminder, this is our 6th seed and our 7th seed um, overall. Um, and, and so this match is going to be quite close. I'm surprised at how well Baldi has looked in, in this gambit, though. They, especially compared to where Evolved was yesterday, Baldi is maybe looking like the better of the two teams. It just kind of depends on where these potentially two next matches are going to go. As Evolved has another death at the tail end of of hook tail. <laughs> I see what you've done there. Yeah, uh, I, I would have come into this series thinking that. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> okay. There was a, there was a bombardment related incident. I see. All right. Well, luckily the master has picked up both of them for evolve. Uh, like you're saying there. Yeah. Based on yesterday's games, I would have thought that maybe evolve had the slight edge in this series, but at least in Gambit, Baldi looked to be on another level entirely. I mean, this is a unbelievably fast run. Yesterday, we were seeing teams coming out of Gambit in like 18 minutes, something like that, uh, with obviously with very scuffed Murloc pulls, but Baldi are, are already phasing Solia here, and we're at 11:30. Evolved haven't even looked bad, by the way. Like, yeah. just, just as a point of reference, Evolved haven't even looked bad. I didn't realize that you could pull like this on a 24 fortified with raging and explosive the way that Baldi has dealt with this uh, dungeon. So it's, it's looked quite impressive. Yeah. And like you said, they finished off their trash count. Now it's basically just DPSing down Solia. The boss is immune right here. Okay, now, now you're able to DPS down Solia as that Bloodlust has been popped. And now. There's not really a lot left to do. It's just kind of a quick burn on the boss. JB should definitely be able to keep his roof topped up um, from some of those AoEs. You, you do have to make sure that you're dodging these stars. They're just keeping the boss you're in the not as go. well. They're not going to move it to the side and make it easier to dodge. They're just going to just dodge <laughs> or heal me. Just dodge. Yeah. <laughs> you're not going to get one shot. I think even still at this level, I don't think you're going to get one shot by the stars. So it's not the worst thing to keep the boss in the middle, but you really do need to be diligent about those dodges. Yeah, right now they have a collapsing star that they're going to be dealing with as well. That's going to be putting a, a fairly nasty dot on everybody as it does get dealt with. So if people get yeah. hit by the projectiles that are about to spawn uh, on the boss's cast now, well, luckily they've done a really good job of actually already handling that star before any of these projectiles come out. As long as everybody is nice and tough, they can survive one of those hits. Yeah, you can see fired up. I'm actually going to deploy the turtle as he gets hit, going down to 40% health not killed as a result. They are just blasting Solia now. 11% left on the boss. Evolved are in the last boss room, but they aren't even on the boss yet. And Baldi are going to be ending this one before it even begins for Evolved on the last boss. 
All right, and now Solia is going to be dropping. It's looking like Baldi's going to be able to take map one. Oh my gosh, that 13-17. Holy moly, this is so fast. That is a quick run there for Baldi. 1-0 in the series against them all. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty much light speed for for Baldi and evolved. Like had a couple of deaths here and there. Things were a little bit slower off and on, but uh, I, I felt like it could have been competitive. But at the same time, like, can you do it much faster than what Baldi just showed us? It's just that first area with the Murlocs. I mean, that's really like kind of where they lost a lot True. of the time. But yeah, I mean, that's uh, what Baldi's time during trials was 10:48. Uh, and then with the fortified affix now, then the boosted key level, like to do that in 1317, uh, that is really impressive uh, from Baldi there. Yeah, I think we'll take a look at the uh, the live stats for that a little bit later too, but I, I want to say they like halved the best time ever yeah. in live servers. <laughs> I'll look at the exact number later, but man. I think it's one of those things that it's not about like Evolved even playing that that run necessarily bad, but it was just no. like, oh my gosh, that ball, that, that ball began yeah, to run it. Uh, that could definitely be a problem for <laughs> a <laughs> yeah. later yeah. on. This, this was eight minutes faster than the fastest recorded time on the live servers on 24 Fortified. Now, to be fair, on the live servers, you don't pull like this, right? Because you just need to beat the timer. But <laughs> still, mm -hmm. this is a unbelievably quick run here for Baldi. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, Evolved really not that far behind. Like, I think the Murloc area was probably where they lost the most time strategically, and then they lost more time to a couple of minor mistakes later on, but it really yeah. was not a bad run out of them either. So I think we're going to be in for a nice series here. Yeah, well, you got to keep in mind, too. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I think the quarter stars will be really interesting between these two teams coming up next. Yeah, you have to keep in mind, too, that, like, Evolve's time would have still beaten, like, the live record by a pretty large margin, too. So clearly playing well, but... Court of Stars, yeah, man, I mean, this just, like, throws things into a whole entirely different realm, a whole entire different expansion, even. Um, but, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, a lot, lot of old people playing in this series, I guess. So they played Legion, even though it wasn't that long ago. You know, you don't need to be that old to play well during Legion. IMO. But let's let's forget about that for a second. And let's look at this early on. The Murloc section, again, for Evolve, this is where things did slow down a little bit. Yeah, they had one of their three deaths uh, here during the Murloc section. I feel like where they lost the most time was when they didn't, like, uh, obviously the woe skip to the boss with the speed is pretty effective. They ended up doing, it was like a a shroud and then a turtle with a fane on those uh, you know, two guards by the door to get through. Mm -hmm. uh, they get the ur here. I wonder if that was, like, intentional or they wanted to maybe get woe here for the skip right after. Oh, that mm -hmm. explosive went off, too. Scary moment. Yeah, uh, so what did you like end up thinking? Would be nice here. Yeah, the woe would be cool. What did you end up thinking about the rogue versus demon hunter? I actually really like the demon hunter now that I watched it. I thought that the the rogue does provide a decent amount of single target damage value, but I just felt like the AOE DPS for the demon hunter at least was a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, it was just a strat diff though. Simple brand's pretty strong, and then uh, uh, we were talking a little bit uh, you know, while you guys were casting, uh, running the legendary where it spawns the other demon with the eye beam and the fell devastation, and mm -hmm. that increases the dot time of the sinful brand as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so keeping the meta up, keeping the sinful brand rolling, uh, you also get the magic damage uh, buff right uh, for the warlock. So it's definitely uh, beneficial. Like I wonder if you know. I mean, they used the Shroud there, right? I don't know if that was intentional or maybe they just kind of had to do it uh, because they needed to get by those mobs. Yeah, one of the things I really like about the Sinful Brand in this dungeon in particular is like if you're trying to pull those three packs before the second boss, right? When you use Sinful Brand, like when you meta and use Sinful Brand all of those mobs, they get 30% reduced attack speed and 30% reduced casting oh. speed, which makes the pull like that so much less lethal for your tank. Uh, and so I, I think something like that really might help facilitate why Baldi is able to make those bigger pulls work uh, compared to what Evolved were able to put together. It's true, because you do have the, uh, it's fortified raging, and then those deckhands, right. uh, they enrage as they get lower as well, right? Yeah. So those get super nasty as time goes by. And uh, they did end up running the Blood DK this time instead of the Demon Hunter, which probably another reason uh, why that area is just really nasty. Yeah, I mean, the DK we talked about already does such a good job of keeping things where they, they should be. Uh, keeping you from pulling more stuff than you're intending to pull, um, you know, and again, it's just 
going to be a little bit more survivable maybe. But it's a 1-0 lead for Baldi with, i got to say, the most intense-looking eagle face I've ever seen in, in my life, basically. Staring into my soul. It's a little bit intimidating. I think I would... I think I would actually kind of give the court, the edge to court to Baldi as well. Just yeah. uh, based on experience. So, yeah. yeah, based on experience. Um, in addition to that, this team has been playing together for a very long time. For some of these players, since Legion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, good. What were you say? I was just, yeah, I was okay. like, it, yeah, good. No, 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 you go, you go. All right, I was just saying. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Okay, okay, me, me, me. Somebody go. <laughs> If we got to see Shakib on Vengeance Demon Hunter, like back in in the old Legion days, uh, in this dungeon, it'd be cool. That was I, I remember the first time I ever watched Shakib was in a Court of Stars playing Vengeance Demon Hunter, back in the back in the day. Wow. So uh, Dranos also claims to be old enough to have actually played Legion live. No, I was watched watching. It. I'm he not just watched. Yeah. It, yeah. Watched. Oh, yeah. okay. Watch. Too young <laughs> to be manning a computer himself, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, of course. <laughs> well, old enough to watch. Yeah, you know. I think the great school area. It looks like we're getting started. All right, enjoy. We'll see if Baldi can take 2-0 or if Evolve ties it up. First, though, we have to wait for this boat. Take us to the, uh, to, over to the Did other Shelley... dock. Did Shelly pre- Oh, he pre-Infernaled. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I thought he just dropped that Infernal. Uh, that, no, you, but you that get Infernal, like, sense. right before the key starts. Yeah. Yeah. You can, just, you can like, stack up a, even oh! a bit more than just one Infernal. Dude! We didn't talk about the Infernal Apex. Oh no! We have a new seasonal Apex on these Legion dungeons as well. Uh, so for Legion time walking, they all have the, this Infernal Apex, and well, we're going to talk about it whenever we get to the bosses. All of the bosses have them in this in this dungeon, but it makes the the ability to be able to kill the encounters quite quick. Oh yeah, we could even see it while we're taking a yeah. nice swift fifty second boat ride. Basically, there are the there's many bosses before each of the three bosses in court that uh, you either kill them with the boss or before the boss. Usually it'll be before the boss, but maybe on key level 21 in the MDI setting, they'll actually be doing them with boss. And then they'll also spawn these infernals while you're fighting those mini bosses. And when you kill the infernals, they'll make a swirly that you can soak. And when you soak that swirly, you get to pulse for a bunch of AOE damage and an increased damage taken debuff to everything that you're hitting with it. So really, really powerful as Baldi now are going to start by disabling this first beacon. These mobs have fairly small AoE range, like they won't see you even if you're fairly close, so uh, it's actually pretty easy to sneak around once you're familiar oh, with like the safe spots in the area. Okay, Baldi doing a really good job of making sure that the Sanguine healing is mitigated. Uh, Sanguine is really tough in this area for both of these teams. You need to make sure that those Mana Worms don't die underneath those guards. Of course, those guards are uh, CCable. You can see Alex gripping that uh, guard out of that Sanguine heal. Uh, on the side of Evolved, you just need to be super careful. It's interesting to see the the massive discrepancy between the two, uh, the routes between the two teams. Baldi was taking a little bit slow at the beginning. Uh, they did it like a like a four pack. Uh, right. Make sure that they got that enforcer. Make sure that they got that uh, lamp turned off. Whereas Evolved, they did get the lamp turned off, but they were kind of skipping the rest of that stuff. They they were just gonna de they'll just deal with it whenever it comes. And they did activate the engineering orb. You do see all of these. Uh, oh gosh, what are these called? These things are called anymore. Charge things. The, you see those mobs are deactivated. Uh, they turn neutral. The constructs, and right? Yeah. The constructs, yeah, yeah, yeah. The charged constructs. That's exactly what they're called. And now Evolved here has pulled the Infernal mobs into the boss. And this is quite scary as all of this trash is still alive. But Evolved is doing a great job of getting this Infernal core buffs up on all the adds. And the pack just dies instantly, huh? Yeah, look at all those Infernals now that have come down during this encounter, once they can kill off those Infernals, if they make sure to soak those cores as well, they'll be doing so much extra damage to this boss, so very cool to see. Both teams are on the exact same composition as each other here as well. One thing that that rogue has swapped out for Evolved, and they are now also on the Havoc Demon Hunter. That's kind of wild, because Rogue is historically so sick for this stuff. Yeah! <laughs> just uh, just how this boss and the second boss generally function. Oh. The, the Subtlety Rogue has always been such a popular pick. And Soda and the uh, Bazooka... Oh, oh no! DPS Evolved is gonna have... Oh no! And the healer! Everybody except for the Blood Death Knight are down for Evolved, and the Blood Death Knight will soon join them. As they now are all going to release. That's five deaths on the board, 25 seconds but also a full reset of that pull. And this is catastrophic for Evolved. They had a faster pull on that boss than Baldi by quite a bit. They were pulling more trash, they were they were zooming, but now they are set so far back. And oh, but Baldi fired up. having a death in return here, fired up. They've gotta make sure they can stabilize this and not have this cascade into a disaster. 
Yeah, this is a, this is a medium level issue uh, that can absolutely turn into a massive level issue. Oh, it looks like Baldi's gonna even reset the trash pack. They're they're not having it. They're just gonna. So they got the boss there, right? The boss uh, died okay. to the drinking the poisoned flask. You're right. You're right. You're right. So, so they actually did get everything killed off. Everything is fine. And I'm. Did Shakib? Okay, so Shakib is not with the group. So Shakib is starting the RP. The remainder of Baldi have ran back to this area. Of course, the engineering orb has turned all these constructs to neutral mobs, and so now Shaq has made uh, made it through the checkpoint, and that door has opened, and now Baldi is making their way towards the remainder of this instance. Oh, oh, Angel out for uh, for Baldi there. Unfortunate turn of events. Just as JB was trying to activate that wounded Nightborn, oh! summon the first Enforcer, oh! and Lapan and Fired Up going down as well. And I think this is probably going to be another full wipe here. That Ice Storm so deadly. <laughs> Just as I remember, the Ice Storm will just one-shot you 100 to 0 if you let it go off, so you need to make sure that you constantly uh, stun that cast. Do not let that thing go off. Quaking Look also potentially some danger uh, here for Baldi. Make uh, Trying to stabilize, though, that Ice Storm beautifully <laughs> stunned this time, at least. <laughs> After people have already got hit by it and then died. Oh, no. Looks like Lapan now is going to bathe in this Sanguine here just to reset Another it. Inquisitor got pulled. All right, so now Baldi are on 10 deaths, Evolved are What's only on 7. What's Evolved going on? What's going on, man? Running through the uh, the RP area here, while Baldi just keeping keeping on what they're up to. Both teams have downed that first boss as well. So actually fairly close between the two teams. Baldi have an advantage of 4%, plus they're slightly better positioned in the dungeon, but they're down 3 extra deaths, so that's 15 seconds. As Evolved do have a tank death. Tank rezzed. See how they decide to handle this. Baldi are pulling a bunch of trash back onto these neutral constructs just to effectively get that free count from AoEing down those mobs during this pull. All right, and Evolved is activating that uh that Blood Elf Lantern. Or actually, no, it's the Night Elf uh, the Night Elf Lantern. Even ooh, they're trying to get some more of their buffs. I'm surprised that they sent their healer on the side of Evolved to of to do this, and they allowed their their three DPS plus their tank as that kill squad that's on the right side. I think that that means that they're probably doing some of these packs a lot slower than where we saw from Baldi. But again, Baldi just having some more issues. Another death for Fired Up. It they're looks like Evolved up. might have just been DPSing the neutrals down. That might have been what they, they were up to. Res? Oh, dude, they just had to battle res Fired Up as well because this is a mini boss. And so since it, this, yeah. this mini boss is, uh, counts as boss combat. Oh, okay, dude, Baldi is wow. now pulling the mini boss into all the trash on the... <laughs> on the, on docks. the docks. Oh. Now we see usually when we see the docks pulled is right at the start of the dungeon. But Baldi yes. is actually going to use it for just something to AOE while they're dealing with this mini boss. That is a really cool plan. It's I sanguine. like this a lot. It, it, yeah, it's sanguine. Be careful. <laughs> this, this could go from a a really good pull to a moderate. Okay, there's the mass grip. Not careful. That mass grip is hugely powerful here, but now they don't have it for these other mobs as they're dying. One single grip used there by Lapan to grip him up. He's about to die so that it doesn't drop Sanguine under the others. There's Shining Force as well. Now, I think they are out of most of their displacement effects. You can see that Sanguine healing now is starting to come in on these guards who are free casting in some. They have a Mortal Coil that's going to displace one of the guards out of there. And another grip comes off cooldown as they just have to finish off these last two guards now. Overall, I think a solid a solid A- minus on the Sanguine management there for Baldi on that one. I would give that like an 8 out of 10. I feel like that was really good for what yeah. it was. I was very scared for a little bit. But uh, th that those trash mobs as well, if you let the arcane orb go off, you'll instant wipe, <laughs> even on yeah. 21. So there's, there's a lot that could have gone wrong for Baldi, and the fact that they were able to make it look that clean was really good. And now there's a massive trash lead between the two teams of Baldi and Evolved. Yeah, Baldi basically done with their trash already. They only need a couple more enemies, as you can see. They're now starting the next Enforcer. These Enforcers, typically the strategy, because that Fell Devastation does so much damage, is they like to move near a line of sight spot and then just line every time it casts. You'll see both teams doing that, although there are a lot of different places you can do that lining. You can see everybody hiding <laughs> as that cast goes off and then coming back out into sight of the Enforcer. So... A very, very good way of making sure that's not doing too much damage to the group because it really, really tracks. I think they only have, I think they only have one mini boss left. Um, I, I think yeah. they only have the eyeball. Yep, that's uh, going to be the last one, and they are at 100% count annoying. as well. Yeah, so the eyeball, uh, it's the one that like channels on you and makes you do less yeah. damage. Yeah. 
I do not so like notably, that. So notably... Notably, you can line of sight his, uh, like, no, that's what setting up here. target. Look at, look at where Lip's standing, right? Lip, Lip, JB, and Fired Up are all standing in a spot oh, on where the they tank. could line if it's targeted by them, and then it would just retarget. And so they would just keep doing that until it targeted Le Pan, uh, and, yeah. or, or JB, right? Uh, and oh. leave the DPS unhindered by that damage decrease. In, in addition to that, if you're lining, um, you're, you're not actually an eligible target, so you can just, like, have all four people stand line, and, like, uh, the Watcher will target over and over. He won't actually target anybody, but he'll just sit there not meleeing or doing anything for a little while until he finally finds Lepan and he's like, okay, now I've found an eligible target. Obviously, that's not great damage-wise to be doing it like that, but that is also a strategy if you're looking to do something alive where you don't want to get targeted by that damage uh, dealt decrease. That is a way that you can do it as well. Infernals drop from the sky as the mini boss is again coming with boss here for Baldi. They aren't going to activate that beacon beforehand. They are just going to be fighting this with the boss. Unfortunately, they weren't able to soak that we second missed. infernal core because of where it spawned and the fact that all of the imps were spawning as well. As it looks like, oh, the, oh yeah, the, these so these are just the affix ads as well coming in these flame yes, casters, yes, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh my, dude. Uh, to looks like Flame Reef is dead. <laughs> yeah, huh? What has happened to this boss? Where's the boss? Excuse <laughs> Where's me? the boss? I guess it's, 20, it's a 2145. I think maybe I mean, we're... So, something has happened here well, to Talixe Flame Reef. I, I don't quite know how to describe it, but so, it was there before, and 20 seconds later, the boss was entirely dead. I have I have a way of describing this. It's called the Warlock Incident. I see, okay. <laughs> Very big damage for Baldi, though. I mean, they're re basically ready to end this dungeon now. Hey. They just have to find the imposter in this uh, in this party. They have a Havoc Demon Hunter who can suss out the imposter if given all the information. So you see Lip Lock running to the last information giver, and, that, and then the imposter will be known to Shakib as he'll press Spectral Sight, and you do see him... Uh, Selecting the imposter. They're looking kind of sus. Yeah, Lip gonna set up a gateway now. Once you know which like pack the imposter spawned in, you know which side it'll actually path to to give you this mini boss encounter, and you can pre-set up that gateway and get everything ready uh, just to really optimize this as much as you can. <laughs> Beasts are dropped as well while they're waiting for this RP uh, because of course they did all die. So getting that food buff would be nice if possible. Maybe Quaking going to interrupt those aspirations. Somebody, somebody chat just typed this should have been seat. <laughs> huh. Uh, well, yeah, I, I missed seat of the triumvirate. That was a fun uh, dungeon. We're, we're currently a court of stars. All right, so this mini boss, it can be problematic. So the Shadow Bolt volley, if you don't know how it works, it, it can cause some problems. So whenever you saw there's like a travel time on that Shadow Bolt volley, and then it puts a debuff on you to where you take 100% increased damage or like 500% increased damage from the next Shadow Bolt volley. So you need to make sure that for every successful one that you're going to be taking, you need to take like one or two steps back because if you actually uh, take it and then walk forward, the debuff is not going to have enough time to time out and you're going to take two of the stacks Excellent. and it will basically you instantly kill you. There's, there's going to be no way of recovering it. So you need to make sure that you're successfully moving backwards for the position that you were previously at whenever you got the last shadow bolt on you. Dude, I really like what Evolved are up to over here on the right. They've actually pulled Talixe onto this disabled construct that is, uh, Ooh. you know, it's been deactivated by the engineering orb. Uh, and so they're able to get that free count just leaving it down with the boss. A really clever adaptation there from Evolved. However, Baldi already are now fighting the final mini boss. This is the spider one, and this is actually the one that can be the most problematic. The main thing to know if you're fighting this is the oh spider webs uh, are an oh. AoE damage reduction on the enemy. Dude, this boss so is dead. Pull the mobs out of those spider webs. This boss is so dead. It, you, look at this infernal cores. We have the lust activated. Ooh. Every single offensive CD has been popped on a 21 fortified. Yeah, this boss is getting health. melted. It's getting destroyed. Has a huge damage taken increase. Everybody's in all of their cooldowns, 40% and dropping so quickly here on Melandris. And I mean, Baldi have just looked so, so strong in this series. I think they really targeted these maps as well and made sure they were ready because I think they knew how important these games were going to be. But they have put on oh. a clinic here. Even with those 11 deaths, this run is so fast. I mean, it's sub 15 minutes here in this Court of Stars. And Baldi are going to take the series 2 over Evolve. Oh, Baldi with the uh, the quick 2-0. A lot, lot of death going on in this particular dungeon. But uh, do you think at the end of the day, do you think either team expected to play it? Yeah, clearly. They both expected to play it. it they, they, mean... they had, they had like, really impressive rounds set up. 
I would because I was wondering because we were talking about this before where the the chance of like both teams banning something else, expecting the other team to be the one to ban Court of Stars, but you think the the routes prove yeah, otherwise? Those definitely looked very planned and, and practiced mm. from both teams. Yeah, I, I think that this was. Uh, I mean, obviously things went wrong for both teams, but it's not like the polls were <laughs> improvised. Like these the, these were mm -hmm. clever polls that had a lot of good intention behind them. You have to be a little. You have to be at least a little bit prepared for every dungeon. I mean, unless yeah. you are planning to ban it, right? If, if, if that, you know yeah, you're always true. banning yeah. it, then that's fine. But if you're not banning Quarter Stars, you have to at least know there's a possibility it's going to get played. And so you have to have something there. And also, if yeah. you're a team like Baldi, you has a pretty good Quarter Stars, like a good route to go. Like, catch teams, like, make other teams ban it, right? right. Like, you don't want to true, you true. don't want to use your ban on something you're actually pretty decent at. Like, you could tell, uh, we'll take a look at it because we have it in the replay. But, like, their route when they go down to the docks, uh, that was, like, an area where... I, like, uh, what is it, the second spawn point uh, where you yeah. kind of go backwards? I, I didn't even know you could go to that part of the uh, of the map <laughs> here. Uh, but I think this is uh, what we're looking at first is the first death here uh, from Bazook. And it looks like, uh, at least from my point of view, there's like mana worms on the backside of that boss. Like, uh, and it looks like they kind of pull in and maybe he got like healer aggro or something really fast and he gets taken out. But as soon as he drops, it is just everybody going down for Evolved. Uh man, yeah, that's nasty. Yeah. You're not gonna live through that. Yeah, and that's that's when things kind of fell apart. Um, you did have a lot of deaths on the Baldi side of things too, but it's it seemed a bit more calculated, <laughs> you know. Maybe <laughs> like that one there, totally calculated. This yeah, Inquisitor, <laughs> yeah, this Inquisitor uh -huh. is the death of Legion Time Walking <laughs> Court of Stars <laughs> runs. Uh, the, the amount of times I have just been here where people are just throwing their body in front of uh, the Inquisitor and, you know, trying to make it a healer mechanic, uh, I can tell you that there is no healer that can, <laughs> that can make that mechanic go away. You need to line of sight that. Uh, so if you want a hot tip, you have to make sure that you're like CCing the eye storm every single time you see it. Just you also kick just all the glares, right? That, that, I think <laughs> that's actually what led to the death there. I don't, I don't think that was eye oh. storm ticks going off. Yeah. So, was so the first wipe too. was to the searing glare cast. The second <laughs> yeah. wipe was to yeah, the yeah, eye storm yeah. ticks. I see. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> and look at I mean look at the sanguine management as well here. That great mass grip coming out. They are going to have the last couple mobs in this pool getting a little bit of sanguine healing, but again. Really good management of avoiding a disaster there. Really clever uh, shining force as well out of those out of that last puddle. It's a lot of area down here by the docks, and I was surprised about how much count you can get actually get down here. Uh, yeah. you know, they they went upstairs and they they had more than a hundred to go, and then uh, as you guys were talking about, this boss just melted. Uh, <laughs> I mean, with every offensive CD, with the infernal buff, like it it was it did not last long at all. So the question then is, uh, how big of a threat is Baldi going to be for Echo? Like, uh, it looks like we might be in for a pretty pretty good match tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, so I would say yesterday, whenever we were watching Baldi play, they were they were a little bit worse than what I expected. Um, but but watching them today, it really, I feel like they've kind of turned things around and they're that team that we really expected them to be. And I think that they can give Echo a run for their money. All right, so our live data for quarter stars. Now, this is we only had the one week of Legion time walking, and uh, you know, not a lot of not a lot of people were like high pushing Legion time walking <laughs> keys during that week. I think maybe the next time it comes around, they might. But so we uh, only have the five completed runs on live at this key level. But still, I mean, so fast out of uh, out of Baldi uh, and also evolved as well, who were again just one boss behind. I would love to see the average deaths if you took, like, not just the 21, but, like, 15 and above to, like, 21. Yeah. The average <laughs> deaths, I imagine, would skyrocket uh, for the amount of uh, deaths that end up happening. You know, really, I mean, there's a lot of dangerous stuff, right? In the first part, uh, with the first boss, right? You know, with uh, you know, all the pillars and kind of the patrols. And then uh, in the courtyard with the Inquisitor, especially, probably a lot more deaths on some of the slower keys. Yeah. Well... That's uh, a dungeon that we may not see for the rest of the weekend. We'll 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 see. It's it's in like a lot of our matches, but again, we kind of expected it to be banned out quite a bit. It was banned in the first one, not banned in the second one though. So I don't know. I think it but... will probably be banned against Baldi by a lot of teams after seeing what I that would one agree. looks like. Yeah, I would agree. I, th do you think that Baldi's like? <laughs> uh, does Baldi really want to play that dungeon again? <laughs> I mean, it, I, I, I worked out. Really it worked good. out. Like they yeah. they were they lost like eleven deaths to one kick. 
effectively that that's where things started falling apart there if they, it, it, they they've got that dungeon like really really fast as far as i can see yeah because i think some of their deaths also came like they died to the inquisitor but not everybody and then they respawned right. and kind of threw more bodies <laughs> at it again yeah uh, so like, they just needed to keep it going yeah that's the legion way that the legion way <laughs> is to, to to throw bodies at it back mm -hmm. well yeah. with the bodies at the floor but you know what it was a popular song for a short time in the early 2000s, and it's a popular strategy. That was before all of our that times, Dilla. Uh, That's uh, no, it wasn't. You'll need to you sing were, it to us. You were alive then. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really sing it though. It's kind of more like spoken in a very gruff fashion and then yelled. I can't do that. My I'm my throat's still recovering from things. We're moving on what? to. Uh, it's going to be the lower bracket, the elimination bracket, coming up soon. Uh, I believe we got Apes Together Strong versus Dwarf. This starting out. Uh, next and yes. somebody's going home yeah that's our next four matches are these four elimination yeah. bracket matches yeah so we've still got eight teams in the tournament right now but in a couple hours we are going to have only four going into sunday it's really really crucial for these teams to keep it together and these are some really important matches as well because a lot of these teams knew going into this weekend that their first matchup was like if you're you know the 18th seed and you're playing against the seventh seed right it's like okay right this is going to be tough but then I'm getting sent to the lower bracket and, you know, maybe I'm facing a team that's only a couple seeds away from me. Like, that is going to be the crucial match where, you know, I have the most chance of being able to change the outcome of it by practicing and by playing well. And so I think we're going to see some of the best prepared maps from all of the teams in the in the bracket in these couple of series we're about to watch. I, I'm Dude, Dwarf this. Yeah. This next series with Dwarf this and Apes, uh, Apes Together Strong... Uh, the first two, right? Like, you know, the Halls of Atonement, obviously, you can't get rid of, but the 24 mm -hmm. Halls of Atonement with Fort Sanguine and Grievous is a, <laughs> is a nasty combo. And then uh, you can see where I'm going here. It's like they ended up uh, losing to Yeppers on Theater of Paint. So if they, like, wanted to get that out of the pool and then Apes Together Strong maybe thought they were going to get rid of Court of Stars, you could have the series kick off with the 24 Halls of Atonement with the Fort Sanguine Grievous into the 21 Fort Sanguine Quaking Court of Stars, <laughs> which is like just a bloodbath of the first two maps. It sounds like a great way to start the lower bracket to me. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm down for it. But that don't go. That is a nasty dungeon combo. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Somebody's got to ban the Court of Stars. Maybe. Maybe. Well, but nobody has to say that. Yeah. We required. did just see it, but maybe. Depends on how old the team is, right? Well, we are going to take a quick break. Uh, you know, I need a nap and all that. Uh, we're, when we come back, though, the <laughs> lower bracket begins here on the Mythic Dungeon International. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in uh, just a few.
We are back here at the Mythic Dungeon International. Dratnos Nagura, Mas Matt, Mr. X Morello here with us getting ready for Apes Together Strong. I, you know, I've, I've worked with him for years, but I still can't yeah, pronounce I was, your idea. You're about to give me a new name. I must... <laughs> 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 Who am I? <laughs> well, I'm the host. You're whoever I want you to be. Anyway, against Dwarf This is how I was going to end that sentence. We were reminiscing about the good old days during the break, but it's time to snap back to reality. Back to the current and uh, see... Who will survive? Apes Together Strong, Dwarf This, one of these teams going home. Any any spicy predictions? Nagura, do you have any thoughts going into this one? Um, I don't really know either of these teams very well, because this is, of course, the first time that they are competing. But uh, going off of the time trial rank and of their performance yesterday, I do think that Dwarf This has a little bit of an edge, because they did actually win a game yesterday against the Eppers. Um, True. And Apes Together Strong being the last seeded team of the time trials. But you never know, especially with the dungeon pool that we have. Yeah, Dwarf This, the uh, one of the teams to play in our only actual three dungeon series yesterday. Everything else was a 2-0. And taking a map off of Yeppers is uh, is no mean feat. That's uh, it's it gives them a little bit of an edge. Yeah, and they that... were... they also ran the resto shaman yesterday, like yeah, the entire right. time, yeah. which we didn't see. I think from like any other group, it's really just been like holy priest the entire time. Uh... So I'm interested to see if they bring the rest of Shaman back again today, uh, or if they maybe uh, kind of adopted the Holy Priest meta. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, they had, with it. they had some good utilization, though, didn't they, Dratnos? I mean, yeah, some good yeah. Spirit League totems to take on some larger-than-average pulls. They, they played pretty well, but okay. So Dwarf this bans Court of Stars, Apes to get the Strong bans the Sanguine Depths, and so it's going to be Halls, Spires, and Theater of Pain for our series going into this one. I'm a little sad wow, I... you didn't get Hall. Halls of Atonement into Court of Stars. <laughs> yeah, but uh, seeing Halls is actually, it's double sanguine, right? Uh, unfortunately, not triple sanguine that we see. But um, Dwarf this banning sanguine makes a lot of sense, right? Because yesterday, um, Apes Together Strong banning it makes sense because Dwarf this had won that exact dungeon against the Emperors mm -hmm. yesterday, right? So they, they did their research and figured, you know what? They seem pretty strong in sanguine depths. Let's just ban that dungeon. Yeah, exactly. This, uh, this, I'm curious to see what's going to happen on the Spires. That one's been giving teams uh, a lot of trouble. So, uh, you know, might be our last dungeon of the series. But it might be one where there's an equalizing moment, too. I mean, that's one where even a good team can get tripped up. Yeah, uh, also what? Apes Together Strong, they went against Echo yesterday. So you don't really have a yeah. great idea. And they also ran four Druids on their uh, the other side. So you don't have a great idea of what they're capable of. So maybe maybe they're uh, maybe they're going to come out and surprise us here early on. Could be. Here's our live stats for 24 Fortified Halls of Atonement. 10.1 uh, average deaths more than uh, more than before. Oh, I wonder bad. how many people are getting stomped by the uh, the second boss. I feel like that's what I see. Uh well, I so fortified here. There's a lot of like frontals in some of these packs where you pull like a lot of uh, you know mobs together, and it's like difficult to see. And they just kind of have a mind of their own. Uh, you know, those like bears are pretty difficult, right? With the bleed. Yeah. Uh, those two. And you were talking yeah. tyrannical, right? Like echelon, the second boss is just a nightmare. But on fortified, there's some pretty nasty trash, like really in that first part of the dungeon up until echelon. Yeah, I don't. Ten point one deaths to me. That's like, you know, those uh, those shard pulls at the start of the dungeon. You ever have one of those oh, like sure. rolling wipe catastrophes? For me, those go up to like twenty deaths sometimes, where it's just like <laughs> you're running back, oh, yeah. you're dying as you're running back in. You keep releasing. You're you're too stubborn to just wipe it. You eventually Pretty get much. it down, but like that gets all your all of your deaths for the dungeon taken care of in one. Speaking of shard pulls, yeah, uh, connected yeah. to the bear pull times, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> this is a dungeon where we have seen Bear in the past, although I don't think we will this season, but maybe. Uh, we'll see what the teams decide to go up with, but Triple oh, Shard being a, a subset of those pulls. Uh, the majority of the trash count in Halls of Atonement, instead of instead of not pulling it all separately, instead of pulling it all separately, they just pull it all together and mm. uh, get all three of those shards at the same time, which can be done. I wonder <laughs> if it can be done on 24 fortified sanguine. Yeah, uh, yeah that's what I'm kind of curious about. Maybe we, uh, I don't maybe we back so. off a little bit you, on that. You, th <laughs> you throw the, uh, the Atoma sanguine. into the mix, too. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. The sanguine, I think, is going to make a big difference, too. Because you also have Grievous here, too. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah. maybe not. Uh, I, I, I would, I'm, I'm really interested, though, because it seems like apes together strong. They're about just going for it. You know, uh, they lost that map one, but then 
decided to put together the Druid Cup. It seems like they got nothing to really lose here. Uh, they're just kind of going for it. So maybe they kind of go for some crazy big pull at the beginning. Uh, bring back the bear for the big bear pull. Yeah, you know, the downside, though, like Drano said, is uh, you, you start the dungeon off with, like, 10-plus deaths, like, right away. I mean, you get, like, mm -hmm. probably, like, 70% of, like, all of your percentage there, but still, it's not the ideal way to start. Yeah, and it's it's also interesting because uh, the usual comp that we see, not from these teams, but uh, this typical, you know, Blood Decay, Holy Priest, Hunter, uh, Warlock comp, they don't have a Cursed Spell, right? And this dungeon specifically has a lot of Cursed Spells that you have to do on the trash with that um, AoE around you, and then also in the second boss for the stun removal. So the Resto Shaman actually being really nice for yeah. that, and maybe even yeah, a Druid, true. like a Guardian Druid, that could help out. Yeah, or I mean, even the... a... Yeah. That would Go be ahead. interesting. No, I think the I mean the resto shaman is interesting for the decurse and the extra damage and link. Uh Guardian Druid, I would love to see just like a Venthyr Guardian Druid come in and just, you know, get like 80k DPS off the start, just going crazy, but <laughs> Well, and then of course you've got the Chamberlain waiting at the end. At least it's not tyrannical, so probably not gonna see a whole lot of people get one shot by statues like we did in Great Push, but oh. the map is underway, oh. so let's see what happens. There we go, double Resto Druid, even from both teams. I mean, not surprised uh, by Dwarf this running the Resto Shaman, right? But Apes together strong also running the Resto Shaman, presumably because of a Curse to spell. Uh, not sure if they decided to bring the Shaman because of that reason. Also very good uh, for AoE damage as well. We saw yesterday um, Dwarf this having so much damage with that Shaman and the Vesper Totem on some of these bulls. Yeah, it's it's probably mostly for the D curse, right? Because uh, yeah. what else would you kind of like get in here? I guess like you could play maybe like a like mage, right, or something along those lines. I think we saw somebody play a mage the other day uh, on this, but you know, the resto shaman it, it does really good damage. It's not like the high throughput of the holy priest, which is definitely you see like on the Ace together strong side, like players going a little bit weaker than what we usually see because the holy priest just on top of pumping out the damage with boon also just pump out a ton of healing. And look how low everyone's dropping on Dwarf this side. They did both commit the Bloodlust for that first uh, big shard pull that they were doing. But the teams choose to go different sides. Apes together strong going left first, uh, while Dwarf just decided to go right first. So we'll see um, whatever is going to be uh, faster in the end or more efficient. And of course they also have a Venthyr player. It's uh, the Destro Warlock for Apes together strong. And I would assume it's the Destro as well for Dwarf this. Uh, just so they can mind control these stoneborns. Yeah, and uh, you, you get the magic buff from the demon hunter as the tank, right? Instead of having to use one of the DPS slots, you have the rogue there. You need the shroud uh, for a lot of the pulls here, whether it's like at the beginning, I believe. Uh, they use the shroud uh, on the side of Apes Together Strong, and then obviously to skip to the second boss. But uh, a big shard pull here for Apes Together Strong down on this you know, left hand side of the dungeon. I wonder if they grab these relics after this uh, and kind of walk up into that middle of the courtyard by that first boss. Yeah, that definitely could be an option. We do see Luca going down, unfortunately, for Apes Together Strong, uh, immediately releasing, not actually waiting for uh, Belarus to come out here. Um, but they've been managing the Sanguine fairly well. It is really hard to manage Sanguine with the shard pulls, because there's uh, so many small HP mobs on top of that huge shard. And also, additionally, the shark cannot be moved properly when yeah. it's thrashing and casting. So it's really hard to get him out of Sanguine. Oh, and it's, yeah, and you're also with the Grievous as well. And, you know, the, the bear's coming along the way. Like, it is so difficult uh, for the tanks. And even, you know, DPS kind of gets aggro for a little bit where you don't have that, like, you know, with uh, a Holy Priest, right? You know, Flash Concentration and just those big single target heals. Like, it's a little bit harder for the rest of Shaman in that case. But, uh, no. Apes Together Strong look like they've recovered here. They do end up, uh, you know, grabbing that pack with the relics, like I was talking about. It looks like trying to walk that back towards the center, and uh, maybe trying to get her here for a little bit, you know, more health. And then also, it looks like, uh, you know, Resto Shaman, the mana is a bit of an issue. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, killing her here would make a lot of sense <laughs> to get some mana back, because, yeah, they're struggling to keep everyone alive. Oh, Berg dropping really to on Dwarf this because of that magic debuff. That's another issue, right? If you only have one, um, Curse Dispeller and it's your healer, then uh, that's not too good because you also need to dispel that magic effect as well. That does a ton of damage if you don't dispel it. So sometimes you might just have to immune the, the curse uh, when it goes off because there's just not going to be enough dispels. 
But it looks like Aves Together Strong did get that Ur buff now, so there's going to be some mana regen coming in for that shaman. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you notice as soon as the Ur came up, he just dumped all of his mana. He was like, I'm going to be good <laughs> shortly. Just keep everybody alive uh, to make sure the Ur goes down. But uh, Dwarf this dealing with the other shard up top, like we talked about, they went right side first and then coming back all along on this left side as they're going to make their way down the stairs. Is uh, Both of these teams fairly even at this point. Yeah, if you look at the trash percentage, definitely uh, pretty even. I did see that the Warlock for Dwarf Test is actually playing Night Phase. So there's a small difference. Uh, Venthyr better at uh, like bigger AoE pools, while Night Phase is a bit more versatile for um, both single target and AoE. So interesting difference there in Covenant choices. Of course, both the rogues are playing Venthyr, so they still have uh, a Stoneborn control. But Dwarf Test oh. having more issues as their Warlock um, going down there, also talking the pot too. Yeah, and went down really early, like before even they were able to kind of group the mobs uh, together. I wonder, you know, this is one of those packs that has like those nasty frontals that we were talking about. Uh, and I wonder what exactly ended up getting the Warlock there. But you see they, uh, they CC the Huntsman there, uh, the Hound Master, so he can, you know, buff up a lot of those bears, but this is still a nasty pull. Yeah, the Warlock is not managing to get back to the group. I <laughs> assume they skipped some trash on the way, and he did just not getting back there as he died again. Now he's here, did manage to, to get back to the group, but they had to commit uh, the Soul Stone. So he did Soul Stone himself, uh, walked through, died to whatever he had pulled, and then just uh, took the Soul Stone on the other side. So clever use of uh, Soul Stone mechanics, I guess, but still two deaths on the board, unfortunately. Yeah, and then as uh, soon as the Bears go down, uh, they actually get the Huntsman. Unfortunately, he jumps right into a Sanguine Pool and stands there for a little bit. Uh, but man, I mean, the Dwarf Fist, they, they look like they're actually going to be able to recover a little bit here. It's, it did get a bit scary. Uh, not having the Warlock damage, especially you know, with the, all of the damage we're seeing Warlocks do uh, so far this weekend. Not having him for this type of a pull where, you know, Soul Rot would be really good with this amount of enemies. Uh, definitely hurt at the beginning. Probably lose a little bit of time there. Yeah, definitely not ideal for them, but Apes Together Strong also having some issues as uh, Rapsor just went down. They're up to four deaths at this point on their side, so still a 10 seconds advantage for Dwarf Dis when it comes to death uh, di differential. And um, Dwarf Dis also catching up on trash percentage. Even though once Apes Together Strong finishes off this pool, they're gonna get a lot of percentage because these shards are worth quite a lot. It, it, and this is going to be the hardest part of the dungeon, probably, for both of these groups, right? Like, getting all the shards down on Fortified, you know, Sanguine and Grievous, getting, you know, all of the count, really, here at the beginning. Uh, because you're going to skip, like, a lot of the parts going up to the second boss, right? You're going to, you know, kill the first boss, most likely Shroud all the way past, you know, go to the second boss, and then you just have a few more mobs left. Uh, I'm curious, before uh, our final boss of the dungeon, you have that mini boss with the Sanguine in that room. Uh, that could get... Uh, quite nasty, but this is really going to probably be the toughest part of the dungeon you imagine for both these teams. Yeah, I think so as well. And uh, so far, we definitely have seen some Sanguine heal. You can see it on uh, the healing meter on Apes Together Strong side. They didn't heal the shard, uh, at least not a lot, but they healed the Obliterator a lot and also the Handsma Master, which is really hard to control sometimes because the Handsmaster Master just like, does this like disengage and just jumps to a spot. And if he jumps into a Sanguine Pool, then uh, it's really hard to get him out of there. Yeah, it's just a bit unlucky. Uh, nothing you can do at <laughs> yeah. that moment in time. Is uh, it, It's always a bit of a, a feels bad with how hard some of these pulls are that you look at the healing meters and, you know, Sanguine Icker up at the top just to, to <laughs> dominate and uh, just keeping all the enemies live a little bit longer. But that's going to be the final shard for Dwarf This. So they're actually going to be able to kind of go towards this boss. Uh, see if they're going to get uh, another Gargoyle from up top, possibly. Uh, you can grab two Gargoyles at once with the Venthyr. You can maybe even pull that one on the side uh, if you want one for after. Uh, I know both of the ones get away, but you see the one coming down the stairs. So they're going to grab that one. Most likely grab the one directly behind them and have two for the boss, but they're going to lose Sven here. Yeah, Sven has to come back. Of course, having stealth is going to make it a bit easier uh, to get back to the group, but they're going to have to wait a little bit before he they pull the boss. Because, of course, Halkias has that um, um, area of denial, so you can only be close to the boss, otherwise you get feared. So they have to wait for him to get back. There we go. Sven is back, and now they can try to finish off this trash. I think they just want to finish off everything before they pull the boss, so they don't have the Sanguine pulls to deal with. Because um, that could be very bad if Halkias heals up. 
Yeah, and I, they may actually have to pull this a little bit earlier than intended because the, the, the they had both of the gargoyles, the stoneborns, in there, and that gets kind of dangerous, especially on fortified. And they had to grab them a little bit early with like three or four mobs still up. So maybe going in a little bit earlier uh, than they imagined. Is it looks like they still even have one more target here in the middle as they're trying to get the boss away from it. And they somehow have to get that guardian away as it dies. <laughs> they try to use stun and everything. Um, kept to totem. The of the yeah, circle. they're just trying to get it away <laughs> so it doesn't die underneath the boss. Especially because Alka is going to start casting that beam soon. And uh, then he's not going to move for like 30 seconds or something like that. And then the boss will be healed to full for sure. He's standing one of those pools. But AFC got their strong now also on the boss. And it looks like they're going to be pulling quite a lot of trash on top. As there are 68% trash now, and they need uh, a lot more percent before they can move on. So that makes me believe they're planning on pulling a lot of trash onto the boss, which, again, can be really scary, but if handled properly, then it's incredibly efficient to do so. Yeah, they just have to be so careful where they kill some of these mobs. You can see they get quite low, and it looks like the tank's just trying to kite them out a little bit, probably in the opposite direction of where they're going to take Halkius after he's done with this cast, but it can get super dangerous like you mentioned because even some of those pools that the halkis just drops like they're red as well the sanguine's coming down like it all kind of blends together so it looks like they're going to get him in a position where they're not going to have to deal with any sanguine on top of the boss which is great news yeah and now uh dwarf this pulling that the last uh, stoneborn in and mind controlling that as the other two are already gone so they still get the damage reduction and the extra damage from the stoneborn onto the boss and they also pulled those um keep the ground keepers as well um, that they can just sneak down while also finishing off the boss. If you get their strong though, they are a similar percentage. They still are pulling this last trash back in there as well. I think it's two mobs only, Dark Plate and, and Obliterator. So they should be fine with Sanguine when it's only two mobs, but still have to be good. Yeah, and they can keep them alive a little bit longer, right? Like kind of just leave off of the boss, you know, take those mobs out. But uh, Dwarf this is going to finish that for now. Uh, they're going to start to move their way up. This is probably where you'll most likely see them shroud. Go to that next boss echelon, and uh, he's one of the toughest ones, probably the toughest one in the dungeon. Yeah, definitely. There's so many bad overlaps uh, that can happen, and sometimes you even want to um, just not kill the smaller ads so you can get some funnel damage in. We've seen that happen in the MDI, where you intentionally don't finish them off with um, the circle with the leap. So they respawn, and then you actually get extra funnel damage. But not sure if they want to risk that uh, this time around, uh, as they also decided to finish off Ur to get the cooldown reduction, and the mana regen and the HP regen as well. Yeah, and I was wondering which relic they were going to go for, but they go for Ur, so they'll get some you know, healing, the CDR back. Uh, and then you saw it was a nice you know, sigil of silence there from the tank right out of the way to you know, stop those mobs from getting the cast off because that is uh, really nasty, especially on this type of level of keystone. But uh, on the AMC on the strong side, it looks like they are actually, you know, they pulled another relic and they're going to get a woe here to probably try and get, uh, you know, obviously the speed, the stealth, and then get right up to the boss and maybe keep some of that damage reduction going into the beginning. Yeah, that uh, might actually work out for them here, as they just have to finish off those two mobs and then they can move up. They do have enough percentage after this. Both are on 79% uh, slash 80, so they're totally fine. I think I like killing the woe there, yeah. but because you have, a, you have a rogue and the shroud, you don't necessarily need it. But at the same time, you get the extra movement speed and, as you said, the damage reduction, which is really nice for, nice for Echelon. And it looks like they're putting down a feast. I wonder how much use of this... Uh you know, woe buff they're going to actually get from the boss is on the dwarf this side. I uh, know they're making quick work of Echelon, you know, 35%. Uh, it looked like as well, I have to see, yeah, it looks like, uh, you know, they were able to pull one of the bats from down below, uh, Apes Together Strong, up top with the boss. And that's not something we saw from dwarf this. Uh, I believe that was a warlock pull from a distance, uh, trying to bring that one, if you kind of look down the stairs, the one to the left, all the way up. And yeah, that's really nice, because then you have that extra Stoneborn um, it is possible to get it, but sometimes you have really weird timings with the patrols and you have weird timings with whoever um, of the bats is active at the downside of the stairs. Yeah. But they actually managed to get it, which is uh, just incredibly nice. You have the damage reduction plus the damage from uh, the Stoneborn itself, so really helping them out there. Um, and the Dwarf this, they are getting closer and closer uh, to finishing off Echelon. And I quickly wanted to mention that Cone Age, we have the player cam right now enabled. 
uh, from the hunter of Dwarf This is actually Roger Brown's uh, brother. Roger oh. Brown from, from Echo. Well, that's uh, interesting as well, competing in Alien BI. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome to see. As uh, you know, playing the survival hunter, you're the spear. Uh, as, yeah. you know, as, uh, as uh, hunters kind of forced to move off of marksmanship into survival uh, as the expansion has moved on. But it uh, looks like a, 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 for a second there, I thought they were going to try and pull some of the next room in, but uh, baiting that ur to the side so they can keep some of the melee right really tight to the, close to that door. Uh, even trying to get some of those casts on the outside of the door, but the rapid fire going off here is Dwarf this doing a nice job handling of this first pack inside. Yeah, so they are um, doing a really good job. Also dealing with Sanguine here, which can also be dangerous just because this corridor is pretty tiny, especially in between where they're taking the muffs right yeah. now. So they want to make sure that they're spacing it out a little bit. And then I wonder if they try to pull the next trash pack into the boss, possibly? Um, it is definitely doable, but yeah, again, Sanguine uh, can make it dangerous. That platform is so small with the Sanguine, right? Yeah. I mean, you can get both of the Stoneborns from the side, uh, and possibly go, uh, and you're gonna have another set of relics up top, and it looks like they're gonna pull it all into the boss, so I wanna see how they do this and avoid the Sanguine, as they have to use the Spirit Link right away as everybody was low going up the stairs. They're also committing the Bloodlust for this pull. It makes a lot of sense, right? They're trying to get this done as fast as possible. They did uh, finish off two Urs, so if they space them out a little bit, because they don't stack. But if you space them out a little bit, you do get the double um, cooldown reduction. But it's really hard to control your damage if you have a, a Warlock plus a Hunter just using AoE spells and everything. So I don't think it worked out, but they still got one of the effects anyway. Look, it's, it's and now they're just hiding. It's tough for yeah. a warlock in this stage to tell them to, you know, slow damage a little bit. Uh, yeah. When, when, when you, you already have like ten numbers, rain of fires on the floor. Like... Yeah, uh, you know, when you have your infernals rolling and the rain of fires just coming down, uh, and you're up above 60k, uh, I think it'd be very difficult to tell somebody to slow down, but. Uh, they actually get pretty fortunate, like, uh, no no Sanguine Pools here, they're doing a really nice job, the Bloodlust helps, the double Ur, as this is a really nice pull, as they're getting rid of uh, you know, this boss rather quickly. Yeah, they're actually pretty clean in this dungeon, of course they do have the a few spot deaths earlier and some Sanguine Heal earlier as well, but as long as the bosses aren't healing, I think you're fine, <laughs> that is the, the, the last thing you want. So once they finish off this boss, they have to do this uh, mini boss room as we talked about earlier, which can also be um, causing some issues for them. But if the Warlock has Infernal, which he's holding on to right now, you can see Heated has his Infernal actually ready, but he's actually saving it for the next boss room because Warlocks are known to be really good to AoE down that room. Next to Moonkins, of course, they're still looking. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> I mean, you know, you get, a, you get a nice starfall in there. It's not, it's nothing like Rain of Fire, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is I like the only it, but... room that Moonkins still have, you know, this yeah. next boss room. This is the Moonkin room, okay? Right. We, we might not stop the damage in any other dungeon or area, but this room is the Moonkin room. Out of the 10 dungeons, this is our moment <laughs> <Yes>. to shine. <laughs> this room. Uh, Still, still doesn't get brought though, but it's okay. Eventually, maybe <laughs> <laughs> we got a better chance than no getting only his hope. enhancement shaman. Yeah, it's ten point uh, Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, looks like yeah, you, like you mentioned, the infernal gets popped straight away coming into the room, and you are going to see with the combination of both the, the infernals, right, the infernal, the blasphemy, and soul rot, just the damage is going to uh, spike as soon as they're probably going to try and you know, group some of these uh, up onto the mini boss. Make it a little bit easier even for the warlock to knock down. This is actually such a funny strategy to look at because usually the way you deal with this room is you have the ranged DPS um, kill neutrals that are away from the boss so the melee can cleave the boss and also cleave the neutrals around it. But Dwarf just did it the other way around. They had the rogue and the hunter kill the neutrals away from the boss, so the warlock can be the one that is cleaving off the boss, because <laughs> that search is so good uh, with all of that damage. So that was really interesting to see, to see the survival hunter and the rogue just all by themselves, just hitting the neutrals. <laughs> and, and this is actually a really good spot for Vesper Totem as well. When you get a lot of these mobs like right on top of each other, uh, and you're able to you know, pop a Vesper Totem with the lock bursts and the chain lightnings, uh, this is probably where you get some of the biggest value uh, out of that. So. Uh, looks like they actually got Woe out of this as well, uh, maybe for 
you know, a damage reduction here. Maybe just because it didn't really matter which one they were going to get. You have the Infernal Pack uh, going into the boss room. As he knew this pack was going to last a while, especially on Fortified with this mini boss. I do think that might have just been an accident because yeah. of their strategy with the Warlock being the only one that was actually hitting the relics, right? <laughs> and we all know that the Warlock, when there's so many targets, it's not going to yeah. be casting it's Chaos RNG or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> complete RNG. Whatever happens, happens. <laughs> but they get another set of relics on the last boss as they're now engaging that. They don't have last available for the last boss. Um, but should be no problem, um, as of course it is not tyrannical. But still, on a 24, I would say that the bosses still have a lot of HP and do a lot of damage with Grievous as well. So they do want to watch out um, for those like intermission phases whenever the beams come out to the statues. Yeah, and any extra damage, right, just puts even more pressure on the rest of the Shaman, which they have Ascendance up right now, and they have Link, but no healing time, as I believe they used that in the previous room, probably to just get through some of that. Uh, you know, nasty trash, but Ur is going to come down. They're going to get the cooldown reduction on a few of those. As it looks like apes together strong, they're working their way uh, towards that final boss, you know, getting the mini boss down. A little bit of a different strategy there, but Dwarf this just seemed to pull uh, pull ahead right after that first boss in a big way. Yeah, it really looked like they were just um, doing everything a little bit uh, faster. I don't think there was like one huge difference in strategy, um, but. Everything was just a little bit more efficient by Dwarf this. Maybe they dealt with Sanguine a bit better, and also that big boss pool on the second and the third boss um, that really helped them out there as well. So really cool to see Dwarf this executing this dungeon so well. And uh, this last boss looking good so far. We do see some of the statues being thrown around if you have so many melee players as well. Sometimes hard to see where those statues are going. It's a um, healer mechanic. Yeah, <laughs> as long as it doesn't one shot you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and even then, healer mechanic. Right? Yeah. if it one shot you, you just uh, have to ask the healer, wasn't there like, like aren't you like a Disc Priest? Just give me an Absorb Shield, or, right. or a Battle Rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, use something, uh, please. <laughs> but uh, you also had the difference of the routes both of these teams took, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where you know, they both started at different shards and kind of you know, used different relics to kind of uh, get around the dungeon, where uh, it looked like Dwarf's this original strategy definitely paid off as a uh, shot. <laughs> Ghost Wolf, get out of the way. Don't want to. The rest of the Shaman can't get hit. Everybody else can get hit, not the rest of the Shaman, though. Uh, as it, Apes Together Strong, now they've made their way to that uh, Lord Chamberlain, but it's been a really close dungeon between these two. Oh, yeah, definitely. I do think this can be uh, a really good series. It's very possible that Apes Together Strong might be taking a next one, because uh, even in this dungeon, they're really close. Dwarf this, of course, um, is about to finish off this boss, and the Death Differential is still in favor of Dwarf this, so that means that they are winning this first dungeon here in Halls of Atonement. Yeah, really nice from Dwarf this. They have a little bit of experience running the Resto Shaman, right? Uh, after yeah. they run it all day the other day. Uh, and then their route here definitely paid off, gives them the win on Halls of Atonement. I was really impressed by Dwarf this. I mean, uh, that was a that was a very very clean run from them, and it, it wasn't it wasn't terrible from Apes Together Strong either. There was just like a couple of deaths here and there. Like they were slow at times, or Dwarf this wasn't. But Dwarf this looking like a real threat in the lower bracket. Our LFG gang, right? This is the yeah. game yeah. that made it through yeah. LFG. Yeah, exactly. uh, again, yesterday taking a game off of Yeppers, I, I saw a lot of strength in this team on mm. their play yesterday and they are carrying it forward here but also apes together strong you know on this on the last boss at the same time as them right like this was a really close yeah. game between the two uh for a 20 a 24th seed uh to to be putting together a run like that is also very impressive so i think we are in for a, a good lower bracket this in this group i think this is going to be a, a full of some some nice close <laughs> matches which sometimes you get these lower brackets where that's a little bit less true but this one i think is it's, it's going to be all bangers you it should be a good. great showing yesterday from well you, you didn't get to see what apes together strong was even capable of because echo is just blowing through the dungeon so fast right uh, mm -hmm. that yeah uh, i know now you get to see apes together strong for a whole dungeon and what it's like two deaths in a routing kind of difference yeah. between the two teams which is essentially mm -hmm. uh, i know the difference in time is the you know, dwarf this finishes with 21 49 like apes together strong was not going to be that far behind there no, I mean, uh, there was a point at the beginning where I think Apes of the Strong was like maybe 30% behind uh, on Halkius, and that was it. It was very close for like a lot of the dungeon. 
Yeah, and I mean, th this is a strong team. Look at the way that they're able to keep this pull together for so long. This is Apes Together Strong yeah. uh, that we're looking at here, and everybody's got these Grievous stacks. That now, this grievous. does end up going a little bit wrong right towards the very end, but, like, there, there's some brilliance here, and there's the ability to keep this sort of unbelievably challenging MDI-style pull alive for as long as they did. And then, I mean, they end up having, like, two deaths on this, but they, they do manage to get it all defeated eventually. So, yeah, I, I would say that this is a team that... Uh, is able to put together the the plan and execute strategies and and yeah I think the their their comp looks good their players are playing uh, they're playing their specs well there's not that much more that you can ask of, of a team in MDI as so you can see that Ur, <laughs> yeah. Ur well, sure. it's switch. crazy Oof. it's crazy how they were able to live that long with this entire replay. Yeah, the FTM has had no mana the entire replay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's just yeah. been jumping around trying to keep anybody alive. Yeah, and then uh, this pull here from uh, from Dwarf This, this is a really nicely executed pull. I mean, this is the kind of pull that we see almost always teams that are winning in Halls of Atonement are able to make this pull work out. And Dwarf This, able, able to get this done on the Sanguine Affix as well. All these mobs onto the boss and then kited around beautifully to avoid any Sanguine healing onto the boss. Um, this is the sort of thing that you do need to be able to do, again, to be able to be competitive in the MDI. And so a uh, great sign for our for, for just the health of our tournament that we have 24 teams that have gotten through time trials that are all capable of this sort of thing. Yeah, you yeah, do it's... that pull right. You get two Urs, you get two Stoneborn Goliaths out yeah. of that, and the mm -hmm. extra, you know, just kind of damage with the Warlock. I mean, that is, as long as you don't just drop the Sanguine on the boss, that is a huge win of the pull. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. gotta be careful. Like, if you drop that segment behind, like, the lantern, too, then it's like, oh, maybe I can't stand behind this one. You can always shift to a different one, but Healer there's... mechanic, just stand in it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's, it's a healer problem, for sure. But it's it's intricate stuff, so it's cool to see. That was a good map. Yeah. I agree. I think uh, both um, teams are playing really well. This is... Like the Sanguine and the 24 level on this key is the reason why so many other teams have banned this key. It was even um, Echo as well that decided to just ban yeah. the dungeon. They're like, I don't want to see Hulse so with Sanguine on a 24. So it's really good to see that both of those teams managed to not heal too much for Sanguine. We saw some here and there, but it wasn't any like disasters. If this was not the first map, it could have actually just been gone in this series as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they didn't have the option to get rid of it. Uh, yeah. Where one team probably would have, yeah, I mean, you could have seen like whether the, leave the Spires of Ascension, uh, it ends up making it through. You could have seen, like, uh, maybe the Sanguine Depths, like, kind of uh, make it through if Halls of Atonement is that first uh, map, but uh, another Sanguine Dungeon coming up next. Yeah, it feels like we've got a lot of Sanguine in this uh, in this particular weekend, but, hey, you know, I mean, at least it's consistency. You don't have to quite, like, reset your brain between each dungeon for the different FXs, so I guess there's some small comfort in the consistency there? Sure. Maybe <laughs> we don't we don't enjoy Sanguine either way, but yeah. But we are going to Spires next. That's one that we've uh, talked about Sanguine a lot on. Let's uh, look at some of the live data for that. Twenty three tyrannical fastest runtime ever on the live service was thirty one minutes fifteen seconds. We've already seen some faster times than that, I believe, uh, by by quite a bit. But again, MDI like you're just gonna see that. Yeah, I mean the the way that you pull this dungeon on the live servers. Even though sometimes there have been some tyrannical weeks that are faster than the affixes we have on the MDI here, you know, you're not doing this stuff where you're like pulling this, the third boss and then getting trash onto it and that kind of stuff like that. That is yeah. something that is reserved for the tournament realm. We do not do that on the live servers. That is uh, unbelievably dangerous to do. But <laughs> these teams have practiced and executed that enough times at the exact key level with the exact comp, with the exact CC rotation planned out for everything uh, that you do start to see just even faster strategies here. So yeah, I, I expect we're going to see 10 minutes faster than the, the fastest runs we've had on the live servers, even from the, you know, quote, lower lower rated teams, right, than the than the Echoes and stuff. Uh, even from teams like HC the Strong and Dwarf This, I think we're going to see some really fast times that are going to smoke all of those live server times. Yeah, I mean, Echo had uh, 20 minutes, 38 seconds this morning uh, mm -hmm. in their time. And uh, in the series, the thing that we casted yesterday, like with uh, Incarnation and Evolved, like the times are really fast. The two differences is like, you know, you get some of those Goliaths stuck in the Sanguine on some of those big poles, like a recharge. And like that is, you know, an extra 45 seconds worth of time added. Uh, it's just about timing those outright. 
Yeah, exactly. Going back to what Dratnos was saying a little bit earlier, too, it's like, even if you're the lowest seed in this group, like, you, you don't get here by being a bad team. Like, clearly these are some of the best teams in the entire world, even if they are the lowest seed coming into this. So we're going to see some pretty good results either way, but uh, unfortunately some of them also have to play Echo, so you have, uh, you have that side of things, too. But there's always the LCQ, I suppose. Well, I think this is also big because... Uh... Doesn't Apes together strong? They have guildies on witness cuties where they, they would do. need to win yeah. this. Uh, they would need to win two in a row. It's uh, it's tough. Point. Yeah, we need Apes uh, together hard. strong and witness cuties to both win both of their matches today, mm -hmm. and then we'd get to see them play tomorrow. So it's it is a long shot, but it is it's not impossible. Shot. Especially that would be down a dark horse scenario. That would, <laughs> that would be that would That's be right. that would be the right way to describe a dark horse scenario. <laughs> that would count. Yeah. Not to, not to speak for Tettles or anything like that, but that does sound like a Dark Horse uh, scenario to me. That is that is true, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like if it, if it doesn't happen, we need to have some sort of, like, live server, server show match between the two teams. Maybe maybe the guild Ooh. can put that together, you know? The the people want to see it. They want to see the Witness Cuties, Apes Together Strong matchup. So, Witness Guild out there, you know, you, you can make this happen. I would cast it. I would cast it. Oh, there you go. The girl would cast it. It's all coming <laughs> together, see? The Doa Invitational. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, yeah. We'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, free up some time in the schedule coming up here. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> yep. Well, we're just waiting for the next map to get rolling here. It's going to be Spires of Ascension, like we talked about. Um, more, more sanguine. Uh, there yeah. You go. Let's not uh, let's not forget about storming because that's oh, the affix that, that actually yeah. killed uh, clicks earlier in Echo. Yep. Can be fatal affix. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. And also, uh, sanguine depths is ban for this set, uh, which the mm -hmm. map after this would be Theater of Pain, uh, which is the one that Dwarf this actually lost uh, to Yeppers yesterday. So True. Uh, probably don't want to go back to that one. Probably want to try and end the series here. Yeah, Theater of Pain with that uh, Fortified Bolstering Quaking um, can be very difficult. Some of that trash is going to be extremely scary with Bolstering specifically. Um, yeah. Could be worse. Could be tyrannical. I do think yeah, um, they like playing Theater of Pain, though, because I just saw their tank, um, the Dwarf Disc tank, uh, had the name Brewmaster Main in, in details. <laughs> and in Theater of Pain, they were playing uh, Brewmaster yesterday, right? Because of the Necrolord activation of the banners. So right. I do think it's like one of the tank's favorite dungeons when you can actually play your main class there. <laughs> Yeah, we've been seeing groups go to the monks for Necrolord there, whether it be Windwalker mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. Brewmaster. Uh, I believe that's the only covenant we haven't seen from Warlocks yet. Uh, we've seen like everything yeah, else out of Warlocks. One, yeah. uh, I, I don't think you'll see a Necro Warlock. That would be quite surprising at this stage. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, your able Brewmaster is still in a really good spot. Uh, you know, Keg Smash extremely strong right now with some of the, the tier set and whatnot. Yeah, and again, we kind of had like, it, we're, we were talking about this earlier, where we haven't really gotten to see Apes Together Strong really play at their most optimal to, because they played against Echo yesterday. If you're in that situation, it's the, the Echo effect, like we, we call it, where you're just kind of forced to take extra chances and try to go for things you wouldn't go for otherwise, just to try to keep up. So in a more quote-unquote straight-up match like this against Dwarf This, you know, maybe they'll have a better chance than that, uh, that Theater of Pain too, if we get there. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a I do. good. Go ahead, Dreadness. I, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm excited to see this series. I think the series probably ends here on this game, but if Apes Together Strong can put together something on on this map, I do like their uh, their potential chances in theater. But to get there, they are gonna have to win here in Spires of Ascension. So that's what we're gonna see them try right now. Oh, there's apparently a lot of Brewmaster mains yeah. in this group A, because Devsey is also in that uh, Brewmaster now. And you can still see, if you look at Dwarf Disc uh, details, you can see um, Lutty <laughs> Brewmaster main. <laughs> yeah. So lots of Brewmasters in here. Luca Ooh. going down, unfortunately, for Ace to get their strong in his first pool, which is very unfortunate because he had just used Meta and the Bloodlust and all of the cooldowns have been used. And then they go down just after that. So very unfortunate, but as long as the Warlock is alive, they should be fine. Yeah, and it's interesting they end up playing the Brewmaster here. We are talking yeah. about like Brewmaster on uh, Theater of Pain, but maybe just for a little bit more like mob control you bring a monk in uh, with like the drop. But I mean, you also have the the DH. Like it's not one where you kind of have the Holy Priest in, right? Where you can 
know, knock players out. You're you don't have a ton of that here for Apes Together Strong. That's interesting because uh, Witness Cuties, which are of course the guildmates of Apes Together Strong, they also like playing Brewmaster Monk as well on their team. So um, in some dungeons at least. So I wonder if they, you know, talk to each other and like, Brewmaster is actually really good in this dungeon, and they're just like, uh, <laughs> they're like gaslighting each other into believing that Brewmaster <laughs> is like really good here, <laughs> and so they just uh, ended up playing it. They but just we'll told see. them to play I mean, it. Maybe. They're not going to run it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but uh, for the first pull, it worked out pretty well. Not as fast as Dwarf this, though, because they are already on the next platform and doing that trash pull before the first boss. Yeah, it's, uh, you have the Survival Hunter in here for Dwarf this, which is just great in those AoE scenarios. Uh, it's kind of strong. I'm surprised. Like, uh, I think you like go for, if you're going to like include the Demon Hunter here, right? Like, I think probably making it the Vengeance. Like, you don't need the Kyrian uh, with, like... Uh, any of these because you have the resto shaman in with uh, you know the spear and the vesper totem so you probably could have had that magic buff from the demon hunter and kept the survival hunter because survival hunter has been really strong uh throughout this weekend really almost as strong like it's crazy we talk about how the damage of like warlocks and like survival's not even that far behind yeah, survival is also pretty insane when you can do those huge AoE pulls and all of your abilities are basically AoE from the survival hunter, so it's really nice. And uh, yeah, it looks like Dwarf just saved the bloodlust for this boss pool, while Apes Together Strong committed their bloodlust on that very first trash pool, and Dwarf this was still quicker uh, than Apes, even though they didn't commit their bloodlust. I guess it has something to do with their Havoc Demon Hunter going down right after using all their cooldowns unfortunately <laughs> yeah that is uh that is such a unfortunate scenario i think we've all been there uh yeah i, I was in there uh, this morning on a miss key where uh starting my ramp and then i got hit with an overgrowth and that's always fun <laughs> um but, it's but the worst feeling <laughs> it, it is terrible uh a little bit of a sanguine pool there for apes together strong uh right by the boss area it looks like it may have kind of uh gotten on the boss and uh even her a little bit so that that's quite unfortunate but yeah, on Tyrannical, uh, you're not having the lust for the boss, uh, really going to make it a little bit tougher. Yeah, I think so as well. Ooh, and Refs are unfortunately going down and they don't have a rest because they did use that battle rest earlier on the Demon Hunter. So they have to make a decision to either reset the boss here or fight the rest of the boss with one less damage dealer. It looks like they're not moving to reset or they're still talking about it. But yeah, 23 Tyrannical, that's a lot of HP they have to go through one less damage dealer and they didn't even have the loss at the beginning of it right uh so no. you didn't even get kind of like a you know a big burst phase like out of like a sub rogue like we using the loss to like being able to get the boss a little bit weak and then finish it off not even at 50 percent there's uh this is a huge opportunity for dwarf this to really pull away like if they finish this boss off clean and then get through some of this next trash clean which we've seen you know some of these range casters not uh not behave in probably the manner that some of these groups would love for them to uh if they're able to get through that pretty clean this could be a huge opportunity for them to pull away yeah i agree dwarf is playing very clean so far doing an incredible good job on that first pool that is incredibly hard to execute with the sanguine right with the goliath uh, all of the mobs having a hard time to even gather them up at the start as well. So really well done by Dwarf this to execute that perfectly. And then uh, saving the last for the boss also uh, just really worked out for them as they're now gathering up that stealth claw pool. Oh. And Lanty actually getting stunned there by the stealth claws. Uh, tried to get them out before he gets stunned, but unfortunately didn't work out. As uh, the cheat death did proc on the Vengeance Demon Hunter, but thankfully still was available. Uh, maybe they even run the the, the cheat death trinket as well. We could check it out on that inspect tool. I'm gonna do that while you uh, talk yeah, about that's, uh, strong. And that's one of the uh, that's one of the pulls that would you, you'd really like like the holy priest right to be able to use like a guardian spirit like on the way in. Like resto shaman doesn't really have anything like that. Uh, where yeah, Lindy gets so low and the apes together strong side luka drops as well so now you're down to just your warlock in terms of damage dealers trying to finish that boss off and dwarf this actually doesn't look like they pull any of the trash from the left hand side uh they just grab uh i know some of these cats in that one pack right before the angels so they're gonna probably need a little bit more percentage later in the dungeon 
Yeah, uh, I wonder if they're gonna do something similar, like with a really big pull at the very last, like the third boss room. Yeah. Uh, that looked very dangerous though when Echo did it earlier, so we're gonna see. But uh, first, they are finishing off this platform, and they're actually just pulling the last two mobs here that they still have alive into the Goliaths. So, really nice to just finish off one mob um, to make sure that that one doesn't jump around. And now they're pulling those Goliaths as well. They need to make sure they have all the interrupts on them, of course. Which is also a lot easier if you have a Resto Shaman, right? Having yeah. that uh, healer interrupt is really nice. That's why I stopped playing my Resto Shaman, because I had the interrupt. Uh, <laughs> but, but you also see the, the Warlock actually save the Infernal uh, going into this. Like, you know, once you actually started getting some of these more mobs on top of the Goliath, then they end up popping the Infernal. Uh, Lunty doing a nice job just kiting some of these mobs, uh, being able to live. And they're going to get some of these uh, you know, mobs towards the end here, some of these Ethan Drivers coming in shortly and to be able to kind of keep them alive through that you do have a healing tide you do have ascendance so you do have spirit link totem so a lot here for dwarf this if things went a little bit sideways but they've handled this part of the dungeon perfectly i also just double checked the inspecting tool and saw that lancy the tank of dwarf this is also running the cheat death trinket weave of warped fates so even though uh, they don't have the cheat death available of the vengeance demon hunter they also have that trinket as an extra safety net in case something does happen um but yeah they're looking really good as they're finishing off those uh two ether divers and that crater and now they can move on to the next platform we do see some issues there on the next pl next platform specifically because um some teams have opted to use the spear um for this big pull there and then the mobs are all stunned, and then some of them die early, and you have this sanguine spawn <laughs> everywhere. But we'll see how Dwarf this is handling it. Yeah, it's uh, another opportunity for Warlocks to hold damage, uh, just going too fast. On the uh, Apes together strong side, they actually did pull some of the casters on the left-hand side, and then grab uh, I know the cats going here on the right. So uh, they're going to get some extra percentage out of this. It'll uh, allow them to maybe try and make up some time a little bit later, uh, as they can skip some of the mobs. Uh, towards the end where dwarf this is going to have to make that up somewhere and i i agree with you i think it's probably going to be maybe not exactly that echo pole uh i believe yeah. uh we saw in the incarnation of Valve series they actually uh didn't pull the side that echo pulled but after you know some of the boss uh damage went down they actually pulled the the pack on the left hand side of the room but still gets really dangerous with the sanguine yeah and now dwarf this is waiting for the patrols to line up a little bit better before they're going to go into that bigger pool the Aether Divers, they um, have a lot less health, though, than most other mobs in that pool. So it looks like they don't even want to pull oh. it together. Okay, they're going safe here. Um, it is possible that they maybe know at this point that they're quite a bit ahead. Because Aves Together Strong had those issues in the first boss. And maybe they decided, you know what, uh, during practice we had some heals go off on the Goliath here. Let's just, <laughs> let's just go a bit slower, play it safe. Because, um, yeah, Sanguine can cause so many issues on this level. Yeah, they play it a little bit safe. For a second, I actually thought, and uh, they do end up using it, I thought they were going to wait for the Infernal to come up before pulling everything. I think the Infernal had like another 20 seconds or so. Uh, and they end up actually using the Infernal right here to kind of finish off this Goliath. Even not pulling both of these together, this pack is still scary with that Goliath, especially in the Sanguine. Uh, they do a nice job actually not getting the uh, Goliath stuck in the Sanguine uh, with the recharge. So going to be able to deal with this pack rather safely but yeah not not as big of a pack as we've seen you know groups do here like i uh, you know pull a double maybe use a spear but uh for dwarf this at this point just playing it safe is good enough i agree i, I do think if they know that uh, apes together strong had some issues earlier then i think playing it as safe as possible maybe it makes a lot of sense for them because it's also i don't want to say it's impossible but i would say it's pretty unlikely the Apes Together Strong does some like insane pool where uh, they would, you know, just make up yeah. two, three minutes of time. So for Dwarf this, just staying alive and not making any major mistakes with Sanguine makes a lot of sense. And just going kind of as fast as they can while not taking too many risks. Yeah, if you're Apes Together Strong, you're kind of banking on Dwarf this having a, a big mishap on like one of the bosses, right? Like. You know, maybe mm -hmm. maybe not this one. Uh, they'll they'll have bloodlust up like two minutes from now. Like maybe they end up using it here or saving it. But like let's say for you know the next boss, if they try and pull some of those packs in and get sanguine and goes a little bit sideways, maybe that's where they can kind of uh, find their time that they have to make up. Yeah, and we also don't know what dwarf this plan is with the 
three angels on the last boss platform, right? Oh, they yeah. decided to try and do a triple pull, and it doesn't work out. That's where they can also lose a lot of time if they attempt to do that and it doesn't work. Yeah, as uh, Dwarf Fist starts this uh, boss, you know, they're going to be very far ahead. As uh, Apes Together Strong, you see in that picture, they're dealing with that Goliath pack, and it looks like maybe even getting some Sanguine on top of it. So uh, it's going to take a little bit longer for them to even get that down. As this boss, though, for Dwarf Fist is not just like a pushover, especially on the, you know, 23 and Tyrannical. Uh, you know, some of those casts for range, especially a you know, range that don't have a ton of mobility, uh, like a Warlock, could really be devastating. And I just saw he had dropped so many Chaos Bolts there, unfortunately, <laughs> as they had to dodge out of those uh, projectiles coming in. As he said, uh, Destro not very mobile when it comes to instant casts or small movements like that. Um, but doing fine now, as you can see, the boss is dropping pretty fast. They also managed to kill the Ur. I think Dwarf Disc definitely is favoring Ur a lot when it comes to these relics. Yeah. Um, while we saw some other teams go with Vi sometimes on these tyrannical boss fights, just having the haste for the whole duration seemed more valuable to them. So the teams are definitely not on the same page yet when it comes to... Ooh. Oh no, Baron actually getting hit by that projectile. But, Ankh, there we go, nothing happened. <laughs> you know, no, nobody saw it. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this dungeon is one where, uh, you know, in a lot of other dungeons we've seen like crazy skips with Woe, like, uh, you know, uh, the other side, even like, you know, Halls of Atonement, we saw them do a pretty long skip uh, with the Woe, where there's not really a great spot, really, just probably this next portion of the dungeon coming up. For that on Spires, where you definitely favor the Ur, or maybe even like Vi, if you're going into some of these bigger poles. Yeah, uh, I, we saw some different strategies here, right, after this boss, because there is a pretty long walk after the angel portion when you get carried to the next platform to get to Orifrian the next boss. So we saw some teams just pull another trash back here on this platform to get that um, WoW buff, but it doesn't look like Dwarf This is opting to do that. So they still need to get quite a lot of trash on that next platform. They need to get up to like 83% um, to be able to go up to the last boss and then have 100% from the three angels. So we'll see what they decide to pull on this last uh, uh, third boss platform. Yeah, and Apes Together strong ahead in terms of percentage because they ended up pulling some of those casters from that side. Uh, we have seen, though, like tons of groups have difficulty, especially with the Sanguine in those casters, uh, where it like a little bit riskier. And they didn't actually even pull them in together uh, with some of the cats on the other side. They kind of dealt with them separately. Uh, as opposed to, I believe we saw it was in the Evolve series where they actually put both of those together on top of each other. Uh, as it looks like Dwarf this, let's see, they're going to probably, uh, yeah, they, it looks like they're playing this very safe as they're just going to take this one champion down uh, with the uh, relics and uh, this one where they're actually going to get Ur, so they're not going to go for a skip here. They're actually going to roll right into this next pack. Oh, very interesting. So they're going ahead and uh, pulling the Ur and then also just uh, aggroing the double Helians. So there's two Helians and one Goliath that they have to deal with. So there's lots of AoE damage in a group that they have to handle here. And unfortunately, Apes together strong having a death on their Rogue. But thankfully, they do have a battle rest back up so they can uh, get them back up. They got to be careful. They actually had two deaths uh, on that uh, one where they're able to get both players back up, but nothing available if somebody drops again and the boss still at above like 66%. But for Dwarf this, this that is a uh, that is a scary pull with both of the Hellions, the Goliath, Ur in the mix. Uh, you saw they just used just about everything. They used the Infernal. They used the Healing Tide. They used Ascendance. They they had the Tank Drop meta. Uh, pretty much just dump everything into this pack. Is a uh, wipe here would be devastating, right? Uh, this is probably the riskiest pack they'll have for the rest of the dungeon. Yeah, and one thing I also want to note is that I think they might be losing out on a whole usage of Bloodlust in this dungeon because <laughs> they their Bloodlust uh, came up during the last boss fight and they opted to not use it. Uh, and I wonder why, because I do think overall they could have gotten a third one, but maybe they wanted to save it for the third for the three angel pool if they actually decide to do that. Because um, then it wouldn't have been ready for that one, very likely. So maybe they're just playing it safe, making sure they have the Bloodlust available for those three angels uh, if they decide to do that. Yeah, that is a great sh shout, right? Because they do end up, uh, they go into that second boss uh, you know, with the Bloodlust at, I believe, like two minutes when they started uh, Vincent Axe. And 
Now mm -hmm. going into this next one, they have this Bloodlust. You're probably going to hold it for here. Uh, you may not even use it on this next boss. You're then going to just hold it for the Angel Pull, which on, uh, you know, on a key level like this, definitely like necessary. Uh, especially, you know, uh, I guess you could use it on the final boss on Devos for like the second phase, but still on Fortified, I think it probably... Uh, well, this is Tyrannical, actually. So yeah, I mean, Tyrannical, you could end up using it there, but... Uh, doesn't look like it. They're going to probably save it for some of those angels up top as they're going to get all these usurpers. And then behind the pillar, probably just rain a fire them down. And this should be their percentage. Yeah, but if you take a look at Apes Together Strong, they are on their way to the last platform and they have 78%. They don't have to do as much trash at all on this uh, last platform compared to Dwarf Disc because of the difference in routing that they have. So I do actually think that uh, this now looks a lot closer than what it looked before because of that yeah. extra trash. So now if together strong can just immediately walk to the boss, uh, to Eryphrian, and then it's gonna be really close. Well, right, they can kill just this first Hellion alone if they really wanted to, probably get the woe, go all the way uh, to the end, uh, to Eryphrian and be kind of done. As it looks like uh, on the dwarf this side, they may have actually kind of like woken up a little bit and like, hey, this is not as, uh, uh, this is not as kind of one side as we had thought as uh they're gonna have you know some mobs from the side they're also going to get the ur here is uh gonna get ur and then go right into the boss let's see how they end up playing this as uh apes together strong they're not even gonna do the hellion they're actually gonna use a warlock game and skip that uh all the way here trying to get some of these relics and then go right into the boss Oh, okay, so they're actually doing that uh, right side pull and using a spear for it. So very interesting. Apes Together Strong using that spear for that um, Mender pull, basically. Um, trying to kill everything at the same time to not get any sort of um, Sanguine healing go off. But Dwarf is already on the boss now as they're finishing off another Ur, getting that uh, damage uh, cooldown reduction on everybody. Oh, this is going to be really close, though, going down to the end. Mm -hmm. is uh, Maybe even some of those... A mob stuck in Sanguine for a little bit here for Apes Together Strong, like, ends up being the difference. They're going to use the Shroud, though, get around you towards that final boss. Is, uh, you know, they're they're going to be able to start this Eryphrian, and they're not going to be that far behind, like, maybe 20%, and uh, that is not a lot. Yeah, so they're pulling the Usurpers here as well, um, interestingly enough. I don't think they need it, though. No, I don't think they need it. Or them. do you, right? Or do they need 86%? I always get my percentages wrong, you know, numbers are difficult. But uh, we'll see as yes, they now engage the boss as well on their side. And what do you look at the comp difference? When it comes to single target DPS, I mean, I don't, I'm not really sure what, what would be better between the comps, right? You have the Survival Hunter on one side, which I don't think Survival Hunter is like the strongest single target class, uh, while Havok. He's pretty good at single target as well. And then you have the, the monk actually buffing the physical damage, but refs are going oh. down and they don't have a rest for 40 seconds. Oh. That is actually going to cost a lot of time, uh, unfortunately. Oh, uh, that is uh, that is so difficult, especially because you had, uh, you know, two players uh, drop on Ventanax. You had to use both your battle races there and then uh, not have the cheat death and drop here on Ophrion, like. That is so tough because you were like mounting a sick comeback, right? Uh, you might have been good yeah. on the percentage to go right up after the boss. Dwarf this may have had to pull a little bit more. Uh, you know, your bloodlust timings are going to be really strong for the rest of the dungeon. Like, you were you were in a spot to potentially like take this one down to the wire. That that death though may have hurt them really bad. Yeah, I think so as well. They're going to be able to get them back up in just a second here. But yeah, I think Dwarf. It's still possible that Dwarf just makes a mistake, um, maybe with the Angel pulls, or maybe it's also possible that Dwarf just doesn't even decide to pull all three Angels, yeah. because that is a very risky pull. And if Apes Together Strong decides, oh, you know what, uh, let's do this Hail Mary pull and pull all three Angels, and Dwarf just doesn't, um, then they have another chance to catch up again, if that is the case. But Dwarf just, uh Having a pretty good time here on Eryphrian as they get that last recharge as well. Um, the tank, uh, Lunty, just gathering up all of those orbs. No problem for the Vengeance Demon Hunter. And hopefully they can get the boss down during this recharge or really closely after. Yeah, they want to try and get the boss down uh, as much as possible during this recharge. But uh, I you know, leave it with, you know, yeah, 10% here. That should be enough to just finish it off rather quickly. 
Uh, and, and I do wonder how they play that up top, because they've been pretty safe for, like, you know, really, like, after the first boss on. They've been pretty safe, right? They didn't do a double pull with the casters and the cast. They kind of did that uh, one where people use the spear on the Goliath. They That one a little bit separate. They played it pretty safe outside of the, the one pull here on the last platform, which they kind of went crazy with the double Hellions on. But uh, I wonder if they play it a little bit safe as we go up top with those angels and maybe that opens the door as uh, Apes Together Strong does get Crapsters up now, so they're going to be at full strength. And they also still need to just tr trash pack, so I guess it is 86%. Uh, <laughs> Dwarfus still needs to get the, that trash pack done, which could be the time difference between Apes Together Strong finishing off Orifrian and Dwarfus having to just trash pack, right? So they did kill Ur uh, to get the cooldown reduction again here. And uh, they also need to be careful with, um, with the Sanguine and also with all of the casts. Yes, there's a lot. Oh, one heal actually went off, it looked like. Mm -hmm. um, as this Justicar is still pretty high HP. And now the Sanguine is going to drop in just a second, so they want to get those Justicars out of that. But it's looking good so far. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, uh, some of the heals go off there. You have like a Sanguine, maybe that kind of uh, makes things a little bit scarier. And it looks like Apes Together Strong, they're going to get. Erifrian down now, it's 6%, so he should drop any second. And they're going to be able to go right up top. They're not going to have to pull anything else after that. Yeah, Dwarf Disc going up, and now all eyes on Dwarf Disc. See if they're attempting to do the Triple Angel pull or not. Uh, it looks like they do have everything available to them. They have the Bloodlust available. They should still have a Kyrian Spear as well. And they also have all offensive cooldowns ready in just a second. He did still a couple of uh, seconds on Infernal, but that's how long it takes to actually uh, carry <laughs> everyone up to this platform, so they should be fine. Yeah, you think if they're going to go with uh, the three angels, they invest the lust, they probably just dump like a lot of their cooldowns into this, uh, especially some of the healer ones. It gets a little bit crazy as uh, they are going to grab all three. Uh, you're going to see the Bloodlust go off, the Infernal come out, and they're going to dump everything they got into this. Yeah, and this is so difficult to execute because uh, there's so much um, damage that you can't necessarily perfectly control. So if all of them are low HP and one of them is a little bit lower, then it's really hard to make sure they all die at the same time. They actually delayed the spear for a little bit. You can see they uh, dropped the spear now. So now that the spear is gone, they have to make sure that everyone gets healed. Lanty dropping really low from that frontal there. Uh, they still have the bloodlust running, so it makes it a little bit easier for the rest of Shaman to keep everyone alive. But they have to get this pull done really quickly before the stacks just keep ramping up higher and higher. Yeah, as it looks like for now, they're going to be able to kind of get them uh, low enough, finish them off together on the Ames Together Strong side. They haven't lost it, and they've only pulled the two, it looks like. So uh, it looks like they're, they're going to save the Lust, not pull all three, probably end up using a spear on that last one, and maybe trying to save that Lust for the boss? Yeah, it is possible that Apes Together Strong is lusting the last angel or the Solo, boss. Yeah. Um, but Dwarf just executed that angel pull so beautifully. That was really well done by them, uh, uh, cl uh, killing them off so cleanly, making sure not uh, no full heal goes off, of course. So Dwarf just now only has the boss left. They did decide to finish off Ur as well. And uh, yeah, if they finish off this boss cleanly, they should technically make it. The only difference is going to be that Bloodlust for Apes Together Strong if they actually save it for the boss. But they still have to get through that last angel. And no, they're actually lasting wow. this angel and spirit as well. So, wow, like you could, if so you were many gonna offensives. Do, if, I feel like if you are going to lost and then use the spear, you probably could have grabbed, you know, all three, right? Uh, like, yeah. probably could have like, seen a different use of that, but... Probably just trying to play it safe. You know, they don't have any battle raises up, right? So maybe yeah. not wanting to risk it as like a full wipe really sets them back. I think the problem is uh, for a team that is competing the in the MDI for the first time is, is that um, practicing this triple angel pull is really time intensive because you have to do the whole dungeon <laughs> yeah. to get to this point and then try if you can actually do that triple angel pull. So it's a really huge time sink to even just attempt this at all. Um, so that's why it's actually pretty impressive by Dwarf this that they executed it so well. Because it does look simple when it works, but uh, so many things can go wrong on that pull. 
And if one of them heals, it's just going to be a wipe, and you wasted your bloodlust, you wasted a Kyrian spear uh, for nothing, right? So yeah, that pull is definitely not easy, and uh, I don't blame Aves together strong for not no. trying to do it or not practicing it, maybe. You never know, right? Like we saw earlier, uh, a a uh, accurately placed or badly placed, depending if you get hit by it, storming, right? <laughs> trying to go into the shield yeah. uh, knocks you out of it. That uh, ends up resulting in a death, but. Uh, you see Dwarf this doing a nice job just putting their backs to the wall so when the charge comes through they're able to just kind of cancel it out the charge isn't just going all over the place so able to keep up as much uptime as the boss on possible is this is the toughest time for the boss right that second phase from like 70 percent down yeah we saw an interesting strategy earlier by um echo they actually finished off the vi relic but then they didn't kill um the vi mop until after Devils came back down from that first intermission phase, just so they have that haste buff for the second phase. Make sure they get uh, through that a little bit quicker. So that was an interesting adaptation, and I wonder if maybe other teams are also going to do that in the future. But uh, of course, today it's it's a little bit of a short time frame to adapt to this, so Dwarf is not quite doing that yet, but they're doing a good job even without that haste buff too. Yeah, and you see Apes together strong. Uh, I know that they're at 66% on uh, Devos as well, so... Uh, and it really, when you kind of look at these two groups and how it's gone this far, it's really just those five deaths that have set apes together strong back, right? That extra 25 seconds and you know, the, the even longer than that, right? You know, not having uh, a DPS or two for that first boss and like how that all went. Like, they're just the time on there that sets you back where you, you, don't, you have the, some of those DPSs alive. Uh, you don't have the uh, reduction in time because of uh, you know, the addition of time, right? In terms of the length because of how many deaths. Like, you're... This is like neck and neck. Yeah, I actually think Apes Together Strong lost so much time with those deaths. Not only the death penalty, but as you said, also having damage dealers dead for like minutes, two minutes, even the whole boss fight uh, on the first boss, and also on the Rifrian just now as well, right? Uh, I do think that Apes Together Strong, without any of those mistakes, actually have the faster strategy. Probably. Um, probably. <laughs> But Dwarf this maybe also slowed down a little bit because they knew they're ahead, right? Same time. So, yeah, big shout out to Dwarf this as they're now in that last phase, uh, trying to finish up Devos. Not too many things can go wrong here at this point, but if something goes wrong, they have three battle rests. Yeah. Uh, so, that is, so that is nice to have as well. Uh, it, it's a, a great call out though, because like Apes Together Strong actually had a really strong performance here on Spires of Ascension. And it's like, uh, they didn't have Lust for the first boss, and they were down one DPS. I think we were talking, it was like at like 66% or almost 70%. And then they lost another one at like 20-something percent. Uh, they were still able to finish the boss off, but uh, still, just those extra DPS alive, that's a lot of the time difference made up. Yeah, definitely. So huge shout out to Apes Together Strong. Um, but... Dwarf this winning the series 2-0, and that means Aves Together Strong is unfortunately gonna be eliminated as Dwarf this moves on in that lower bracket. The LFG dream stays alive. Dwarf this <laughs> keeping keeping the magic run going. Noah, and I guess this kind of uh, eliminates us from having that uh, guild on guild matchup uh, that you know you would have seen way later today uh if it would have except happened. in the doa invitational of course right the the <laughs> legendary doa invitational uh it's, <laughs> oh yeah don't forget that it's uh the, the most legendary world of warcraft tournament ever in the history of, of wow you know or so i've heard so i've heard but uh dwarf this super clean uh apes together strong sad to see them kind of go down here i was hoping this was going to go to th three dungeons it very nearly did like you were talking about yeah. i mean it really was just a couple deaths here and there uh, at some crucial moments that ended up making the difference and you know that that is how it that uh, that is how it is at mdi sometimes but dwarf this moving on I'm, I'm excited to see what they can do uh they look like a really good team and and like matt said it's kind of a the hope of LFG players everywhere. Like, you know, that next dungeon, you could queue into someone who you can go far in uh, the myth myth Mythic Dungeon International with. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, even both teams here coming in with times faster than the fastest run of this dungeon on this level ever on the live servers, right? 10 minutes faster than that average run time. <laughs> very, very speedy runs when you put it into that perspective. Oh, um, yeah. So... You know, again, well, well done, Dave's Together Strong. Sad to see them go. And congratulations to Dwarf This for staying alive in our tournament. But they are not done yet with today because they are going to have to play again later today if they want to make it to Sunday. 
Yeah, that's right. They will face the winner of our next series, which is going to be Witness Cuties versus Incarnation. Uh, um, no, I, th I think they're up against the... Isn't it? Oh, no, you're right, you're right. Yeah, they're one of the people sent down the... earlier Exactly. Today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. Oh, yeah. yeah, my bad. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's uh, that's totally correct. They're up against either Yepers or Evolved, oh, depending on who went evolved. down into that particular. So that's gonna be a bit. I think it is too. Difficult. I mean, either way, uh... it would be pretty tough. Yeah. yeah. It might yeah. be tricky. Yeah. <laughs> it should be Evolved, I believe, because uh, I believe Yepers is on the upper side of the bracket, and so they flip when they go down. So I yeah, believe I so. uh, Evolved would go back up. Yeah. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Evolved does look really strong, though. I mean, Baldi just like yeah. they were on another level today when they played. I don't think it was anything Evolved really messed up. Yeah, that the matches tomorrow are already starting to look really, really good with Echo versus Baldi. That's going to be pretty sick. And then whatever we end up getting out of the lower bracket today, too. Um, but things are going to get start to get uh, very, very intense as we move into the second round of the lower bracket. Let's check out some replays, though, from this last dungeon here. And like right off the bat, I mean, a death yeah. for Apes Together Strong. It was rough. This is some of the kind of invisible sanguine pain that, uh, Matt, you were talking about this as well, right? The the Goliath charging in the oh, in the sanguine is just full on pain yep. here. Really not much that you can do about this once it's happened. Like you need to be getting this prevented rather than doing something to fix it once it starts. There's just nothing you can do. Uh, and that ends up costing you quite a bit of time when something like that happens. I also think that Dwarf this, you know, we talk about their route maybe being slightly slower, but the execution on it was quite strong uh, looking at the way that they are moving this pull over on the right hand side after the first boss you know they're doing a really good job of managing all these mobs keeping them from having that sanguine healing doing this this really good job of of just bringing everything exactly where it wants to be using line of sight to keep the dark praetor in a good spot as well and again making sure that no sanguine is dropping under an immobile mob which can cost you so much time if that happens here but yeah just uh, really really well executed portion of the dungeon for them. This is something you gotta watch out for here. So here you have the woe debuff, right? And when you have the woe debuff, if somebody <laughs> just runs and throws like a glaive Bye, at boss. the boss, that kind of thing, that very often what can happen is the boss gets hit and then it looks for all the people in the group, but all of them have the woe buff and are in stealth. And so it can't <laughs> see them. Uh, so you need to make sure you pull. There's a couple of abilities that will that will do that, like throw glaive, those sorts of effects uh, that will will cause this problem. You want to make sure you pull with something like taunt, um, and you you definitely are getting in combat for sure, and not giving the boss an opportunity to do that reset. I'm so happy you pulled the replay from the first uh, pull. I believe that was like from Apes Together Strong with the yeah. uh, the Goliath in the recharge because that just hurts even more because. They ended up using Bloodlust on that. Uh, right. And then I mm -hmm. believe their Demon Hunter, like Nagura, as mentioned, used Meta, then died, and then the Goliath is now stuck in the Sanguine. Like, that is, uh, that is yeah. like, yeah, that's tough. <laughs> yep. Those are some cooldowns you're going to probably want back. Well, either way, Apes Together Strong. Oh, wow, do we got to cross out the name? That's just, that's just extra <laughs> harsh. I mean, wow, they're, they're just gone. They're crossed <laughs> off. They're out of the tournament. That's right. Dwarf this, moving on. To uh, face Evolved is who it's going to be. And then, uh, you know, we will see in our next series, Witness Cuties versus Incarnation, the winner of that, goes on to face Yeppers. Uh, you know, obviously both Evolved and Yepper is going to be pretty big threats threats in the lower bracket. But, uh, you know, maybe Dwarf This has a chance. Maybe the LFG dream continues. They've been really clean. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. like we said, like their route maybe been a, a little bit safe, but like the execution is really strong. You know, the not, uh, they don't have some of like, you know, maybe the biggest pulls, but not like getting wipes at like a, a really inopportune time. So uh, we'll see how they go against Evolved. Evolved, uh, you know, they looked really good against Incarnation. They ran up really, I think kind of like against a buzzsaw and Baldi. They just were on an on fire this morning where uh, I definitely look for Evolve to bounce back and that to be a really strong series. Yeah, that'll be our uh, next series after this next one. So our next next series, of course, first we have to see you know, it's the, I, you know, I like to explain things in the most easy to understand way, you know. Our next, next series <laughs> after our next, the next, next series. one. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day already, but we're not done yet. Witness Cuties <laughs> versus Incarnation coming up. Uh, any, any bold predictions going to this one? I, I feel like incarnation maybe but some people saying they seem a little bit less practiced than people are expecting so who knows i got to imagine you see a better incarnation today though uh you think uh, so yeah I, I i think for sure uh that i don't think that's really kind of like a 
a crazy pick. Uh, we know how good some of these players are uh, and how talented, and I think you're going to see a better performance today. All right. Maybe witness cuties wanted more, you know? Like maybe they just yeah. really want to win and uh, motivation maybe not there as much with incarnation. And witness cuties had a similar problem um, like apes had, that they played against Baldi in the first round, so it was really hard for them True. to like really show what they can do. So I think it's going to be an interesting series. You do also have miss at the beginning of this series, which I don't think we've seen throughout the weekend thus far. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah that's and right. they can't get, and neither team can get rid of it. So uh, that'll be another kind of wrench thrown into this series. You also have to uh, keep in mind that Witness Cuties now carries the torch for the Witness Guild. They're the only ones remaining. So the, the guild yeah. honor is in the mix as well. So it should be a good series either way. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a moment on the Mythic Dungeon International for that series between Witness Cuties and Incarnation. See you then.
Oh, hey, there it is. Uh, welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International. And uh, just in case you're curious, you know, this is, I, I think, a big contributing factor to why, uh, you know, Apes Together Strong did not triumph. Uh, they didn't, they tried to follow the Dratnos route, but it didn't work out. Dratnos, can you explain what happened? Uh, he's not here. Oh, he's I not here? Well, never mind. He was <laughs> here. I guess he can. He would, he would he probably, <laughs> I imagine what would happen is. The shame was too great. You know, the blame has been passed to him for the route. <laughs> I imagine he would probably pass the blame back <laughs> uh, in probably. some capacity. Probably. Yeah. Well, you know, there the you go. The problem is they, they probably didn't use the expert route, which mm -hmm. is, you know, oh. probably would have won them the match if they used the expert mm -hmm. route. <laughs> they also didn't read the fine print for, like, all the details. Yeah, it's not Dratnos guaranteed. is not actually responsible for success or failure on Given Road. That is well. <laughs> Ask your doctor yeah. if Dratnos is right for you. <laughs> If you have these symptoms after Dratnos Route, please call the doctor. It's a class action lawsuit started against Dratnos Route. <laughs> well, there there you go. A lot, lot going on today at uh, MDI. And uh, we're about, we got Zyronic back with us. Uh, Nagura and Matt still around. Dratnos has, uh, has fled. Uh, we've got a search party out. Uh, we'll find him soon. Don't worry. We got Witness Cuties versus Incarnation coming up soon. Again, like we said before the break, Witness Cuties, the only remaining members of the Witness Guild left in uh, MDI for the moment. They are going to have to try to win it for the Guild against the Incarnation team that uh, might be pretty tough to beat, huh, Zy? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> They're a team that can really wow everybody when they're playing well, but we also saw their lows yesterday, right? They, they didn't play particularly fast or well yesterday. That, that's pretty weird for us when we've only seen them play insanely well. Remember, they got fourth in our last MDI, and they're also one of our TGP veterans as well. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we see a little bit more out of them today. I feel like they're a team that can really easily make a lower bracket run here. Yeah, they had a rough go on the first boss of Plague Ball, and... Uh, you know, after you invest Lust and you've done a skip probably through some of those earlier mobs, uh, it's pretty tough to bounce oh. back after that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Court of Stars was removed by both teams here. All uh, right. Uh, so you'll see that Plague Fall back again, uh, which if you get to that third map, that could be dangerous. You would not want to see, obviously, a replay of yesterday uh, if you're Incarnation. But I'm excited for what we see here on Miss. We haven't seen Miss so far throughout the weekend. Yeah, what do you think we can expect from this one, uh, Nagura, as far as you know, what's going to be tripping people up the most? It's it's really hard to tell. I think they aren't really, like, the affixes aren't oh, too going. dangerous. But yeah, we're already in the dungeon here, as we do see Witness Cutie is playing that uh, mage again. They've been playing the mage in uh, almost every dungeon, as far as I'm aware, but not playing the Blue Master this time around, as they're sticking to the Vengeance Demon Hunter. And Incarnation, though, they are playing the more standard comp with the Blood Decay and uh, the Rogue Hunter and uh, Dastro Warlock. This cutie is having some issues, though, as uh, they lost some there. Yeah, that death isn't going to be too big of an issue. They don't have to commit a battle res to it. This is just like the very first pack at the start of the dungeon. I believe they got the Woad Drifter debuff. Yep, you can see that purple buff on all five of their character frames up there. So they're going to be planning on going for a skip the second this last mob becomes friendly and then they'll be able to skip to where Incarnation are headed to. Because Incarnation has the rogue in the group, they were able to shroud all the way to this big pull right before the first boss, so that skip gives them a little bit extra time, but they're going to have to get an 11% extra mob count just to keep up with it. On the topic of Mists of Tyrannus Scythe, though, I feel like this is a dungeon with, even with very little practice, I feel like Incarnation should be pretty good in this dungeon. This is one of their wheelhouse dungeons last season. They, they had a lot of practice on this dungeon back then, and they had some pretty solid times altogether. Yeah, uh, I do really like their pull here, just pulling uh, the bow breakers with that trash pack. I did even see one of the harvesters there uh, to make sure they have all of the interrupts. And that's fine, right? Because the harvesters have a lot of less HP than the bow breakers. They can just finish one off, pull the other one in, and still just cleave everything down at the same time. And now they are going to be going into that first boss. Um, do you think there's going to be any one facing happening on a 2245? On a 22 fortified, with the comp that they're running, uh, it's tough. I think if you do some optimizations, like have the Erdus Mantler die right before you go into that damage amp phase, I could mm -hmm. see it being a possibility. Uh, the Infernal is just now coming off cooldown for, for Asuna here, for Incarnation. He hasn't quite popped it yet, though. 
I, I feel like as a destruction warlock, you'd want to like pre-pop the infernal so you can start stacking as many rain of chaos and blasphemy infernals as possible as you go into the boss. And you can see he just now popped that infernal, so it's not going to be stacking too much. I'd say, well. I'm actually kind of interested to see what happens here. Well, they're definitely not one phasing. The fear went off right before the damage amp phase, and then Yoda actually also went down. So it's not going to get that low, I don't think, with one DPS being dead for the first five seconds of the damage amp phase. But let's see how far, how far they get it here. Yeah, they're still getting the buffs pretty low, so I do think they probably were planning to one phasing, or at least close to one phasing. Yeah, that death there on the hunter and the fear. Very, very unfortunate. Um, as the witness cuties, though, they have saved their bloodlust for this boss. Um, so we'll see how that works out for them. They did finish off Vi, which does make, I guess, technically more sense if you're not gonna stack the Ur for specifically the face. Because having the Ur buff for the face for Ingra is really good as well, right? Especially for your Holy Priest as well and for your Hunter. Having so much CDR is gonna allow you to use more bombs and more boons as well. Um, but Witness Cutie is just having the double haste stack with the Bloodlust plus um, the Vi buff, not even using PI. Like, we don't need that. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so their damage, their damage amp phase was even worse. I mean, part of the reason yeah, for that Infernal has either. to be they, they didn't have the Infernal for it and they used Combust off the pole. I think, yeah. you know, honestly. With a comp like what Witness Cuties is running, if they had their combust, if they had a pre-stacked and ramped Infernal for the second damage amp phase, they probably could have one-phased it. But I mean, Look with those cooldowns now coming nice. up, yeah, they're already back into that second phase, so <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really wow. too much. Unfortified, the bosses just kind of fall over. I mean, yeah. really what's going to happen here is Incarnation's going to need to just secure a massive Trass advantage. But the problem is, I think Witness Cuties might have a little bit of extra damage because they have the Fire Mage in the room over the road. Yeah, definitely possible. They also have the Intellect buff, right? Which is also valuable mm -hmm. um, on uh, the Warlock damage there as well and um, for the Priest. But it looks like Incarnation is already in that maze area. A um, little bit of a difference in Trash because Witness Kitties did that extra pull at the very start of the dungeon. So um, later on Witness Kitties can skip something that Incarnation will have to pull. We're gonna pay attention to that as um, we go. But yeah, in this area, the only thing that really slows you down here is Spiteful, right? Because the Spiteful mobs are going to keep you in combat, so it's really hard for you to actually open these doors um, unless you have Shadow Melt or Vanish or something like that to um, exit combat and then open the door. Which I do think we're going to see a lot of them do. I think um, Growl and Incarnation Yami Priest just used that to open the door as well on their side. It looked like it was actually really unfortunate. I think he got targeted right as he shadow melted oh. so it didn't quite drop combat drop him because you saw him run into the door a couple times and it just wouldn't open for him so mm -hmm. i wonder if they were just kind of confused for a second there but yeah that, that is the main problem here spiteful shade probably one of the worst affixes in miss Eternus, I just because it prevents you from going through the door right away yeah definitely we also uh, i also wanted to mention one thing about witness cutie's tank choice Tobak on that um demon hunter that means that they cannot play Dwarf on the tank, right? Not having that uh, stone form racial ability to get rid of the necrotic stacks, which can cause some issues um, later on, as well, especially in that last boss area, when you pull all of these, like the bigger pulls with like maybe 10 uh, to 15 mobs together, and then necrotic can definitely cause some issues if you don't have something to remove it. Something as well to mention is that Mist of Tyrannus Scythe, because it's a, you know, a random maze on the tournament realm for people who haven't tuned into the MDI before, we have it set during the MDI weekend to be the exact same seed for every single team throughout the entire weekend. So teams always will have the same maze. So they could have practiced this dungeon a few times, known what route we were going to have coming into the dungeon, and prepared what extra trash they were going to be pulling for it. And surprisingly, both teams are actually pulling extra trash through walls in different places. Normally we see teams kind of do similar styles of pulls, but I guess you could change it up a little bit depending on what cooldowns you have up. But one cooldown you're not going to have up is when you're dead. You have nothing available, and unfortunately for the hunter on the side of Witness Cuties, they're dead and not getting released. Uh, they actually committed a battle res to him because they were in combat with Spiteful Shades. I wonder if they didn't get the seed. That feels like it's a pretty easy release, no? Oh, yeah. Oh, and they even walked through the wrong... They got the wrong door! ...door as well? <laughs> Which, what? <laughs> you can see Tomek just smiling on that um, player cam there as well. <laughs> now, 
it is definitely interesting to get the wrong Dora because of what you said with the maze being set. Um, but yeah, definitely something went wrong there. As we did just see um, the Warlock's pet walk through the door to pull some extra trash on top there. And I do love the matching transmogs they have. Big shout out to Witness Cuties. They have, they all have matching transmogs and it's this beautiful dress. And I just love it. They're looking great. They are looking great. And then I think they also use, all use the same mount as well, right? Same mount. Yep. <laughs> yep, just looking as stylish as possible, according to their namesake. Yeah, true there, Witness. They're the cuties of Witness. And they're in the tournament longer than Apes Together Strong as well, right? I mean, Apes is already out, right? So they're technically the yeah, winners. That is so... true. Yeah. <laughs> they're still in the tournament and the other team is not. Yep. There you go. <laughs> Well, Incarnation, even though they have less, they, they don't have that 11% trash count at the end of the dungeon, there's still one pull in this maze ahead of what these cuties pretty consistently. And still more problems for them as well. The Hunter Marley has gotten down yet again, having to release and come back. And now more problems. Mage Cauterize, as well as the Warlock going down as well. And the Warlock doesn't have any pot tenders. That, his, his pot tender doesn't off cooldown for another two minutes either, so... Just random spot deaths here and there for Witness Cuties is not helping them out at all. Four deaths on the board now. That's going to put them an extra 15 seconds behind Incarnation. And it is not good at all. I think the problem is the Gorge Gullet there. Just uh, that huge, huge tongue lash just causing issues for them. <laughs> As uh, the frog just jumps around everywhere, they're trying to uh, finish it off with more trash. But sometimes it can be a trap to pull out a little stuff on top of the Gorge Gullet just because... Um, it's really hard to AoE it down with that not jumping around. And on top of that, uh, you also have to dodge that frontal attack as well. Plus the AoE um, poison attack that you have to walk out of. So especially if you have some melee that can't really attack during it, it can cause issues. Well, Incarnation is already on Miscaller. And you, you can see Nagurat is uh, <laughs> hiding that boss, of course, so while minute. I am casting. <laughs> How are you casting and playing at the same time? Um, uh, hmm. I don't want to talk about it. It's secret tech. Is this pre -re This is 100% pre-recorded. It's pre-recorded in the real life. I think it might be both. Are we still in Boston? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> oh. Oh, All right, <laughs> it does look like uh, Witness Cuties did recover a little bit, managed to finish off that pool uh, as we're moving on. But uh, yeah, Incarnation, they're 60%, still gonna be slightly behind in comparison to Witness Cuties when it comes to trash percentage. So that means Incarnation has to make up trash either after Miss Collar or, um, you know, they're pulling something on top of the boss. Whatever they uh, end up doing, they need a little bit more compared to with the Scooties. And that is the only, like, one of the only few chances with the Scooties has to catch up to Incarnation. If um, they can just skip a lot of trash later on. Well, also, so something that we were always perplexed about in past seasons is how teams were able to skip phases on Mistcaller. And some tech has yeah. been found out about how to consistently do this. I don't know if it's been explained yet this weekend, and maybe our analysts for this series could go a little bit more into a depth if, if they want to, but essentially, if you line of sight the boss as he trans as Miscolor transitions from, you know, past the 70% or the 40% or the 10% phase, you will just completely skip the guessing game phase. So if you're with, if you're out, if your tank is out of line of sight of the boss when he casts the spell right before he would cast guessing game, it will skip the phase. And you can see they're actually setting up to try to attempt this right now. They've moved the boss to this wall. Once it starts casting a long cast, he's going to run and line of sight behind the wall. They're going to try to push it to 10% before he sees him, but yeah, they let the boss get around the corner, so they didn't quite get that phase skip off. And that is a way to consistently skip the phase as long as you're able to push the boss and have it be out of line of sight of your tank. At that transition phase, you can skip this entire intermission. Do you, do you think this is even worth it? On a 2245? Probably not, to be honest. <laughs> I also but, don't think so, right? Yeah, like, even if they it, manage... It's cool to see the tech if they manage <laughs> yeah. to do it right. Yeah, I like the tech for sure, and for like a hierarchy on Tyrannical or something, I think it makes sense, but... Yeah, for this key, like, the, the, the time that you lose for, you know, the priest is gripping the tank, and the tank's walking all the way around, losing damage because they obviously don't detect the boss, and they're also dragging the boss, uh, which can also cause some damage loss for damage dealers because the boss is not standing still. So yeah, I, I don't think it's worth it, but uh, Dorky actually almost dying from fall damage there. <laughs> he does that every time. Yeah. 
<laughs> I've been playing I've been playing live keys with them this week, and every single time with him, without fail, this beatkeeper gets to turn off uh, the Path of Frost for DK and just takes 90% of his HP and damage on that jump. He just forgets Excuse me. every time. <laughs> Oh no, uh, Yami is playing with closed eyes. No wonder, oh, um... Well, actually, I wanted to say no wonder they're, they have so many deaths, but it's oh, only just open. one. They're so. open, they're open, they're open, he's ready. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the triple trash pull coming in, this is a bear pull. All of the trash coming in, once that dismantler goes down, they're going to be being chilling here. All of the trash going down. Look at the rain of fires coming in for Suna on the Warlock there. Going to be pushing 100k DPS. Yoda trying to catch up on the Survival Hunter, but it doesn't look like there's enough trash HP left for him to catch up. Man, it's a fortified key and they're having no issues getting all this trash down. Nope, that uh, looked very clean, but then they did also pull in those Reavers as well. They might even just drag them along. Because as I talked about earlier, they still need a lot of trash. So they might just be... Moving along, just um, doing the next trash pack too. You can see Dorky already engaging uh, the next relic pack too. We do have Lavas available, um, but I assume they're saving it for a boss. Maybe they're even pulling all of this onto the boss. I would Probably love to see that. The boss, if I had to guess. Yeah. Maybe Dorky is scared of Necrotic. This is Necrotic, and you can see those stacks yeah. are starting to stack up pretty quickly on him. He's at 35 stacks of Necrotic. That's 70% reduced healing on him right now. And as a Blood Decay, healing is your number one form of mitigation, so he has to get out of dodge quick, make sure he doesn't refresh at all. Dancing the weapon could help with that, and he did refresh the stacks. Now down, got rid of that 40 stack. Should be fine. Those, those death strikes are going to heal him up to full every time he needs to get them. Well played from Dorky there. Even though they're out of practice, still playing pretty well. I'm so surprised that Dorky held on to his stone form there. I wonder if he really needs stone form for the next pool, and maybe boss plus trash, and didn't want to commit it here. But uh, yeah, just holding on to that stone form, um, just kiting it out the necrotic. So really nice heads up play if Dorky knows that uh, he's actually going to need that for the next pool. But we're going to see what happens as they actually only need 2%. Trash, so it shouldn't be too big of a pull here. Uh, still having Bloodlust available as well for this um, last boss. Um, so yeah, there we go. Bloodlust being popped, Relics um, being killed as well. Need to get 2% more mm -hmm. trash after this boss, but I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, just going to be killing off some low HP mobs in the next trash pack. Yep, just be a couple worms off to the side. Finish them off. Might even pull it in at the end of the boss just to get a little spicy with it. But I mean, it, this is a good proof of concept for Incarnation, right? Like, even though they themselves have said they were going full YOLO this this weekend, this dungeon has looked pretty strong for them as well, right? Like, this has been a relatively clean dungeon. One spot death somewhere. That was it. This is this is a pretty good start of a low, potential lower bracket run for them, right? As long as they kill Tredova without any problems, obviously. Yeah, and I also just noticed that Dorky is playing Necrolord. Uh, interestingly enough, because oh. we saw a lot of Kyrian Blood Decays um, this weekend, but Dorky decided to play Necrolord here. And Dreddos talked about it earlier, he did say that uh, Necrolord is not actually bad um, on Blood Decay, but he was mainly talking about dungeons where you would need a Necrolord, right? Something like Plague Ball or um, right. either Fame. So for this dungeon, it is interesting, but maybe Dorky has the secret tech and knows more than the other Blood DKs do. Well, see, the thing about Dorky is he's always wanted to play Blood DK, but it was never in the meta before. Mm -hmm. It used to be Blood DK prison. Whenever you would fail a couple of push keys, Dorky would be like, I'm logging on my DK, and then everyone's <laughs> like, oh man, we're in Blood DK prison. But it's not fun anymore, because Blood DK is so insane. But the boss is about to go down for incarnation. All that's left for him to do is go into this pack off to the side here, kill, kill off a couple of these little larvas, and that will be the first dungeon going to Incarnation. Again, relatively clean. Not really looking like a team that hasn't practiced that much. They look pretty solid in this dungeon. <laughs> Turkey just uses the uh, stone form for like two necrotic stacks. <laughs> this is yeah, what Turkey saved I had, my, I had for. my stone form too. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even have to use it. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, well played. Wow, there you go. Victory for Incarnation to start things off with a pretty convincing one, too. I mean, Incarnation coming back looking a little bit cleaner than we saw yesterday. And uh, Witness Cuties uh, witnessed a little bit of destruction on their end that time. It was it was rough, but uh, we got another map to look forward to. But I think this one's looking pretty, pretty Incarnation favorite at this point, based on that one dungeon, huh?
Uh, I mean, this is the incarnation you thought you would see. Uh, yeah. It, like, way cleaner here. Uh, Witness Cuties had some issues. Uh, I believe a little a little maze mishap uh, with some <laughs> laughter in the player cam. Uh, it happens uh, to all of us, yeah. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, no, they had like about 17 minutes going into that final uh, phase in terms of like how much uh, time they were going on. And then what uh, Incarnation finishes 1641. So a uh, really good performance from them. 39k DPS by Asuna there as well. Wow. wow. That's, uh, that's some numbers. <laughs> that, that is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Those are yeah. some Warlock numbers. Yep. <laughs> well, here's our live data for 22 Fortified uh, Miss of... Tuna Scythe? Scythe? How do you like how do you like to say it? We say Scythe, I think. Scythe? Tuna Scythe. Scythe. I've heard it so many pronounce the last part of the We just we just say mist. Miss? Yeah. Tuna yeah. Scythe. Yeah, yeah everyone just says mist. But when you actually <laughs> pronounce the whole thing, I've never heard uh, any sort of general consensus on it. Oh, Scythe, I have though. a very important Discord DM to discuss with you guys really quick. One okay. sec. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna post it in the talent channel. Oh. Uh, it's a message from Dorky. Oh. <clears throat> I forgot to change covenants. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> that'll do it. All right. So no secret tech. It's just <laughs> no, no tech. Hey, hey well, we a win is a win. There. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the amount of uh, the amount of times I have switched from Boomkin to Resto and uh, you know, gone into a key with uh, Naya and Boomkin conduits in. Uh, probably more than. Have I you ever played admit. Venfear Resto Druid? Uh, no, no, I, that is a mistake I will not make. I, I know, I know that one, that one is not, uh, hideable, I feel like. Uh, that one would be, uh, that would be horrible. <laughs> yep. It's a little bit rough. Let's, let's take a look at some of the replays here. I think the first one, we, we know what's coming here. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> I just oh. love their chun smug, oh, though. Oh. oh. Yeah, you get the, the, they what's the Warlock's fault? The oh. White wedding dress and top hats for everybody? Yeah. No, they're having fun with it. They said that yeah. they picked uh, the cutest people from their guild, uh, and they dressed them up, and now they're here. They're doing it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, not not a bad performance for the five cutest members of the guild witness. Yes. Really for, yep. <laughs> they were actually looking really good. Yeah, they looked like they were technically behind the whole time. That's because they played an um, additional trash pack at the start, right? So mm -hmm. they always had the opportunity to catch up eventually because they skipped so much trash um, in the last boss area. But then the problem was that they had some difficulties on some of the trash packs. Ended up not figuring out the maze this one time. So yeah, it just didn't work out for them. But I don't think their route was technically that bad. No, I think... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Incarnation, they got their percentage towards the end. They, like, finished the second boss with, like, 66, I think, percent. Like, that's kind of how I think a lot of people do it. Like, pick up some of the larvas there towards the end, uh, you know, on the packs to the side. Where, yeah, Witness Cuties, they got a lot of that trash out at the start. Uh, it just took them a long time. And then once you mess the, the maze up, you you go back. Yeah, you, you know, everybody just laughs hysterically. Like, it's just a funny thing to do <laughs> that it's, it's hard yeah. to recover. <laughs> What do you do besides laugh at this point? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You go on and try to do better on Necrotic Wake, which is where we're going to next. <coughs> Excuse me. So sorry about that. Um, I didn't know you were that allergic to Necrotic Wake. I am. The plague. The ass bags got the to The plague it. got me. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I just look at it and it happens. <laughs> I there mean, it's go. it's a pretty yeah. tough dungeon, right? It's pretty it's pretty quick, especially in the MDI. Right? This is one. Of, this is pretty much our fastest dungeon, besides maybe yeah. Gambit. Yeah. But this week, Wake will be much faster. Like it's twelve minutes of just pure action, giant pulls, and if one small thing goes wrong, your entire team just is gone. Uh, yeah, especially trying to do some big pulls at the beginning uh, into mm -hmm. the boss. I think we saw that uh, the other day attempted where. You have raging, uh, so uh, as those mo mobs kind of get low, you have to finish them off. You can't just kind of, uh, you know, rain of fire your way to victory. You have to kind of like mm -hmm. uh, focus some of them down because yeah, it's uh, it becomes pretty uh, devastating for the tanks. Yeah, and I actually think this is one of the dungeons that's uh, the most difficult for newcomer MDI teams to learn, just because. Um, the pulls that the MDI teams do in this dungeons are, are just ridiculous, right? They're just pulling everything. Yeah. And you don't do that on live keys, right? So if you're a team that is kind of new to the MDI, um, like Witness Cuties, then it's going to be a little bit hard for you to get used to that kind of pace in Necrotic Wake. 
and trying to get those insane pulls done. Yeah, I was gonna say, how do you how do you like match that pace, right? Like you're yeah. you're seeing, you know, teams like Echo just blow through this dungeon in insane times, and it's like, well, to even keep pace, we need to kind of push probably more than we've ever pushed before. Uh, which just leads to deaths, right? Just leads to a little bit mistakes, which really sets you back against teams like Incarnation. Yeah, of course. I mean, you make a big pull like that, you're not used to it. Like somebody misses a drain fluids or, uh, or what is it, channel fluid, something like that, and everyone's just cc <laughs> Or one person's just CC'd. And then yeah, the whole and, team uh, dies. Uh, yeah, and Incarnation is a team that even if they haven't practiced that much, which of course we don't know, but even if that is the case, they are... They, are, they know this dungeon from previous uh, TGPs, from previous MDIs, right? So mm -hmm. they know how the pace goes in this dungeon, know how big the pulls are, and they've already done that before, right? So it's a little bit easier for Incarnation to, uh, to play in a chronic wake compared to a completely new MDI team, right? I mean, at least you've got a lot of, like, footage to go back and watch, right? You can look at a lot of the, the pulls true. from, like, previous ones, um, you know, maybe look at some of the other you know mdis that have happened even though it's obviously different fx different era for you know mdi but you can still take some of the fundamentals in right it, yeah, yeah it's a bit I different mean, though it's Come always going to be a bit different yeah, yeah what were you gonna say zero oh yeah the thing as well is like they have all of their notes and stuff and like their cc orders and who gets what cc what interrupt from previous yeah. seasons right they just have to slot asuna in on his character and then they'll just be like <laughs> A DPS is the easiest character to swap out, pretty much, because all you have true. to know yeah. is this is my interrupt. Except the rogue, and... probably. Except the rogue, but Junkrat just, yeah. well, you, Nagura, do all of the work anyways <laughs> as the rogue for this I do anyways. everything, so Asuna <laughs> barely has to press any buttons, really, yeah. other than damage buttons, so it's fine. Still haven't seen them in the same place at the same time. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, well, we're going to get things started. We'll see if uh, Incarnation could 2 all this or if Witness Cuties ties it up. All right, so Witness Cutie is playing that same comp again with Adventure Demon Hunter and also the Fire Mage. Uh, we haven't seen either of those teams in Necrotic Wake this MDI, um, so we'll see what the routes look like. Witness Cutie is doing more of a standard, like, life server pull, I would say, and Incarnation also doing a little bit of a smaller pull, so we don't see any insane pulling the whole room onto the boss or anything from either of those teams. Uh, that, that makes a little bit more sense to me, right? If Incarnation is going full YOLO, as they say, they're going to go for a safer strat. Grabbing that Woe Drifter, making sure they have the damage reduction buff, and then Dorky will go ahead and pull everything else on top of them once they grab those healing war buffs from this Goliath here. They will probably use a spear here to just deal with all the trash, and uh, after that, you just let the healing orb carry you to victory. And this is something we saw Echo do yesterday absolutely perfectly once the affixes were correct for them. <laughs> Yeah, and with this is now also engaging the boss, doing a very similar strategy as Incarnation. Uh, both of them committing the bloodlust as well for this pull. Uh, we do see with this did kill Ur um, as well, while Incarnation killed Wo first, and then the second one was Ur as well. So both of them having that cooldown reduction on them, and now they're trying to get the boss done as quickly as possible. Uh, Incarnation having a slight advantage, as you can see, they did kill more trash. They're on 31% now. And they also have the boss lower, so just doing everything a little bit quicker so far. Yeah, just a little bit more experience from this team, right? Even even if they are a little bit of a conglomeration of two of our teams from last season, they do have that entire season of MDI from last year under their belts, so they know a little bit about how this dungeon works. I mean, experience is a lot in the MDI, even if you're not necessarily as practiced as you should be coming into one of those weekends. Yeah, that is definitely true. Some, some dungeons are very similar to how you played them before and it's just like some pool is maybe slightly different and you have some different affixes but you can definitely um if you already have a route that you can go off of then it's going to be a little bit easier than if you have to completely learn a route uh, uh fresh like with this cuties probably has to do with most of these dungeons um but there we go incarnation did not quite yet finish off the boss but it's on two percent they're just dragging it into that last harvester pack there and also getting a Woe Drifter to get the movement speed buff and also the stealth just to move on to probably the next Goliath, getting those uh, next um, pulsing auras and everybody. 
you know, even though Witness Unit is a slight bit behind right now on boss HP, they did just have a little bit of nifty tech there with the Warlock Gateway to get up on top of this platform. Sometimes jumping up here can be a little bit annoying, especially when you have a whole bunch of trash running around. So you saw they used a Gateway just to instantly pop everyone up here and make sure that they could get there quickly into this trash pack. That's a nice little uh, consistency thing. I like that. Maybe some other teams will uh, will take that into effect in the future. Yeah, definitely like seeing that as Incarnation now picking up those orbs and they're just running past some of this trash here. Now they're gathering up... Um, okay, let's see what they're gathering up. Dorky is somewhere off to the right side. They're not even pulling the minibus at all. Oh no, they're just pulling they're probably the... Probably just Yeah, they're pulling the Marauders back and now they're pulling the minibus. So they still have the pulsing area around them. You can see um, everyone is uh, having this blue aura, the blue pulsing aura. They want to make sure they're close enough to all the mobs to do AoE damage, but also use the healing effect of it as well. Uh, you can see the damage done by it uh, in the damage meter. The Kirin weapon is the one that uh, basically just out TPSs everybody. Does uh, Do you know of Kirin weapon streams? I'm trying to figure I out... I would love to watch Kirin weapon stream. Yeah. Okay. I wish I knew. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, th th that's the that's the thing with Necrotic Wake, right? And it's one of the reasons it's one of the best push dungeons as well. If you can get the fundamentals of the dungeon down and properly stack everything up and use your carrying weapons on them, the dungeon will essentially kill itself with the carrying weapons. It's just a matter of, can your tank stay alive? Like, you can es essentially scale this up to, like, probably low 30s this season once people actually get fully mythic geared out. But uh, some some nice tech from Incarnation. Again, the experience is coming through for them. Junkrat going to do what he... What, what, what you did last season. Going and starting the boss RP so that the boss is sitting there ready for them to get there. And then they'll grab this next set of orbs and then pull a bunch of trash and then probably do something very similar to Echo where they pull a little bit of trash and probably just one pack of relics on top of the boss and just blitz it all down with Kyrian weapons and uh, Warlock and Hunter AoE. It's interesting because Witness Cuties looked like they didn't even pick up that Goliath orb there on the left side, unless they're going and do that now. They just immediately walked to the right um, with the Woe buff and just did this pull without Anima orbs. And it looks like they are also just uh, not picking up either. So they are just skipping one whole Goliath buff. Um, at least that's what it looks like so far. So interesting change of strategy there. Um, now they're pulling the relics while they wait for um, the boss to spawn, and Incarnation though already engaging Amar. Yep, and that's the beauty of uh, having your rogue go and start it beforehand. Good job, Nagra. They aren't doing what Echo did though. They aren't pulling an extra trash on top of the boss, they're just going for a more safer, clean route, which is not what we're used to from Dorky. I mean, if you remember yesterday, we talked about bear pulls. That's what Dorky is known for. He's known for the bear pulls. He's known, he's known for just saying whatever to whatever route we have planned, and then just going and pulling like seven packs at the same time and just saying, Growl, heal me. He's not doing that here. They've reined him in. How did that happen? Very interesting. I want to I wanna know what's going on there. Uh, <laughs> going for the safe strut, though, I guess, partially. Uh, as well, with the zero deaths on the board for both teams, actually. Really impressive to see some of those insane pulls coming out and still having that uh, consistency uh, without any deaths on the board. And we all know that deaths in this dungeon are probably cost you more than in any other dungeon just because you're losing either your weapons, you're losing the um, Goliath anima buff on you as well. So that can cost you a lot of time if that happens. But fitness cuties! They're really not that far behind if you look at the MR's health right now. Yeah, no, they've caught up well here, and I think part of the reason for that is Incarnation has opted for a much more safe strategy in this section, second part of the dungeon. Witness Cuties has gone for slightly larger trash pulls, and, you know, one less trash pull can save a ton of time, especially in a dungeon that's so quick, like Necrotic Wake. Incarnation has let Witness Cuties back into it, and honestly, if they keep playing safe and Witness Cuties is able to pull off some of those more dangerous strats, we could see Witness Cuties snatch a win here. Yeah, at least Dorkin did now pick the correct Covenant. Uh, he is now playing Kyrie <laughs> and then Vlad the King, and not uh, Necrolord anymore. And uh, with this cuties definitely on Incarnation's heels. Both of them uh, are up to 68%. That is enough percentage to just move up to the Necropolis and get the rest of the percentage there. And we did see Echo pull this whole boss room together. 
I would assume Incarnation is not doing that, but let's take a look what they're planning on doing. Oh, they're pre-soul stoning. That's very important. Who's it uh -oh. going on? Of course it's going on the tank, just in case, so that they can instantly get him back up. That's one of the scariest things as a Warlock player. If you're the only battle res in the group and your tank dies, you have to cast the soul stone, but because you're doing so much damage with your Infernal, you're usually the one that has aggro. It's not a good place to yeah. be in. So the pre-soul stone, that's a smart play there. If Dorky does go down, they'll be able to get him up instantly. But like you said, they're not going for the full room pull. They're going for the more typical pull that we see from a lot of teams where you just pull three trash packs together, right? The back left pack, the front left pack, plus the patrol. That's a lot safer, and it also gives you access to this one flesh crafter, which conveniently now is in raging range. Those those throw flushes that it do will, will do double damage now if they keep it alive. Are they going to keep it alive, or are they just going to kill it? Okay, they're just going to kill it. I don't know why they could they could use it to help with this next pack. They do have another one, uh, another flashcraft in just right side pack. So maybe that's oh. the one they keep alive. Um, I bet well, you I know exactly why. They also exactly committed why. some weapons there too, right? So they committed the Kyrian weapon. Uh, I mean the um, the orb, tank orb, usually is picked up by tanks. The pulsing AOE, and they just used that on that pool. You see some spears still on the back uh, of some players. You can see Asuna having a spear as well. So some weapons still left that I assume they're going to be using for the bosses because it is tyrannical, so having those spears and some hammers as well is really, really nice to get the bosses done. You know what I'll, what I'll bet it is? Those throw fleshes from the Flesh Crafter are the number one source of Holy Priest Angels throughout the entire <laughs> Shadowlands. And I'll bet you Growl was sitting there like, y'all better kill this. I'm not going to be plastered on Twitter as an angel again. It's not going to happen. There's already a plan. Yeah, you know what? That must now. be the reason. Yeah. I totally you know, see uh, that uh, being the thing. Did you know one of his guildmates made a website for him that was just a, a, a like a, what's the word? Not mirage, or not montage. Can't think of the word. Someone will get it for me for sure. But it's just a bunch of images of Growl and Angel just all pl plastered together. I, lo I love that. <laughs> Collage, yeah. That's Collage. The I knew it was an Oj. I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> Well, perfect. I definitely need to see that. Uh, you're gonna have to link me that collage afterwards. But the witness cuties are now also in the Necropolis area. They are trying to catch up to Incarnation. Uh, we did see some very similar pulls from them, from them as well. And we also see a lot of weapons still left. I think Incarnation has three spears left, um, as far as I can see, uh, on the backs of the players. So, um, Kyrie <laughs> at Kyrian weapons at <laughs> the bottom right. We have the player cam going on right there. Perfect. <laughs> Is that an actual Twitter account? I want to find out now. Twitter.com slash Kyrian weapons. <laughs> okay, well, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's okay, oh. though. I, res I respect the memes from production mid-match. <laughs> Incarnation doing Beautiful. a good job, though. They only have the one trash yeah. pack left. I mean... They're looking pretty good. They're, they're solidly in the lead now. They're about one and a half trash packs ahead of Witness Cuties. Witness Cuties does have that extra death on the board, although five seconds is going to be pretty small when it comes to the end of the dungeon here. As long as Incarnation is clean on these last two bosses, this should go their way. Yeah, even though Witness Cuties did play really cleanly as well, only having gained one death on uh, Marley uh, earlier, uh, so it didn't cost too much time, just battle rest um, the hand drop immediately. But yeah, I mean... I do want to say with this cuties is playing really well, um, but yeah, Incarnation is just playing a little bit better, just doing everything a bit quicker, and yeah, it's just these small details, small um, efficiency uh, coming out from Incarnation compared to Witness Cuties, and that is really what is putting them ahead here. As they're already engaging Surge and Stitch Flash, and now it's only those two bosses between them and advancing uh, in this lower final elimination match. And they have so many weapons still left, too, so they're going to be killing those bosses really quickly. Yeah, I want to see what their weapon usage is going to be here. Let's see, do they use a spear? If they do use a spear, you'll see, yep, there they are, Kyrian weapons popping back up to the top. So that, that thing's, I think it says just one spear. It's going to be ticking for a little while for a little bit of dot damage, but that's all that they've committed. Looks like there were no hammers committed to this boss, so they're just going to be doing probably one reset with the meat hook on the boss here, and then just trying to burn it down before the boss escapes again. And it looks like they're going to be able to do that pretty cleanly with the boss at around 30% when he escapes here for the first time. Yeah, they're not even, uh, they're not using the Flashcrafter here at all either. It's oh, just, they missed! Um... Their hook missed! 
Oh no, they actually missed the hook. So that's gonna be causing some... The only issue that get can cause is that this other hook now misses as well because oh. they have two creations up. They just need to make sure they're not hooking the muffs together. Oh, they'll be fine. They oh. killed one of them. Okay. All right, nice. there it is. <laughs> There it is. Uh, but yeah, some issues there on their side, as Witness Cuties now also is engaging um, the boss. But of course, it's going to be a hard time for them to catch up unless they somehow uh, have a miracle and uh, just do a lot more boss damage, which of course is possible. Uh, they do have the difference in comp, right? They do have the mage and boss damage. And Incarnation just committed Bloodlust for this boss. Witness Cuties actually still has last for the last boss, so uh, they might be making up a lot of time on the last boss. Well, I would guess the reasoning behind that is they're going to have the Fleshcrafter for this last boss. They still have two spears, I believe, plus several hammers to just help with boss damage here. Um, but that being said, Witness Cuties and the Fleshcrafter, right? Witness Cuties has been given a little bit of an opening here. That, that missed hook, hook probably cost Incarnation about 20 seconds. If there are any even minor issues on this boss where a player dies, uh, Witness Cuties could get right back into this, right? If Dorky goes down... That could be all she wrote for Incarnation in this dungeon. Yeah, I do agree. As we do see the first Exile coming up in just a second, so they want to make sure um, they either soul stone that person so they can just um, immediately die, or try to dodge it somehow with a gateway or something like that. Uh, but they do have two battle rests available, so maybe Yoda is just going to walk into the swirlies and die, depending on uh, if they think it's worth it or not. And uh, they are just using that Flash Crafter to get that extra cleavers into the boss as well. So the, the 1.19 million... Oh, oh dorky! Man! <laughs> he, just, he, just took, he just took two ticks of the Comet Storm on purpose. Yeah. Like... <sighs> that... That was... Uh, wh why would you even risk that? I don't know! <laughs> Looks like we're having a little bit of problems for Witness Cuties on the left side of our monitor here, though. These meat hooks are causing problems for them. They are able to get it down, but everyone is so, so low. Wrath is going to have to try to do his best to equalize them there, and it looks like they're going to be just fine, but they're so far behind Incarnation. Now, even if they get the boss down, they have yeah. so much work to do, and Incarnation is closing in on the end here. If they really wanted to at this point, they probably could just have Asuna die and, and use the battle res on him, but they're playing it completely safe. He's going to come back upstairs with 30 seconds of the 100% crit buff, but they're probably not even going to need him. With that Fleshcrafter now enraging, only one or two more throw cleavers are all it's going to take to get this boss down, and they kill it before the cleaver goes off. <laughs> That is yeah, okay. Yeah, Witness Cuties did manage to get to, to the boss now as well. They're just saving the Bloodlust for next dungeon at this point. Um, but Incarnation! Finishing off Nalthor, they also shield. finish off the Flash Crafter. <laughs> so they have the 100% trash as well. And it's going to be Incarnation moving on uh, in this series between Witness Cuties and Incarnation. Wow, well done. Yeah, 2-0 for Incarnation. And uh, Witness Cuties, I, I feel like they gave him a little bit of the run for their money, but... Uh, Incarnation just, I think, the better team today. It was pretty close, though. I mean, I was definitely scared yeah. when they, uh, when that meat hook uh, did not hit the <laughs> boss, and then you get, I mean, yeah. that we know how that spirals, right? Then the creations start coming out, they start, like, hooking each other, because you can't move all of them, like, uh, it just spirals out of control, but they're able to kind of, like, figure things out after that, uh, <laughs> and that's really the only scary part. It was scary. Uh, again, look at the live data for a Necrotic Wake of 22 Tyrannical. Obviously, things getting done a little bit quicker here at MDI, but uh, it's always interesting to compare those live stats. Little? I mean, uh, little they both, were, they both just basically did it in half of the average <laughs> runtime of, like, a live server key. It's impressive stuff, and I mean, that's that's the thing. Like, when even though Witness Cuties is out of the tournament now at this point, uh, it, there's still a fantastic squad, right? To be able to come here and put on uh, performances like that, like... Definitely, uh, you know, one of the best dungeon running teams out there. But this is uh, this is the next level, right? MDI is where you're going to see just like the god tier teams, right? And the demigod tier teams just can't quite hack it. But there's always LCQ, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, again, I just want to give a quick shout out to Witness Cuties because again, Tobuk, their tank, and Raf, their healer, they did carry my alt warlock Nagany <laughs> through some keys. <laughs> so uh, big shout out to them and. <laughs> <laughs> they were I'll great see you today. In the last yeah, yeah. They, they were they did uh, amazing. <laughs> you realize that you're just, called the cast you're just pulling them out for being warlock sympathizers, and nobody's gonna like them for that. Sounds some caster bribery to me. I don't know. I'm a little bit, a little bit uncomfortable with all that. 
Yeah, you guys uh, mentioned playing it maybe a little bit safe here, not like grabbing the both sides, uh, Kyrian weapons, uh, just dominating. Uh, here is we kind of uh, have this is like one of the I mean, this is one of the scariest parts to know coming up here to the top platform of this dungeon and uh, getting them down. Uh, Zyra, I was also like, you know, just they basically killed that uh, crafter who throws the cleavers down, like where I thought maybe they were going to keep him alive for a bit, but uh, they kind of just work him down individually here, just like they did not want to risk anything. Yeah, I, they just played it safe, honestly, right? Yeah, I, I, I honestly think Growl just didn't want to get memed for getting hit by a throw flesh and have his angel plastered all over Twitter because <laughs> I definitely would have done that to him. Oh, oh, whoops, that I yeah. Probably just kind of topples over there. <laughs> so, yep. they, they start to uh, make this pull, but like really with this cuties, you just kind of clean up like uh, you know one or two things here, and you're you're making this one go down to the wire. Is uh, I believe this is when, uh, yeah, the hooks probably end oh, up. Oh yeah, it's a little bit to the left. Just a little yeah. bit to Ooh. the left. Yeah. Hmm. Didn't study geometry. <laughs> Simple geometry, right? Yep. <laughs> it happens to the best of us, though, you know, but it didn't end up mattering in the end. It is a, a 2-0 victory for Incarnation, but something that, you know, is, as they go deeper in the lower bracket, you can't be making little errors like that. That uh, that <laughs> 20 seconds or however much it was um, will be impactful when you're running into some of the stronger teams. Yeah, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, this team, Incarnation, will be playing... Um... The team that lost to Echo, what was their name again? Sorry, the team uh, of Yepers. Lezel and Soul. Yepers, yeah, thank they you. all play Yepers, Yepers, yeah. They'll be playing later mm -hmm. today, and that's definitely a step up from Witness Cuties, I think. So those small mm -hmm. mistakes aren't going to cut it against that team for sure. Yeah, these next two matches are going to be the the ones that are, are probably going to be some of the tighter ones, where now the, the teams that made it through the lower bracket matches are ready, right? Dwarf this and Incarnation. Um, you know, now they have to try to stay alive against some of the some of the stronger teams, and it's gonna be it's gonna be tough, right? I, I'm very curious to see how Dwarf this is going to do in particular. Incarnation, again, a team with a lot of MDI success in the past. Uh, you'd hope they can make it farther, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard to see all of these teams okay. go home, whoever ends up making it. And I mean, Baldi versus Evolved was like a really good game. It was just like Baldi just really like playing like top notch, where I, I think, you know, Evolved is going to be very difficult for Dwarf this to get through. Uh, and I, I think uh, Yepers versus Incarnation, which I imagine is the last game of the day, I uh, wouldn't like have them play back to back, but uh, that is going to be a really strong game. I, you know, you would definitely like look at Incarnation, what they've done in the past and probably favor them, but uh, Yepers has put up a really good showing this far as well. Indeed. But it all comes down to this, right? Another couple elimination matches on the way. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we could see some upsets. Either way, it's uh, whoever makes it through is also going to have to think about facing whoever's going to come down from the winner's bracket finals, right? Which is another extremely powerful team as well. So any way you slice it, it's, it's going to be tough to make a, a run through that lower bracket. But hey, miracles have happened in the past. Who knows? Again, it would be weird to see Incarnation eliminated this early. We'll find out. Yeah, yeah we'll the lower bracket, I think, is always very difficult to just be in in general, especially if you go down really early. Mm -hmm. And then if you see scary teams come down from the upper bracket, and all of a sudden you have to fight Incarnation already in the first round uh, in the lower bracket, that is always incredibly scary to look at. Uh, so good luck to all the lower <laughs> bracket teams that are <laughs> fighting the elimination matches. <laughs> Yeah, good luck. Well, we will find out next who survives with Evolve versus Dwarf this coming up. We're going to take a little bit longer of a break to let the players kind of relax, get ready for the next series. Didn't want to slam right into the next lower bracket round so quickly. But when we return, we will find out who moves on, who goes home. Don't go anywhere. MDI returns in just a few.
And we are back here at MDI. Tettle Zyronic, Gretnos, and Doe here with you. And we're going into our final two matches of the day. It's going to be uh, the next round of the lower bracket final. So again, we have elimination matches. Somebody's going home. Somebody is not going home. They're moving on. It's going to be Evolved versus Dwarf This. Now, we've seen some good stuff from Dwarf This Tettles, but like Evolved seems like they might be on a, a slightly more evolved level. Uh, Evolve's Friday looked incredibly strong to the point where some of the we were talking uh, before the day, and some of the people were predicting Evolve to even be able to take the matchup versus Baldi. In Evolve's matchup versus Baldi, they looked a little bit less consistent than they necessarily needed to be to even be able to take down that series. But mm. it, it seemed like it was maybe even like a dungeon by dungeon basis for them as to like where they look super practice versus where they may have just a little bit of weaknesses. But I do think Evolve is certainly favored in this matchup versus Dwarf this. So the question is then, like, what does Dwarf this need to do to catch up? Because they've looked solid overall, but in your opinion, Dratnos, as we check out the bands, looks like uh, Sanguine and Plague Fall out. Uh, you know, what is it that Dwarf this is going to need to improve on a little bit to, to come close to beating Evolved? I, yeah, I mean, this is going to be a really, really hard series for Dwarf this, I think. Evolved have definitely looked like a contender for being one of the one of the best teams in this uh, in this group in their games we've seen so far. But the thing for Dwarf This is looking at their bracket, it was fairly predictable that they would end up in a pivotal match in this spot in the bracket. Right. So I think that that may have informed their practice decision. And if they have really hyper-focused on these maps in particular, uh, I think that that could be the kind of thing that means they, they are on another level in these maps and they put extra time in and they are uh, ready to, to really give it all they've got here. But, but what did you think about the evolved, uh, like, so Gambit's going to be played second, and we saw Baldi kind of own evolved yeah. in the Gambit earlier today. Like, are, are you worried for evolved in the Gambit? I mean, it didn't look like evolved's Gambit strategy was, was bad or anything. It just was, it, it was maybe slightly slower than Baldi's and slightly more struggles during the execution. But I still mm. think that's a map where I would have them favored over Dwarf this. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely, they're not, uh, unkillable in there for sure you've had a little bit of time anyway uh to rework that too if you wanted to maybe tweak a little bit of stuff here or say all right well we lost somebody at this point we need to make like tighten up and interrupt in this particular spot like it's almost kind of a benefit to have had that experience to then take into the series too isn't it yeah it was that was a i mean that was a weird series too you have to remember both teams played chicken and left court of stars on yeah. band. <laughs> i think a lot of things went wrong that series for for Revolve. They, I think they're a much stronger team than that series would lead you to believe, and I expect them to kind of show us that here, especially with the dungeon pool that we have, right? Necrotic Wake and Gambit are both blazing fast dungeons. They're, they're blinking, you'll miss it dungeons, pretty much. Yeah, even if we do go to all three dungeons, it could be a, a very, very fast series just by virtue of Gambit and then uh, Wake being in there, but uh, I'm glad we get to see another Wake. I, I feel like the pulls we see on Wake are some of the most entertaining ones we see in like all the dungeons, so I'm kind of hyped we get this one again, too. This could be like a 20-some-odd minute series, 25-minute yeah. series. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, there's some travel time in between the two dungeons, but in an in 11-minute a Wake into like a 15-minute Gambit or something like that is certainly within the cards. Right. We may not even make it to Streets. I think this is the only match of the day, too, where we have the chance to see the entirety of Tazavesh in the match, too. If I recall correctly. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Bands, not, like, maybe with the bands as well. Definitely, we, uh, if we get to go to get that game three and we get to do the whole Tazavesh, but it's in the wrong order as well, so. Yeah, it know, is backwards. The story is, oh. it's going to be hard for me to comprehend going in that order. <laughs> As a, as a big lore fan, it is tough to see, you know, Celia go down, you know, before the other parts of the dungeon. Right, and then she's referenced when wrong. we're fighting Soasmi at the end of uh, at the end of Streets, and just but we just we just killed Celia. I, I don't understand. So uh, yeah. I'm I'm mentally preparing myself to uh, suspend my disbelief when we get to that. We need some extra like chat commands in there to avoid the confusion. Be like, no, don't worry. This is we understand. It was just done this way. <laughs> Possible. Sorry, guys. We know. It's all wrong. <laughs> Everything. It's the Jailer's fault. He was behind it the entire time. My immersion. Yeah. Jailer? <laughs> That's right. Well, he's dead too now. Oh, no. Spoiler alert. I mean, he's kind of last boss. I mean, that's... <laughs> oh, oh <dead>. got him! <laughs> okay, right, you, listen. Want, you want an embarrassing fact? I don't even have AOTC yet. Rough regressing mythic jailers. Oh, oh, no. Wait, you guys never killed Heroic? Uh, 
It's bad for me to kill heroic. It's actually worse. Oh, because you heroic. want to trade weapons. Fair enough. Y y yeah. It's Let's go yeah. yeah. Understandable. I don't Carry have on. Odd, but understandable. I don't have ATC yeah. yet. Is the answer? Ooh. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, on that well. shame floor, Mark. Let's ignore it. Move into the dungeon here. See who takes number one. Wow, and we've got Blood Decay Holy Priest up against Vengeance Demon Hunter Resto Shaman here. Hmm. Blood Decay Holy Priest, definitely the uh, kind of the, the two most hyped up specs coming into this season uh, on the side of Evolve, but Dwarf this instead opting for the uh, for the Vengeance and that Resto Shaman. So I'm curious to see how this is all going to work out. A huge pull already underway for Evolve. Yeah, the Resto Shaman's been a very big safety pick for them, which just seems like the, what they're the most comfortable playing. And honestly, it's really not that bad of a choice, right? It's just a pretty solid healer overall. Obviously, it's a little bit less efficient than the Priest, but it can do a lot of good things, Curse Dispel being one of them. That is pretty nice. Unfortunately, no Curses in this dungeon. And uh, the damage comp from Evolved is going to be much, much better. As you can see, they were able to deal with all of that trash. And on top of that, get Blight Phone about 40% lower than where Dwarf did worth this half right now. Yeah, so much damage here coming out from Evolve. They're also using that uh, that Kyrian Warlock Shelly. He's been he's actually been busting out Kyrian in most dungeons from what I can see. Uh, he's finding ways to, to get that scouring type used on a lot of these boss encounters to keep that of extra damage. So uh, very cool to see the the value there and kind of that I think that intimate familiarity with the Warlock coming in big for uh, for Evolve. Well, this is another dungeon where you can get scouring tithe value on. Right ads for the first two bosses in the dungeon, right? So it's just a generally pretty safe pick, especially if you can get that good value. It becomes the best pick, because the buff you get from the Unity Legendary that gives you the carry-in effect is one of the strongest in the game. We're seeing Warlocks play with it on some of the fights in, in Sepulchre and doing kind of ridiculous damage, obviously. Yeah, although Dwarf is really not that far behind either. They're going to get Blightbone something like 30 seconds after Evolved did. They're also a little bit behind on count as Evolved are looking to open that lead even further, getting started with the Narzuda pull here, using that Anima exhaust to help carry it as well. You can just see on the damage meters just how much work the Kyrian weapons are putting in here. Do we have the double Marauders coming? Yes, there they are. We, I knew we had the one from the patrol in, but their healer did run and start to grab those two Marauders. Of course, they are going to be high on HP, but once these two shields are burned through, they'll pretty much deal all of their HP. Just gotta get both of them down. Yep, the Anima Exhaust uh, Orb is gonna help with that a lot. So, pretty clean execution from Evolved there. And I like the way that they did that. We've seen a lot of teams wait for the healer to pull those two Marauders into the pack before they start going. And that actually just wastes time. I like the way Evolved do, do that, because they know that that damage buff that they get from having the carrying in the group lasts long enough for them to burn through. Yeah, you. I mean, you don't need to damage those mobs at all, except for when they have the shield up, so... You don't need to have them in for 30 seconds of the pull. You just need them in for the four seconds that you are blasting when their shield's up. As they now get their second anima exhaust in one in less than like a minute, they're going to bring this all the way forward into... This looks like an Echo-style pull. Oh, this is the Echo pull. Running Wait. on in. Did Shelly get out? Okay, I don't think it's going to matter. Shelly did get in combat with something and proc his orb. He's going to have to run. Fortunately, they have the Woe Drifter buff. Ooh. He does get pretty low, but doesn't end up dying. That's Remember, he's playing, damage reduction as he's well, playing Kyrian. Him alive. He doesn't have Pod Tender, so that was really close, actually. But he has extra health potions because he's getting pretty nice. He's able to really use that, that damage absorb on him as well. Now they're getting in for that Echo style pour. They pull all the trash. Remember, they have three sets of relics in here as well to give them several buffs. You can see there's two Erdus Manthors alive. I think that was a third one that just came out, too. Man, they're going to have a lot of cooldown reduction here. Yeah, they one have a Vi Interceptor uh, hanging out over there. It'll get them a nice little extra bit of value, as long as it doesn't cause them too many problems by teleporting around and shooting them. Gotten most of the danger done of this pull so far. You can see a couple of corpses still shuffling on in here, but most of the danger is is now out of the way. I was thinking of that last Sorcerer taken care of. You can see that gets ripped in very nicely. And everything except for the boss itself now is basically taken care of. Amartha, 33%. Tyrannical 22, still a little bit of time left in this boss fight, but really not very much. They are almost ready to just go upstairs to the Necropolis, and I'm curious to see if they're going to go for the Echo style every single mob in the Necropolis all at once, because, I mean, that is the caliber of team that Evolved are hoping to challenge, and so far in this dungeon, at least, they've looked up to that, up to that level. I mean, it becomes a question of, do you practice how you play, or do you just want to take the, the safe win? I mean, you always have to be thinking about what you're going to do when you do get to Echo, and 
Match cut, match play for maps doesn't really come around that often. So knowing the evolved guys, knowing the experience they have, I'd say they're gonna go for it. I think I think this is just kind of one of those things that you you already have your backs to the wall in the lower bracket. You really need to prove to yourself that you're good enough to, to face to go against the best in the world. And uh, I don't know. Let's see if they're up for it here. Do they right, pull Alex. everything? Starts oh. off over to the right. He's gonna cast that control undead. There it goes. Has the loyal creation on his side now. And there's the misdirect. This does look like setting up for the whole thing. Yes, it is. That is every single mob in the necropolis is involved in this pull in one way or another. Mass grip is going to come out to as many as they can. Double knock there from. Is that two bronze? I think that was bronze, yes. The old bronze into <laughs> bronze. That was uh, a very nice little effect there. Good thing that didn't mess it up by moving anything out of any AoE. Now they're all just dead. Oh my god. Damage. Oh, the double mutilate coming out on Alex at the last second there, but not going to be too much of an issue. He is able to get that healing back up, and that was honestly, I think that went down even better than it did for Echo yesterday. Yeah. That was just pure perfection for them. Well, Echo, uh, Echo's Warlock potted during this. Shelly, oh, that's right. You know, he can't pod. He's uh, he's playing Carrion, so there's, uh, there's no margin for error. And that definitely sped things up to have all of their damage up the whole time. A little bit of weird stuff. Unfortunate cleavers there, the... both on the same person, which means that Alex has to soak one. You can see that means one of the assistants yep. is a little higher health there for Evolve. Yeah, that was a little bit unfortunate, but you know what? You know, they're, they're, again, they're not fortified mobs, so they can just go yeah. ahead and even them out pretty easily. That's maybe like you know a two or three second time loss huh. in the in the grand scheme of things. And the throw flush has come out. That was actually the third fleshcraft drop to the side that helped get that assistant very low. And hey, they did their geometry homework. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Here. They're actually just leaving that thing trapped out there, and it looks like basically off cooldown. Like whenever its cooldown for a cleaver is up, they're tagging it, letting it throw that cleaver, and then re CCing it, which is a little bit of a different strategy for it uh, than we've seen some teams use that kind of just let it come in and don't don't focus damage on it and just use its cleavers a little bit more YOLO. I do think it's important to mention that loyal creation being available to hit while nothing else is, is uh, while everything else is still going through its RP of spawning, is pretty useful for all of the classes in their group. Right? They can build combo points. They can build soul shards. They can you know help get their bombs off of cooldown from the survival hunter and get ready to do as much burst AOE damage as possible once this pull actually comes up and gore grind is available to hit. That those small little time saves are the things that set the good teams apart from the really good teams. Yeah, and that is definitely, definitely really, uh, really well planned out, actually, from Evolve. I think that their Necropolis is, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely looking, I don't even want to say on par, like, this this looks at least better than the Echo Necropolis we saw yesterday. Maybe only by a couple of small optimizations, but whenever you're in a conversation with Echo's run, and you're talking about small optimizations, instead of talking about being, like, four minutes behind, that is a really good place to be. And, and I again, I do think Evolved actually have the upper hand in this part of the dungeon. Do you know what Echo's overall necrotic wake time was? Actually, I'll, I'll go pull it up. If I remember properly, see. it was like an 11.58. It was right in the, it was 11.42, actually. It was just below that 12-minute okay. mark. And honestly, I think we're, we're kind of downplaying Dwarf this a little bit. They're on a great run themselves as well. Clean, zero deaths. But when you can talk about a team putting up a time that's similar to what Echo puts up, I mean, you have to pay attention to it. So right now, all eyes are on Evolved. Can their time compete or actually even beat what echo put together yesterday yeah and of course on a 22 tyrannical on a boss like stitch flesh they've just engaged here this is the boss that i wipe to the most when i'm doing m plus runs i don't know about you but something about this boss just gets the better of me from time to time uh, so we'll see if they're able to get this one sword because if they wipe dwarf this as you said absolutely are in position to potentially overtake uh, if they're not careful here so well you need to make sure that especially you know with with stuff like Kyrian weapon usage you use those sorts of weapons and then you die to the boss after pressing them and then you're in a position where you have to pull the boss again but you don't have them it is catastrophic committing again just the one spear here i don't think it hit the creation because the creation would be a lot lower if it did. So they, that's that's a little bit of an inconsistency. But as long as this meat hook goes off onto the boss here, they should be in totally fine position to uh, to get through to the next boss here quickly. And remember, the Bloodlust is coming up in 50 seconds. They still have, I believe, at least one spear as well as three hammers to deal with the final boss. And I, they also do have the Fleshcrafter off to the side, I believe. I think yeah, I saw that going trapped. on Shelley. They yeah. continue to just trap it and then break it when they want its cleaver because it's off uh, cooldown. Yes. You see it's casting right now. And now actually they're just letting it come in because now they can... Oh, the Shining Force. Might have been a mistake. 
Interesting, yeah. Shining Force into a fear, it looks like, on it. So it's running away just behind our, our camera now on Shelly's side. There we go. That was, a, that was a nice throw flush into the boss there. And, uh, oh, you know what? They might have yeah. actually just used a hammer to make sure it died at the yeah, last they second. Yeah, they did throw one hammer right at the end there. Just to make sure the boss didn't escape again. So that's going to make their last boss here a little bit slower. But, again, still very close to pace with Echo. Remember, 11.42, that mark to beat for Evolved here. Let's see if they're able to do it. Not even going to wait for the Fleshcraft to get in position. Just going to go in right away. The Bloodlust is available. The cooldowns are back up. You can see the Infernal's just about to be popped. Where's the Bloodlust? Come on, Hunter. There it is. All right. It's a race. Off to the races here. A minute and 12 seconds left to beat Echo's time. Yeah, Shelly throwing out those cast bolts. Got that scouring type on one of the relics as well, which is another really big point for Kyrian Warlock is you, you just get relics on every boss. Even yep. these ones like this that don't have uh, an actual ad component, you're at least getting two ads uh, in terms of the relic and then the automa. So uh, you can see Shelly, even though, you know, playing that Destro Lock is sort of renowned as a, an AoE specialist, actually the only DPS in the group to be beating the Kyrian weapons so far. Oh, wow, look they have the gateway tech set up. They have the gateway tech set up. They have the gateway tech set up. This is important. They can actually stop the Dark Exile from going off. If everyone clicks the gateway the second the boss starts casting Dark Exile, no one oh, will be was. available to get hit. And Shelly's managed to... I believe... Beautiful. Did he get it off? He did. He's still yes. on the platform. He's still on the platform. Wow. That, that is, is perfect I mean, tech. that's flawless. And look at this. 11.42, the time to beat. Now Thor shields itself again at 10% health. But I don't think it'll get another shield at this rate. They have another 10 seconds to beat this boss faster than Echo did. And I think that's exactly what is about to happen here. 5% left on the boss. There's that last cleaver. They, There's oh, they it. Need... They did. Yeah, no, is. they have the count. Their count's yep. already done. Evolved 11.39. Is Echo's time. And beaten Dwarf this in the series, which is a little more important, to be honest, but the time still beating Echo and Evolved going up 1-0 in the series. Wow. Yeah, wow indeed. Uh, you know, Tettles and I were talking about it a lot during the game. We're like, oh, they're going pretty fast. Are they actually going to have a chance to beat uh, Echo's time? And Tettles like, nah, I don't think so. And it's, <laughs> it's hard. But the thing is, it's, I'm not saying that to try to, like, you know, throw shade at Tettles or anything. Like, it's, it's hard to believe anyone was going to beat that time. And it was still really close, but they did do it uh, by, like, what, three seconds, didn't they? That's that's quite yeah. a start to the series. I forgot that Echo's supposed to be the Dark Horse at all give, at any given moment. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but I think it, it just proves, too, that, like, whenever we were talking about it before the series started, we were talking about how Evolved we were super hot on just as the casters coming into today. And while they are in the lower bracket right now, that 11.36 is, is the best time that we've seen across Necrotic Wake the whole entire weekend. It was better than Echo's time. And I think it just kind of proves that Evolved has a certain level of finesse in very specific dungeons where they can absolutely blast. Dwarf this didn't even look bad. They didn't really make any mistakes. They, they, they had a yeah. slightly worse strategy just on the whole. But if Evolved had a bad run and like a, a, a suboptimal strategy for the Necrotic Wake, I could see Dwarf this potentially taking it. This, this was really scary, by the way. Uh, whenever Shelly accidentally body pulled this pack with the um, Goliath Pulse, I, I thought that they were going to wipe. I don't know if you guys talked about this while you were casting, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was this... certainly rough. <laughs> Shelly got to like 10% health there for a while as well. It's it, scary. It, I, I think that it ended up working out because they were able to get like the Ur Dismantler killed off um, in record pace and they got just that pack dealt with um, pretty easily, but it was it was certainly very close to being a full team wipe. And then from there, um, Evolved, their full Necropolis pull on uh, this season, it looks really good with a Blood DK. Just the mass grip, just these grips and being able to get everything grouped up as fast as possible looks so much better than how sketchy it has the past couple of seasons. In addition to that, you saw the DK right at the beginning of that clip, Control Undead, that um, mob that does that Fervent Strike style ability and that just allows this pack to get absolutely melted the dk not even in fifth place in the damage meter he's somewhere in sixth getting beat by kyrian weapons <laughs> <laughs> everybody um and then it, like for dwarf this they looked good like i was talking about earlier they, they their strategies were just a little bit slower i think the lack of a priest really held them back they they had to do like the flesh crafter the corpse collector by itself and then they were just like doing this one pack at a time like look at this loyal creation flesh crafter pulled i this is just really really slow 
it's what they have to do with the, the strategies that they've implemented and the composition that they're bringing. And if they're like pushing a high key or if this is like a TGP style thing and they're going for the timer, great strategy. I don't think there's anything wrong with this. But I think whenever you're trying to compete versus an 11.30, Chronic Wake, yeah, it's, you're going to run into some issues. Yep, exactly. So at the end of the day, like uh, when it comes to MDI, is, is there going to be, you know, there is personal preference in terms of like what classes people play, but is there going to be like a definitively best comp for a dungeon that if you don't conform to this, you really have to like go the extra mile to make it work? Yeah, I, we've, we've seen metas come and go throughout plenty of seasons of MDI, but there almost always seems to be one class comp that the teams kind of gravitate to for different dungeons. There might be a splash here and there for a couple of dungeons, but usually teams will find a meta that works. Usually it's one of the top teams, and everyone else will be like, oh, that that looks like it's the best. We're going to copy that. And it really yeah, takes I mean, some innovation from people to try to come up with something that beats it. You have to, in order to, you have to actually like do something faster, right, with your own yeah. idea. There are teams that do that, like Incarnation did that a couple times where they were just like, hey, what if we just play like Arms Warrior Prop Paladin in this theater pain? Oh yeah, we can do it faster, Balance right? Through so it. You, you look at those sorts of things, and it's like, okay, this is a really cool idea, but those sorts of things require, they require innovators and they require time uh, to be able to practice those things. So yeah, generally once there's something that looks really good, uh, a meta does sort of solidify often in dungeons, but you know, we change the dungeons every week. We change the level. We change the affixes. Those create opportunities for the innovators to get a big edge uh, in this sort of tournament. Uh, I do think, though, for Necrotic Wick, a priest is almost always mandatory if you're looking to do like a, an absolute yeah. top level time just because of that flesh crafter stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, because when you mind control it and you can start the RP and then you can keep the flesh crafter, but otherwise you have to just kill it by itself beforehand. Definitely, mm -hmm. it's a it's a big time save to have one. We've even seen Chatter Priests when teams have wanted to not use a. Uh, healing priest in that dungeon in previous seasons yeah it's true i mean when it comes down to it too it's like you're saying like I, I feel like the time is the biggest factor where it's like you could either practice something new to see if maybe it's better or you could just get even better at the thing that's already like been established to be good you know so it's when you only have like a week to prepare sometimes or you have a limited amount of time to prepare um, you know, people have things going on in their personal lives like you you probably don't want to spend a lot of time innovating if you don't have to Surf Hunter and Destro Lock both look really, really solid this season. Yeah. Um, and then H Priest, of course, is also incredibly good. Um, Our Shaman looks good in some situations, but I don't think it's for Necrotic Wake. And then I, I think like the, the fifth DPS or the third DPS slot, um, like the fifth player slot, and then like the tank roll, I think th those are two are the most flexible, at least in regards to like what you're going to see in class way. compositionally. A lot of last season, we actually saw like a physical damage comp with like a prot warrior and stuff like that brought to a couple of dungeons where you really wanted like a, a battle shout buff. It was like a missed a tier sight special kind of thing. But this season, it seems like it's a little bit more rigid compositionally with the Surf Hunter and the Destro Lock being as good as they are. Mm -hmm. And as the expansion kind of like goes on, that might get more established in lieu of like patch notes coming in of course like changing things but you know over time you know the longer something goes the more meta is kind of like the more the meta is kind of like set up right but the question is with with gambit this this end up this might end up being a very short a very very short series but dwarf this i don't know i don't know what you do at this point to to try to get back into it you have to like hope maybe evolve makes a mistake that seems to be the the most likely scenario where Dwarf this takes a map because routing wise yeah. it seems like Evolve is right there. It's it's tough to really find a way to talk about Dwarf this kind of getting back into the series despite being obviously a great team. I, I don't think you want to try something crazy if you're Dwarf this. I think you want to stick with the plan you've got, and there is a solid chance that any team in Gambit will run it down in the Murloc area, right? And we'll, we'll get like 20 deaths in that area. So yeah. you, you just want to be playing to be able to beat that eventuality. And then also, you know, if you have a good clean run, who knows what else could happen, right? This is a, a dungeon that has multiple pretty tricky areas. That second boss uh, can get you. Although Lepan from Evolved, or from, uh, Lepan and Evolved? No, Lepan was on Baldi. Lepan from Baldi looked like he had that boss really on, um, on lock. So teams copy exactly the way that he was positioning that thing. I think that's a, the good way to do it, just keeping it basically in that far corner the whole time, sniping from afar. Yep, just had it downloaded. It was per, uh, They played it really well. And I mean, you have to look, at, if you look, go back and look at the time trial times, um, Dwarfus doesn't really have a bad time in this dungeon. They were only a minute and change behind where Evolved were. So honestly, if they just play a clean dungeon and Evolved continues to have the issues they've been having in this dungeon today, 
uh, they could potentially take this dungeon and give us a good series here. I remember Evolved looked... I mean, I don't want to be rude. They looked a little bit lost against Baldi, right? They they mistimed their, their Woe Drifter buff. They were slow in the Murloc area. There were a lot of issues there, so... Maybe maybe it could be a, a three-game series here. They've had some time to fix that since the it, game against Baldi, though. It comes down to how good the Dwarf this uh, Gambit is, though. Yeah, I mean, it's it all depends on a couple different things, right? Evolved, at least, you know, like we said earlier, they can use that learning experience, we'll call it, from earlier in the day to inform what they're going to do on this one, what they're going to change up and all that. Um, and, you know... Dwarf This had a chance to see that, too, and say, all right, well, we want to do our route this way. Uh, no doubt they already had a plan going into it, but you can always make those little last-minute tweaks if you really need to, so it is nice to kind of have that time. But we'll see. Lore appropriate or not, we're doing Gambit first, and if we need a map three, it's going to be Tazvash Streets. This is how, uh, whenever we do, whenever I'm doing keys... You know, if I do the see what everybody's keys in the group are, and like somebody's got a gambit and somebody's got a streets, I was like, yeah, let's do the gambit first, and then, you know, if we want to do more after, we can do the streets, and and then we just we just keep running the gambit. Gambit's uh, <laughs> gambit's my favorite dungeon right now. Gambit's a great this one's dungeon. so fun. Yeah. Yep. The boss fights are fun. It's short and sweet. You get big AOE packs. You get fun mechanics and all that. I really enjoy uh, Salia actually as a boss fight in the end. I I know it's like the pug killer sometimes, but. It's a ton of fun once yeah. you learn it. Yeah. On the high tyrannical, when it, it's like an eight-minute fight, I, I start to, you know, it's a, it's a bit long. But other than that, I, I think it's a really cool encounter as well. As we are underway now, Evolved and Dwarf This both are getting a Goliath in with a huge pull over on the left. And they are blasting damage here with that Warlock survival combo. Man, look at the damage meters here. Two nerfed classes, both doing over 250k DPS, destroying everything they pulled for Evolved. Slightly smaller pull from Dwarf This, so the numbers aren't quite as high, but still putting out impressive numbers here. But we're already off the bat, the 11%, 12% now trash percentage advantage for Evolved here. Already opened up the gap from the get-go in this dungeon. And again, yeah, Kyrian for Shelly. Yeah, again, he, he plays that... It seems like he's playing that in most dungeons from what I can see, but this one was the first one that I saw a Kyrian Warlock in, and it seems like one of the best ones, right? You think all three bosses have adds that spawn, and even Solia, who doesn't spawn adds during P2, you can pull in one of the packs before Solia during that encounter uh, during P2 and, and get value out of it there, too. So, I actually... The, the rationale behind playing Kyrian is very interesting. I think it's actually a pretty solid choice. So the nerf that they made to Inferno a little while ago, uh, actually it was last week, where they made it so that the, your targets hit by Reign of Fire, the, the chances that you get Soul Shards from your Reign of Fire past five targets are severely diminished. That really bit into the sort of positive feedback loop that you could get into as a Destro Warlock, where you could find yourself just spam, spamming Reign of Fires. Uh, that Kyrian buff that you get with the Legendary actually helps a lot with that. Remember, if you're Scouring Tithe, kills a target. If, if a target dies with your Scouring Tithe on it, you get five Soul Shards. Back. That's an extra Reign of Fire just for free, which can which can give you three shards towards your four set proc. So just having that one extra Reign of Fire cast on board and then having two thirds of another Reign of Cast just helps you start that feedback loop even further, which is still possible even after the nerf. It's just a lot harder to get to the point where you can sustain it as a Destro Lock now. Yeah, and Dwarf this have actually caught a little bit back into the lead here, potentially, or tying things up at the very least. Both teams now on 38% count, but Dwarf this still killing more enemies, whereas on the side of Evolved, it's actually a player going down. They are on their three deaths now. 15 seconds of penalty will be added at the end of the dungeon to them. They are going to keep on going, though, getting their next pull together. I'll dwarf this. Also looking to start something Oh, new. no, Shelly down! Oh, That's no. huge! That was his Infernal committed as well. That's a big, big cooldown. Remember, three minutes. Obviously, they're using Wilfred's to reduce the cooldown of it, but that's just such a big commitment, right? That's 30 seconds of Reign of Chaos again. That's his oh, entire no. Reign of Chaos buff gone. Another death on your Rogue now. It is all purely on the Hunter right now. There is no single target lockdown from any of the other characters. The Rogue is not helping. It's a Hunter or nothing. The tank going down as well is going to be a problem. This is just going to be a full team wipe. They need to wipe it up and go again. There's, there's yes. no recovering from this. That's six extra deaths on the board. And and wow. with the way that Dwarf This have been playing, that might be all they need. If Dwarf This can have a clean run from here, I think they can shut the door based just off of this. But Evolved have to keep it going because Dwarf This, there's, of course, no guarantee that their run will be perfectly clean from this point either. Still, 48% trash count, now 49 for Dwarf This. Once we see 53, 
that is when they are good to go to the boss. And I believe these last three Murlocs may take us over that finish line. And we'll see. There's 51. 54. Oh, yep, 54. Ready. There it is. Okay. And they we have the Drifter here. buff too. Yeah, they're good to go. They're going to head on down to the first boss. Evolved still picking up the pieces of their wipe earlier on. This is... This is going to be a rough dungeon for Evolved because we know they have the higher DPS numbers and the more strategic pulls, but if you lose entire pulls plus 45 seconds of death timers, how are you supposed to come back in this dungeon? I mean, yeah, they'll have I mean, to play out of their minds, right? We're only four minutes into this thing, but there's really not that many big open pulls left in this dungeon. I mean, there's that question of how you're handling the second boss room, and to a lesser extent, how you're handling the third boss room, but realistically, that answer will only ever differ by, like, one pull between the two teams. And at this point, mm -hmm. Morphus have a sizable lead. I mean, they are already working on this boss. They have almost a minute of death timer in their favor. I mean, this is this is a huge lead for Dwarf this, this early on, and Evolved just need to keep their heads down, keep doing their thing, uh, and try and claw this back, but I think we probably, for Evolved to win this game, they are going to need something to go wrong for Dwarf this. They, I don't think they're in range to do it just with more damage at this point. I mean, it would have to be it would have to be the a most lot more ridiculous damage, damage we'd, we've ever seen. Now, they do have a little bit of a better comp for them, right? <laughs> We were talking yeah. about this last dungeon. The Blood Decay Holy Priest comp is definitely way better for single target damage. I don't think it's enough, though, right? It's just they, they've put themselves probably in, I don't know, a minute to a minute and a half hole here. We're going to definitely see once this boss goes down for both teams where the difference is. But yeah, they are very far behind right now. Yeah, and it's such a short dungeon as well that... You know, they're already done with more than half the trash here. The first of only three bosses nearly dead as well for Dwarf This. But, I mean, yeah, zero deaths in the Murloc area for Dwarf This as well. It's, it's so impressive. Like, the number of teams in the world that can ever do a Murloc area on plus 24 fortified uh, without any deaths, especially when you throw an explosive and raging uh, into the mix, is vanishingly small. So Dwarf This should be hugely proud of that, no matter what happens in the rest of this game or series, but they are not interested in uh, in that sort of thing. They are interested in securing this win and going forward to Sunday. So that needs to start here. They need to keep the pressure on in this dungeon. Yeah, I feel like we aren't really giving uh, the affix combo enough credit here. <laughs> There's a reason Fortified and Raging are never put together in my balance combinations. Right. They, you just, you don't. You don't deal I with think, that. I think they did that for like one season and were like, oh, yeah. this is too mean. Yeah, Shouldn't let's uh, do that. Let's let's it's like when you're uh, when you're in school and just, you know, the two, two pupils that are, are diligent and studious on their own. But then when you sit next to each other, they're just goofing around all the time. That's those two affixes. You got to separate them. So like fire their up own and sides of the room. Yeah, exactly. Fired up and Shakib. A great example <laughs> of what happens when you do not separate those people. <laughs> Well, one of the things that Evolved could do here to put themselves in a good position to start coming back is to beat the second orb cycle on this boss. It's a fortified key. The bosses are a little bit less tanky than they normally are. Keep an eye on that energy bar at the bottom of Hillbrand's health bar there. If that gets to a full health bar, the boss will go immune and they'll have to deal with an extra intermission phase, and that would be a big time loss. So they're trying to do as much damage as possible right now, even CCing the adds on this fight to make sure that they can do as much single target damage as possible and holding the boss to the side of the room because he's going to run to the center of the room when it gets fully HP. Can they get it oh. off? No, the boss is immune, so they now have no. to do an entire intermission phase. That's going to cost them another 20 seconds when they really don't have any time to give. Look at the it's, boss. It's more than 20 as well them. because they left these ads alive. Oh, no. Just tunneling boss, which means they have to kill those ads before they can deposit these runes into the consoles. Oh, and we actually have a missed rune as well. It needs to be re-delivered to the correct console. So yeah, Evolved losing so much time here. Meanwhile, Dwarf This already getting started on the Pirates in this area towards the second boss. They have eight mobs, it looks like, plus an Ur Dismantler. Is that eight? Have they gotten it right? They have finally gotten the orbs in. This is where we know how far behind Evolved are. Look at that. They're a minute 46 behind in pure dungeon timer, but then you also have to factor in the 45 second death timer. Dreadnoughts, they're two and a half minutes behind right now. That is... Yeah, that that is a lot of minutes. That That's an insurmountable minutes than you want to be right behind. Now. Yeah, I mean, it, it is required now. At this point, for Evolved to win, they are going to need a full wipe from Dwarf This, I think. There's no amount of, oh, we, do, we you know we, we have this optimization, we do a little bit more damage as a comp, right? It's going to bring back two and a half minutes in the last, what, five minutes of this dungeon, although we do have a pod tender coming out for Dwarf This. 
That that's not good. It's, you know, that's why you play pod tender though, right? So you uh, you only go into the eight seconds of being in a pod rather than uh, dying, needing to get rezzed or run back. You know, Drenos, uh, it might be for Richard this week. <laughs> Could, couldn't be me. I've been pushing keys all week, didn't pay attention to the affixes. <laughs> That's okay. Raging isn't a DPS affix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, That's a, a healer uh, affix. If I take raging a, damage, heal me. That was a, a pop quiz chat. Congratulations. A surprise secret pop quiz. You passed. You passed. Well done. Good job, chat. Pat yourself on Look the at back. this. Or if this actually have this boss tanked in this uh, in this corner of the room, the far corner of the room. I like this place so much for tanking the boss. Gives you such a wide arc uh, on the breath as it's landing on where the adds are. That makes it so easy to actually hit all them. Beautiful sigil of misery as well, coming in from Lunty, keeping them all grouped together. They are forced out of this spot now as those cannons are just being very hostile on where those bombardments are spawning. They do nearly have the Ur killed here. That boss still has a lot of HP. Evolved are getting down into this boss room as well. They can pull really big here. Maybe that can be Oh, they're the going game. for it. Yeah, I mean, they've got every single thing except for one Tide Sage all pulled right now. This is a huge pull. This is so scary. This is a big pull. And remember, once they get into Raging Range, uh, their tank, I don't think their tank should be anywhere near these mobs. But the problem with that is then the, uh, the, the proxy targets would just kill the rogue. So what do you do at this point? They're gonna have to kite their tank. Their tank can't tank all those raging mobs. Yeah, I mean, maybe oh, you just see. pop evasion and stand next to them. Because I'm pretty sure you can. That, that's just what you have to do. Maybe, yeah. Oh, the life grip's actually gonna come out as well to help facilitate the kite. Yeah, those are scary, scary raging deckhands there. Looks like well, they're bad. being kidneyed though and controlled a little bit. This is starting to take quite a while though to mop up the the dregs of this pull. That's one of the things about doing these sorts of big, ambitious pull combinations is. It seems like it saves you a lot of time to do so, but if you end up kiting the last 30 seconds of the pull, you know, maybe it's faster to just do a chain pull instead or to uh, or to even separate into two pulls that are safe enough that you don't have to worry about committing globals to defense. Yeah, I mean, to be honest though, it did work out for them and they were able to spend some of that, t that time kiting just pulling the yeah. boss and getting the boss into position. So it didn't seem too bad in the general scheme of things. They do have that one Tide Sage just gonna interrupt it and cleave it down with the boss. They probably have made up a pretty solid amount of time here. Again, we'll have to take a look at the boss splits after the fact to see how much time they've made up. But, you know, I would guess that they probably made up about 45 seconds to a minute of the time here, but that's still almost two minutes that they have to make up in this last, last section of the dungeon. I agree with what you said earlier. Evolved is pretty much going to need Dwarf this to make some major mistake, be it a boss wipe or a pretty nasty trash wipe, in order to come back in this dungeon. Remember, a trash wipe in the final section of this dungeon, if you don't have a free soul stone out or the onk on your shaman to res everybody, you have to run back through every single portal, go through all those load screens just to get back to where you were. So it would be pretty bad if a wipe happens in this last, last section of the dungeon. Yeah, so Dwarf this, they do have their Ankh, they do have all of their battle reses, they don't have Last Resort or Pod Tender though, so those are some resources uh, that prevent wipes that they are currently exhausted on. However, those will, oh, there's, that's going to be the Ankh as well. Okay, so another, another part of the puzzle for how Evolved could get back into this is that Ankh being used right there. Uh, so that is something that is rough for Dwarf. Oh, look how see low the big they damage are. on the group. Conage going down. They do have the Spirit Link Totem there. But now the whole thing oh, no. actually is starting to no take onk. these. And they have no Ankh anymore. They do have Battle Res. They need to get that Soul Stone up, but they're not able to. And they all have to release. And they now have to run all the way back through that second boss section. And all of that crash is still alive as well. They did kill the Earth, the Dismantler. So there's not going to be a encrypted affix to deal with in that pack. But I think Evolved are right back in this now. They are literally right back in this. They're going to be killing the boss as all five of the players of Porthis are running through that portal. The only thing separating these two teams is going to be the three death timers and the RP that Evolved are going to have to wait for for this portal to spawn. This is going to be a neck and neck finish. It's going to come down to the DPS. That is insane. Yeah, it's something that is uh, is so... It's going to be such a tight ending to this dungeon here. See, it looks like Lunty having some some trouble using the... Uh, yeah, using the, the portal there. They're going to have to actually use the Ritual of Summoning to get him pulled up into this uh, later part of the dungeon there. Meanwhile, Evolved also 
walking on down towards their first pull. Let's see if they're able to make this happen and not end up wiping to this. They do have that mass grip, which can be really nice for you. Yeah, you can see right on pull being deployed to get everything all within the AoE stuns and the AoE crowd control and the AoE damage as well. A lot of important casts here. That unstable rift in particular is one that will just start killing people if you let it go off. The Hyperlight bolts as well, also pretty deadly, uh, but less of an interrupt priority. And then, of course, there are some heals that you want to stop if you want this pull to ever end. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, if one person goes down, especially if it's one of your main interrupters, that just sets, right. up, sets off a cascade of casts going off, and that's what happened to Dwarf this earlier. Evolved having no issues so far, and Dwarf this doing a pretty good uh, job on their second attempt, but the time loss that Dwarf just this went, Dwarf this just went through is... Uh, it's pretty hard to come back from that. Evolved had all their cooldowns ready for this pull, and they've now pulled back ahead on the trash count now. Yes, it is worth noting that there are 15 seconds still of death differential in favor of Dwarf This. So when we get to the end of the dungeon, I, I suspect this one might come down to that photo finish. We'll see if they're able to keep within 15 seconds of where Evolved are at with those extra deaths they had in the Murloc area to potentially still yoink this one at the end. But... Oh, this is going to be so, so close. So much is going to come down to just who can do more damage to Solia, which is my favorite way for an MDI dungeon to end. Travis, did we even mention that Dwarf has committed their loss to that pull as well that they wiped up? That, well, that is a huge time loss. That, okay, that is, I, that's rough. I had noticed that, yes. I was just, I was waiting for you to, to mention that. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to give oh, you thank, another another good point to make. Okay, um, thank but you yeah, for letting me so that, that out. That means that Evolved get the lust on the last boss and Dwarf this don't have it. So that's that probably represents another 10 seconds or so worth of value of, of damage of the single target lust here that Evolved will get to bring on Solia. They will probably wait uh, to use it until they do that first Hyperlight Jolt of EQ, if I had to guess. But we'll see how they decide to attack this. They are getting those assassins in here. A lot of mobs in combat here. They still have that Star Seer with the Pulsar and those drifting stars they need to dodge. Yep. Just gotta make sure you don't get slammed in the face by one of those drifting stars. That could, uh, that could be bad. It's not tyrannical. I'm not gonna one shot you, but still. Actually, you have to go with the Vi rather than the oh, Earth. The pure, uh, that makes sense, though, right? It's it's the pure single target damage that's gonna come out from Vi. Ur definitely would give you an extra use of cooldowns in this boss, more than likely because of how long Celia is. But uh, maybe the Vi is just the consistent choice that they had in practice that made that made more sense to them. 45% on Solia, nearly done with phase one, are evolved here. You can see they're at 96% count. They are going to go and grab those last three mobs and bring them in with the boss at this point uh, in order to have something to, well, first of all, just something efficient to damage during this immune phase of the boss. But second of all, this gives them continued adds during a phase that doesn't spawn adds naturally, and they can get resources off that. Uh, mostly from their Warlock, right? Having targets to put extra emulates onto and having targets that are going to die that you can cast Scouring Type on. They still have these Assassins alive from yeah. one as well. Oh, That's no. not good. Ooh, an Angel coming out from Bazook, but of course making sure he instantly cancels or is that so nobody can take a screenshot and they get the battle res off quickly. Very now good Alex play from down. him. But Alex going down is a huge problem. They don't have anybody alive that can battle res him without a knife. With Shelly down as well, this might be a wipe for Evolve. And Soda gets shot as well with one of those Hyperlight Bolts. There is that Battle Res coming out from the Zook. But are they going to take this Battle Res or are they just going to all die here? It looks like instead they're going to hold on to that Battle Res. And now the ball is back in Dwarf This's court. Dwarf This at 100% trash count. They've just started Solia Phase 2. If they can kill this boss on this pull, no matter what the state of that kill is, no matter if it's fast or if four of them die right now and their Demon Hunter takes it over the finish line, they are going to be able to beat Evolved off of that disastrous wipe. Okay, I don't, I don't know if their Demon Hunter can still load the rest of it. Yeah, their Demon Hunter can still load from here. <laughs> yeah, you sure. probably could, but it would be fast enough, right? <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe they need two people to stay alive. Okay, Any okay. Two. Two, two people, I believe. Yeah. Two people. Yeah, I agree with two people. Yeah, you can see 60% now on Solia. Evolved, wasting no time to get started with the fight again, but. They are just relying on a wipe for Dwarf This from Dwarf This at this point. And I don't don't think that's particularly likely. Dwarf This do not seem like the kind of team that just that wipes to boss encounters that don't have any trash or anything on them, which is what Solia is to, to them right now. You know, they pulled this boss less aggressively than Evolved did. They didn't pull trash onto it, which was part of what caused the problem for Evolved. Oh, yeah. We see for Evolved another death already coming in. 
that's going to cost them their battle res to evolve now have no battle reses meanwhile dwarf this sitting pretty with two battle reses still in the tank wow i mean they got the fire interceptor down again but at the cost of another player i mean that's really unfortunate no cheat death available for a long time as well i mean they just have they're gonna somehow have to make this trash car work and then also pull just a ton of dps out of nowhere because dwarfs have the boss down to 20 percent. there's just no way there's you know, no way for no evolve to get this one six. back it's it's no it's chance mathematically impossible at this point no way dwarf this could wipe from here they are going to do this last star as well they're going to drop the squirreling totem just for some safety you know you've got that button may as well press it Thinking about doing another charge of that star. Ooh, gotta be careful, but they've done a good job of that. 10% left on Solia for Dwarf this to equalize the series. And against such a team like Evolved, this is going to be a huge morale boost for Dwarf this. A team that met up in LFG as well. And they are now taking a game off of Evolved, one of the strongest teams we've seen in this MBI group. There's that next Hyperlite tool. Ooh, two stacks actually going on the healer there. He was in two of the lines, but that's not going to stop Dwarf this as they take the game and equalize the series. Man, okay, so this is pre-recorded, right? So we're going to take this, then we're going to do the streets before this, whenever we actually broadcast this. <laughs> we went to right, exactly. Sure, yeah, we, sure. we got to do them in the correct order of the story purposes. Okay, because perfect. We are going to be going to the other Tazavesh next. Tazavesh Streets. Yeah, the prequel. <laughs> Yeah. Y'all are so dumb. There you go. <laughs> Everybody loves prequels, right? I mean, they're pretty popular these days and you know, for a while. Yep. But yeah, I mean, prequels have never gone badly that I can remember. It's always been great. It's always been the most loved part of a long franchise, pretty sure. But uh, Dwarf this certainly loving to get a win on the Gambit. And I, I kind of am starting to think that like this dungeon is uh, Evolve's Kryptonite. Just so the way things went, both times so far for them, um, good team. So we got a, it's a weakened rough. best necrotic wake into the that gambit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Involved. Dwarf this um, in their necrotic wake, they looked really good. Their gambit had had a couple of issues. Like obviously they had that full wipe to that um, that collapsing star or that star pack with the pulsar pulsing and killing everybody. I I do think that overall dwarf this. They looked fairly competitive, and they're able to capitalize on any mistakes that Evolved makes. Evolved needs to stay away from Gambit, I think, is what I've learned from this. They're... Yeah. I hate their first pull. I don't know what you guys think, uh, Dretness and Zyro, but I think this first pull is just not it. For Evolved? I mean, the first pull went okay, right? It was like the second and third pulls where the wheels started falling off the wagon, right? They lost this, three it's members this giant, to this pull. You know? Well, they okay, lost yeah, three so people to this giant. This giant... Yeah, look, yes. I mean, look how low health it is, though, as it's casting this stop. Uh, <laughs> nearly. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it's... Yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to, hard to evaluate exactly how to do this area. I mean, this is something that, of course, it's yeah. the first season we've had this dungeon in MDI, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what what is the meta for this dungeon? We're finding out right now, right? We're uh, The teams are going to take a look at what everybody has done in this dungeon over this weekend, and... I imagine that uh, they'll have this sort of menu of options next time, and maybe there will be some practice that kind of shows, okay, this is just pretty consistently better. But as of right now, everybody was just going in here and trying yeah. whatever they thought looked good. But, I mean, yeah, you could see, I think that was a Woe Drifter burst even. Yeah, it was. Explosives plus Woe Drifter burst that, that come out here is just so many things you need to stop from killing your group, plus all of that Murloc nonsense that you have to deal with. So, yeah, they, they have 10... They have the... Uh... 10 explosives into a woe drifter burst into like a just the tank ends up dying because the pack is taking infinitely long and then this this was the saddest thing ever Aww. so they were super smart they moved the boss off to the side so he would have to walk all the way to the middle before he started his intermission channel but they just missed by one percent and then they have to kill the ads and they take like a that's like a 45 second time loss of what just happened there. And it was looking like it was just going to be a clean run from Dwarf this. They have zero deaths up until this point, by the way, just for context. They have zero deaths up until this point. Uh, they lose their healer. He insta onks. It, it looks like it's going to be okay. Then the hunter dies. There's an explosive that goes off to the side because you see that trash pack. That patrol is in combat. The explosives are just spawning. Uh, they're, they're killing off people. Then the rest of the group gets hit by the frontal from the star... star... Starseer, I think it is. Starseer, Seer? yeah, Starseer, yeah. Doran Starseer, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. There you go. That's the name of that mob, and it's. I mean, that, that didn't look great for Dwarf this, but at the end of the day, they were able to bring it home just with uh, a little bit more consistent play. Their Murloc area was just 
a lot more clean, I think was the big takeaway from that. Yeah. Uh, unless you just don't see that frontal on the stars here, which which does happen all the time, right? It is very difficult to see sometimes. But if you, I feel like if you can get through the Murloc area cleanly, most teams are going to finish the rest of it fairly cleanly too, with maybe a little bit of stress on the on Hooktail. But uh, aside from that, like it's that Murloc area that seems to kind of make or break teams. I have a little quick tip. I'm I'm kind of feeling bad about this because oh. I should have, should have saved this for one of the uh, Titan Forge podcast quick tips in the future, but. <laughs> If you focus the mob that does the frontals, there's, there'll be a little circle underneath the character and you can see which way the mob is facing. So regardless of who it turns to, if you pay attention to that and you see the little point on the circle underneath the mob, you can see, you can see exactly where that drifting star is gonna go. Yeah, this is just That's a good true. tip for any mob that is, especially mobs that are like not humanoid that look in a certain direction, just having them targeted and looking that circle under their feet, that little arrow, always the uh, direction they're facing. So very good one, Zyro. Nice Thank tip. you. <laughs> nice tip. Smile. This, who says MDI isn't educational? Nobody, that's who. Well, it's time to take it to the streets. The Tazavesh streets, specifically. As we'll find out who moves on, who gets eliminated. Will it be evolved or dwarf this? Um, you know, it is another Tazavesh dungeon. But, uh, you know, evolved still looking favored here? What do you think? I, yes. I think so, and I think this is a very scary position for both of these teams. So Evolved was the, was the seventh seed coming into the weekend, where Dwarf this was the thirteenth seed. And this is a a map that basically one or two mistakes can cost you your whole entire tournament life, and then at that point there is the last chance uh, qualifier tournament and stuff like that that we have. Yeah. But you don't want to you don't want to go through that. You would rather just win out the weekend. There's going to be so many good teams in that tournament in the last chance qualifier. Like you you don't want to oh, yeah. descend into that like madness like thunderdome of a tournament well i think it'll be fun to watch don't oh it'll be fun that. for us yeah <laughs> yeah i love yeah i don't want the yeah, stress, sign me up <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we'll we'll be enjoying ourselves thoroughly the the teams in the tournament maybe maybe not as much so. they, they would prefer to qualify and also get to watch that tournament yeah yeah i think so i'm pretty sure yeah well, that dwarf face looks even more intense the longer we go in this series Maybe a bit of concern emerging on the dwarf face as well, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how Streets goes. Yeah, tyrannical inspiring quaking in here as well. The Keystone mm -hmm. level only 22, but these affixes are still nasty ones in a dungeon like this. Tyrannical as well in a five boss dungeon. Uh, it, it turns this into a real marathon and especially coming at the end of a series rather than at the start, right? This means that these teams, I mean, they've been gaming now uh, two dungeons that have needed to be full focus and that have had different affixes. They've been potentially on different characters for. This is going to be a huge test of the team's fortitude and their uh, their mental as well as their, you know, their strategies. I think part of it too is that like uh, how, how familiar are all these teams with the inspired mobs on this dungeon, right? I mean, it's again, it's fairly new compared to a lot of other ones. Uh, you, they've had time to practice, but it's you're not going to come into it with as much practice for those specific packs as you would with some other ones. Yeah, because it was not inspired in the time trials, right? So mm -hmm. this is a dungeon where they're like, okay, this was a time trial dungeon. We're only playing it once in the tournament, and it's a game five of a lower bracket or something. Let's not practice it too much and just run our time trial strat. Oh, that pack hasn't inspired in it now. Oh no! I can, uh -oh. I can foresee. I can see the, the first, future, and that is a potential the first path we might walk down. Dude, like the first uh, couple of pulls of the dungeon, there's just like an inspired mob, and you're like, "Wait, I didn't practice for this." Hold <laughs> on. This is not what I expected. Yeah. Well, Saronic, like, does dwarf this just kind of have to hope evolves, makes mistakes? They have to hope that evolve finds some way to creatively wipe. And then try to take advantage of that? Or do you think they can straight I mean, up race? Honestly, I don't know. This is such a tough dungeon. It's a 22 tyrannical dungeon with five bosses, right? Tyrannical plus yeah. five bosses historically is something that is setting you up for a long dungeon in general. I mean, Echo took 18 and a half minutes to do this dungeon earlier. So I, I think there's a lot of room to just play safe. And that kind of seems to be what Dwarf This is style is just go for very safe pulls. If we see the same evolve we saw on Gambit. I could 100% see Dwarf, Dwarf is taking this game and moving on in the lower bracket. Well, here's the Tazavesh Streets data from the live server. Thanks again to Raider IO for providing this for us. Uh, you can see 29 minutes, 14 seconds is the fastest. We've obviously seen that record blown out of the water already. <laughs> we got Echo doing like 18 minutes, right? Um, but it's, it's still a dungeon to be taken seriously, for sure. 
oh, yeah. 29 minutes, 14 seconds fastest on the live servers. Definitely a uh, a dungeon that has a lot of length to it. There's a lot of different <laughs> options as well for how you want to attack this, whether you want to go left or right after the first boss as well. I've seen the teams generally choosing that kind of right side path with, with AoE pulls and stuff, right? But uh, I wonder if there's ever any opportunity to, to go left instead. You know, do something different. I, I think probably not in MDI, right? Mini boss style gameplay, especially with these comps. Not what you're after, but yeah. It's yeah. just weird because there's a there's a lot of unforeseen tech that's in this dungeon. Whether right. it be that menagerie boss with like the Goliath killing position, whether it be snapping that um, enforcer mob that gives that AOE, or gives that uh, like enrage to the to the final boss that we saw from Echo earlier. That was absolutely crazy. Whenever we saw that, I think that there's a lot of um, evolution that we can see happen in Tazavesh Streets because it's not super clear-cut what you're supposed to be doing. There's a lot of backtracking that is also involved here, and hey, optimizing your Woe Drifter movement is super important as well. Oh yeah, cleanly dealing with that bizarre to unlock the Oasis is definitely something that the teams will have had to practice, right? Because that means your healer is not going to be with the group for a pretty significant amount of time in the dungeon, and knowing what you can get away with when your healer isn't there is uh, something you need to be practiced on. Dratnus, meet me in the streets. Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. Evolved and dwarf this. The winner of this game stays and plays tomorrow. The loser is going home as the first pull of the dungeon is underway. Everyone know the fights don't happen in the streets. They happen in the parking lot. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little different. I think it's where a little they are different. right now is the parking lot, right? The, the barge just flew us here from Oribos. So, and they are fighting here, so it checks out. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, you're 100% you're right. Man, this this first pull, though, is going to be, I think, something that sets the bar for the rest of the dungeon. Can the teams pull off this massive Echo pull? Dwarf this? Are oh. they going for the same size pull? They don't have one of the trash packs in there that Echo got, but look at how low the health bars are. They do have the mini boss in there. Spirit Link already coming out just to stabilize. Once they get the Dismantler dead, they should be pretty safe, but they have a lot of HP to chew through here. Yeah, a lot of damage coming out. They need to watch out for those beam splicers rotating around on the floor as well plus all of these blasts coming out from the portals at them, plus all of the grenades that are being thrown at them by all of the mobs. A lot of fancy footwork required here from Dwarf Fizz. They've done a good job so far. They have most of these enemies cleaned up. Meanwhile, Evolve, also on this pool, they are a little bit slow oh, in getting this all sorted, and not all of the enemies actually are in already, so slightly different plan here. Let's see if Evolve have a way to speed this back up. Yeah, and important there, Shelly is back on the Night Fae Warlock, Look at this. so he does have Dreamweaver available to him. Evolved were mind-controlling something there. I wonder what for. They were mind-controlling the interrogation specialist. I wonder if they got it to cast something cool. Maybe because it was inspired, but Maybe, they're just yeah. significantly behind now, because they have to deal with a single-target May boss. Wow. Yeah, uh, whereas Dwarf is already on the boss. 9% trash ahead, already on the boss. Wow. Already off the bat, Dwarf this opening up an advantage. Now, important. Dwarf this didn't get their bloodlust to that hole. Evolved still has theirs available. I would imagine that Evolved are going to be popping that bloodlust the second they engage the boss with the double relic facts. Yeah, I think that is going to be the plan for Evolved, but you can see things are really slowing down here. I mean, this hole is lasting so long for them on the Portal Mancer. They are going to start that next flash pull with those relics already, even though the, the Portal Mancer is not quite dead yet. That is going to be something that will help them get towards where Dwarf this are at count wise. Dwarf this. All are also pulling more trash into Zofex here. You can see there's running over, casting in prison, and then grabbing just one extra mob. Let's just do one extra mob at a time one while we fight this mob. boss. And hey, mob. you know what? I like it. Play it safe, yeah, me too. right? You don't have to go too crazy. That's this boss fine. is going to last five years. It's a tyrannical boss, right? We can just fight one mob at a time with it, and anytime we're doing that, by the time the boss is over, we're going to get killed like 20 mobs, right? Exactly. 100%. Evolved up, meanwhile, on the other hand, have committed their bloodlust, have cleaved down that first trash pack with the boss wow. and the bloodlust available. Look at Already this boss dead. Dam. But they're catching up on the boss as well. Look at that. They're actually just going to blitz straight past Dwarf this. Already caught up on the boss damage. What is happening? Already now past them. That is the power of the bloodlust plus the Violators have to remember. Percentage haste buffs, they stack them up. Look at it. It's a pretty big deal to be able to stack those. That's pretty insane of them. They're already caught up, and man, wow. Evolved showing why they deserve to be here. Vi and Bloodlust stack multiplicatively? That is bananas. 
That is so strong. I mean, like, yeah, look at the damage that they're putting out here. Morph this are staying even now, but Evolved have caught all the way up. Both bosses now on the exact same health total. This could not be any closer already between the two teams. Dwarfists do have one extra count, and they are fighting another mob already with the boss. So I actually still think Dwarfists kind of evens out with the fact that Evolved have somehow done 10% more boss damage in the last few seconds. Some, somehow. I'm not sure how that's happened. Looks like Evolved was waiting for that last containment cell to go off before they decide to start pulling into the next trash pack, making sure they have all of their DPS available to start cleaving down these relics. Remember, this is going to be a little bit dangerous here. There's going to be a lot of damage going out. They have to be dodging these beams on the floor as well, so they don't get any of those dots that they put on the players. And, uh, yeah, looks like they're doing a pretty solid job of it so far. The Drifter is out, so once they're de they deal with that Drifter and finish off the boss, they'll be able to skip past the rest of the trash here. Problems are for this, though. Heated has gotten very very low just now being healed up at Bergman there on the rest of Shaman. Not going necessarily clean at the end of the boss here for Dwarf This. Yeah, Dwarf This are needing to catch this back up, but again, they do have a little bit more count. Only a little bit, but they do have some more mobs they're killing off as well, but Evolved have just looked somehow so good. Uh, it's just once they pulled that boss, they hit the switch and we're doing so much damage. They are going to woe skip now. Let's see where they decide to end this woe skip. They still have about 40 seconds left of that move speed increase. What are they going to decide to pull? Alex is starting with grabbing these cartel wise guys. There are a couple of stealth mobs as well around here that will potentially get in combat with them. Ideally, you want those to just start hitting your tank, but as long as they notice quickly, it's okay if they start on somebody else. Yeah, really important to make sure you dodge those disorients, right? That's where this pull will go yeah. very, very south very quickly. And of course, interrupting this, the Skulkers whenever they poured out of the group. Making yeah, making sure they prison that inspired mob so that one of the issues interrupting or stunning these mobs and should be a pretty clean pull once they get through most of the CC. Looks like it's clean for Evolved. Now, I wonder what they're going to be doing in terms of the RP here, right? We've seen yeah, look at Dwarf a couple this. of different players do this. For Dwarf This, they're using the Rogue to get it started off. They just refreshed that Woe Drifter buff as well, so they might actually be able to do pretty much all of the RP here. Let's see how the Rogue gets it done for Dwarf This. Yeah, this is actually a really critical thing. You know, you think about this on the live servers, and it's like, oh, no big deal. Nobody really needs to learn this all that well. You know, it's not going to be a make or break for whether we time the key. But it is absolutely going to be make or break for whether you beat another team in an MDI setting. So you can see oh, Sven here. Has to figure confused. out where to bring this rum to. Trying to find the leatherworking vendor. Uh oh. Where, where's waiting the leatherworking oh, Probably vendor waiting at? for patrols to spawn. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, because those can potentially spawn right on top of you and uh, mess you up. There finds the vendor. All right. First the one trade. Here. Does need to pick up the Is bolt of silk there. Signature. Has to commit the blind on that first ad. And unfortunately, as he picks up the bolt of silk, he's going to run into these enemies. And actually, danger for sure here for Sven. That was both health pot and health up. potion used for sure there. Yeah, there now... were two very obvious ticks of health. Tailoring vendor needs to be located here. Waking comes out, but not a problem for a rogue with no friends nearby. And okay. waiting a little bit, it looks like. Okay, moving in. Ops cheat. Grabs the book, but unfortunately he's going to die here. So the book is on the floor. That is the last one they're going to need to deliver to get the password. Meanwhile, the rest of the group has been doing this trash pull at the start of the dungeon. On the side of Evolved, you can see it's the Havoc Demon Hunter who's doing some of the trades here. It looks like maybe only did one of the trades before One or two. Out here. We weren't really paying attention to him, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that was all three. Maybe they just did that really fast. Could well be, as the melt's going to be popped. So yeah, uh, plausible. I was watching, I was watching just, the dwarf this side, he's yeah. He's right back with the group. Yeah, he's right back with the group getting ready to do this postmaster pull. So, looks like it was pretty good for him. He also used the shadow melt there to make sure he dropped aggro on those uh, those three patrol mobs. So, oh, so far, so good. The demon hunter is finishing off this RP for dwarf this as well. Actually, the rest of the group is just here too. So, doing it as a group, holding hands. That is going to be a pretty big time loss for them, though, as Evolved have already moved on to the Postmaster. You can see they're now stacking those male mental buffs on the ground so that people can do as much single target damage as possible. Yeah, that male elemental bubble, the, the haste there is really, really big. Make sure you're maximizing if you're looking to get this done as fast as possible. Now they do need to deliver all of these male packages to the correct portal before they explode. A lot of damage coming out across the group here. You can see they're going to grip in the next male elemental. World Marker comes out to mark the last package that is still on the floor 
plenty of time as well for Evolved as they do. Actually, they're even throwing it to members of the team. They have their, their healer set up next to the active portal just to give them a, a throwing target from the middle of the room. Maybe that's the fastest way to do this. Usually whenever I've done this boss, I've just had everybody run all the way over and not bother trying to throw to somebody else because it's so catastrophic if you mess that up. But it looks mm -hmm. like Evolved have, have got it faster with uh, with actually having an intermediary. It's really nice having somebody to throw to if when you know they're going to be on that spot. Everyone can just toss their, their packages right to him and then they can just dunk him in for you. Now there are certain lineups later on in the fight, like for instance, if you get to the second set of mail packages, uh, it actually swaps positions mid packages. Yeah, so I hate if you that. throw them and they hit the ground, it could be pretty pretty bad. But looks like they've dealt with it whoop, quickly enough. Okay, I, I don't know if that one made it in, but looks like it got it at the very last second for Evolve. That could have been bad if it uh, went into the wrong shoot. Yeah, they did a great job there. As now the boss is getting pretty close to dead for Evolve. Nearly done finishing it up. Meanwhile, Dwarf Fist have opted to go straight to Miza's Oasis and do the music boss next. That's what they are, are going to be up to. A slight difference in routing between the two teams. Very similar trash count from both, though. Both working on bosses right now. I believe Evolved to be probably something like a minute ahead at this point based off of the better executed uh, RP section, but... Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it could still go either way. We'll, we'll only know for sure once they start really collapsing and getting back to the same point in the dungeon as each other. And uh, looks like they're not heading towards the Oasis yes. next. They're going to be grabbing probably a Woe Drifter buff here and heading to the other side of the boss. The other boss available to them so far now. And, uh, and that's a lot of backtracking in this dungeon. It's just so weird having to go back and forth and back and forth to do efficient routing. What do you think yeah. about the, uh, the strats we're that's, seeing from our team so far? That's my favorite thing about the Woe Relics, though, is that you can just use them to make all of these counterintuitive paths that normally you could just dismiss because it's like, well, there's no way it'll ever be worth the backtracking time. But whenever you can get Woe, all of a sudden you can kind of just teleport around the dungeon to wherever you want with a Woe buff, right? Uh, and so it does look like they're just going to get the Woe buff. And so they actually hadn't finished the RP entirely. As you can see, they still had at least one more left to do on the side of Evolve. So essentially not even that much faster than, the, than what Dwarf this were able to put together in this RP segment. Mm -hmm. As they will hopefully earn that password soon. And it looks like Miza's Oasis is actually going to be the next boss or Evolve as well. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense to me. I wonder what, yeah, maybe they just, just needed the, the extra trash percentage. Double right? double back. Yeah. The finest. Hmm. Okay, well... Looks like they finally have the password and they're just going to be finishing off the rest of this trash here before they head in to the yeah. Oasis. Gotta and, make uh, sure you give the right password because the damage of Zogron's slap scales with key level and will kill you. <laughs> I've been one shot before. password and a high key. Yeah. Have you been one shot before? Uh, I have not. Members of my group have in the past though. <laughs> Uh, Shelly showing us that Warlock Gateway tech. Once you deal with this boss, you can just instantly gateway back up top. Nice little time save there, speedrun strats. They wow, do have Bizarre nice. Strong Arms coming down here. Yeah, Dwarf this have that same gateway set up as well. Bizarre Strong Arm coming in. They are going to pick up their musical instruments as well. We'll be able to start getting that RP started. The, uh, the note playing. Of course, we can't quite see, we can't see the notes when we're just on the uh, uh, spectating mode, but each of the players has these notes they can see. And they need to hit them with their different musical moves with each instrument. You can see they've all successfully hit their notes. They all have the little red angry face man on their buff bar up top, so they yeah. all know how to how to how to aim. Good job, what? good job, evolved members. One big thing about actually the boss encounter is when the boss like grips everybody in. Right before it expires, like two seconds before that explodes, more notes will spawn under the boss. And so if you can then refresh that buff, it's actually a huge damage increase to be able to do so. So that's going to be something to look out for, is whether the, that red angry face buff will be extended during the boss fight itself, or whether it'll drop off and they will lose all that extra haste. Yeah, the trick as a DPS player is to just let the boss suck you in, and at the very last second, right when you see your notes spawn, use your extra action button to slide away from the boss. It'll get you just far enough away, and you'll be able to refresh your buff. Yeah, it's a, a very cool little quirk of that boss encounter that, you know, it's 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 a little bit scary to try and do it, but it absolutely can pay off as now Dwarf this have pulled the Postmaster with a bunch of trash. They aren't going to be able to pull this all the way over onto their mail bubble. The, uh haste buff area. 
They are going to just keep fighting all these enemies here and maybe spawn themselves another haste buff kind of soon. Meanwhile, Evolved still working on some of these RP segments. I think once they do this one, the boss will spawn. Uh, the one that they're mm -hmm. currently setting up for. So yeah, once they get their red angry man face buff this time, the boss will spawn again and they'll be ready to go. Actually, really close together now between the two teams. I mean, it's a lot closer than I assumed it would be. Dwarf this is committing their second bloodlust to this boss that they're on right now. And yeah, Evolved is also sending the bloodlust. Huh. And this is uh, maybe a thought process of maybe we... Actually, yeah, I mean, I think... I guess it's just a nice boss to use the bloodlust on for both teams, right? Evolved gets to get it with that damage buff from the haste thing. As you can see, most members of the team refreshing that haste buff for Evolved. That's kind of nice. Looks like it's going to fall off of Soda, but Shelly and Maskin both keeping their buffs as well as the healer and the tank. Powerful. Yep. Well played for most of them. Uh, unfortunately, the Hunter not able to get it, but, you know, we don't really expect too much from Hunters, right? Yeah, just the fact that they they found the boss room, they're here still with the group, uh, is, is always just a, a great outcome whenever you're playing with Hunter. <laughs> they tend to get lost sometimes. That's just, okay. Just glad we they found the dungeon. Way. Yeah. Well, the boss goes down first for Evolved. Dwarf this still has about 20% left on the Postmaster themselves. Man, this is actually going to be incredibly close because Evolved still do have to run to where the yeah. Postmaster room is. And the trash count as well. That... Trash count too. 94%. Evolved still only on 86. They are going to need to do another moderate to large pull here. As long as you're never Man, Dwarfus had to Ooh. run across the entire room to get that last bomb in, and they're not able to do any damage to the boss right now because it's in the middle of a giant puddle, so losing a ton of time here, getting an extra fan mail as well. Man, uh -oh. it's not going well for them on the boss here, but things are not going right evolved? for Evolved as well. Yeah, Evolved, huh. I think their woe, or their, their skip, something has gone wrong with it. They have gotten that res off, at least the Soul Stone. Now they're going to okay. start off with a, a trash pull. It looks like this is going to be a pull into boss for them, but that equalizes the death counter now. Both teams on one death for the exact same time loss from that. Guardian Spirit is going to be used to keep Alex alive there as he fights all these mobs while moving. They have pulled a lot of mobs. This is multiple peacekeepers as well as one of the enforcers. Now, I wonder if the goal here is similar to what we saw from Echo earlier on, where the enforcers would be used to try to deal with the boss as quickly as possible. Remember, the enforcers have an ability that increases the amount of damage that the mobs around them deal as well as take, and that applies to allies. So, it, you know, the bosses count too. The bosses will take 20% increased damage. So, just a little bit of an easy way to help you deal with these long, tyrannical bosses. This is probably one of the longest bosses that we have to deal with when, when it comes to Shadowlands dungeons. Yeah, because there are those three bosses that you have to deal with in this room. However, that will help Evolve catch on up there on the count, cash count, 93% to 94% now. But, worth this, you also have trash in with them as well. They'll be able to get all the way up eventually to 100 off of this. They also start their boss fight. 50% of one third of this boss is the lead for Evolved at this point. But 4% is the trash count lead for Dwarf This. I don't know which team is in the lead right now. Ah, uh, this is just really close. I think the thing that Evolved is going to plan on doing is something similar to what we saw from Echo earlier today, where they snap trash up to the final boss with their Warlock. That is what I'm expecting to see from them, so that would ex explain the discrepancy in trash percentage. Um, if they don't do that, then yeah, you're right. It's pretty much neck and neck right now. Yeah, this is going to be so, so close. All of it's going to come down to how well they play these boss fights as well. You can see Evolve taking that Goliath into one of the corners of the room. This is a strategy that's really nice for minimizing the pollution of the middle of the room. All of the orbs will spawn, and the ones that would go backwards just bounce off against the corners there. And you basically get to just have the person with that consumption debuff just grabbing all of the orbs for free as they're spawning and not having to deal with running around and picking them up. And the rest of the group doesn't have to worry about those orbs 
interrupting their, their spell cast and stuff and running into them and reducing their damage. Yeah, there's a famed Slayer of the Banished One that I know of that posted a quick tips video of this on Wowhead, I believe, a couple weeks ago. And for some reason, some of our teams haven't been doing it. Why is it worth this reading your guide, Stratus? <laughs> I, I didn't post that tip. That was... Uh... Wait, was it that Tettles? Was, that may have been Tettles, yeah, who's notably not a famed Slayer of the Banished One as well, so oh, uh, another important correction to, to be made to the statement there. I, I uh, apologize. But, yeah, uh, it, is a, it is a good tip. Tettles is very passionate about tanking this boss over there, especially it's not just while it's alive. When it's dead, it's also where the orbs come from, so you want to make sure that it dies right in that corner of the room as well, and you can see by doing that, they're going to have a really nice time of keeping those orbs I wouldn't say perfectly managed, but a lot more manageable than if the Goliath is just in the middle of the room spawning them in all directions. Oh, wait a minute, the buff is on their priest. That's that's not that's ideal. That's not how it's supposed to look. Yeah, so <laughs> for those who don't know, that buff jumps to the closest player on expiration. So ideally, you want to be passing it back and forth between like your Hunter and your DH, probably, if your Warlock wants to be able to plant and not have to worry about running and picking those up. Uh, but you certainly do not want it to land on your healer, if at all possible. Although, you know, maybe during the Boon of the Ascendant, it's fine. Sure. Check out Soda here. Tw 20 stack at the buff. Ooh, it's gonna be pumping out some damage here on that survival hunter. That is ideal. Damn. Yeah, you gotta watch out as well. Uh, one thing I didn't know, when you collect the orbs, if you don't have the debuff, not only does it damage you, it also gives you a damage reduction, not a damage increase, which is... Oh, yeah. I, I, I For a while, I thought it damaged you, but it still gave you the damage increase. But now that it's... Uh, now that it's... Uh, I know that it's a reduction, I avoid those. Like, like... Yeah, I don't like the orbs. Well, the boss has gone down for Evolved, and that is going to be a pretty significant time advantage, right? 40% still to chew through for Dwarf this on the final section of the boss. Let's see if Evolved is going to go for that Echo strategy here, because that is going to be a big, big time save, especially if they find an Enforcer to bring up, and there is an Enforcer off on the right. You can see them looking at it right now. Are they going to deal with it right now, or are they going to go for Trash on top of the boss here? Remember, they could be a little bit worried about pulling Trash on top of the boss, because that is what lost them the Gambit. So yeah, they're gonna be playing it safe and killing the trash on its own, and that's gonna be How the safe opening is this, though? that Dwarf This needs to get back in. This yeah, I mean, could you, let Dwarf This come back. Excuse you talk about playing it, playing it safe, but I mean, this means now they're playing from behind, right? They have to finish this trash pull, whereas Dwarf This do not have to worry about anything like that. They can just go straight upstairs and start the last boss encounter, and Dwarf This are going to start the last boss first. If they can just keep their heads on their shoulders, they could be on track here for a massive upset of one of the teams that started the day in the upper bracket and was my favorite for the other team besides Echo to escape this group, maybe sending them home before it's even Sunday. Oh, they can't get over the edge. Oh, no. Yeah, the... It took so long for them to get up. Oh, and Dwarf this actually are going to have to do a summon as well. Both teams need to do this. Oh, but Evolved started the RP somehow early as they're already able to pull here. Whereas on the side of Dwarf this, we have deaths coming out. Those players are going to need to get released and get re-summoned. That's going to cost them quite a bit of time. Whereas Evolved have already gotten started on the boss fight. They are now blasting into Soazmi. If you give them an inch, they are going to take a mile here. Man, and one of the things to remember, this boss is going to go down much, much slower for Evolve than they did for Echo earlier today. They don't have the 20% increased damage on the boss that Echo did, so they're going to have to deal with a little bit of extra mechanics of, of the boss than Echo did. You can see Shelly putting down that gateway. That'll be a diagonal cross across the platform so that it will be able to go through both walls whenever the platform is divided into four sections. Very useful tip that you can do as a Warlock player. It's also blinkable, it's also demonic teleportable. There's a lot of things you can do in order to kind of cheese this boss. They are set up for success here, Evolved. Yeah, they just need to make sure they don't do any of the these boss mechanics wrong, right? As we also have Dwarf This on the boss too. Dwarf This are 10 seconds behind in death differential, 20% behind on the boss fight. It is going to be a huge hurdle for them to catch this back up if Evolved are able to do it well. 45% now for Evolved. Not much left on this boss fight. Neither team is going to make it back to Bloodlust, I don't think. Although Dwarf this might be able to click it right at the end of this fight. 45 seconds left on that cooldown. But Soazmi already nearing the end of her life oh, for Evolved. Edge going down for Dwarf this. That's another death on the board. They have a battle res, but those seconds are not what you can afford when you're already behind on boss percentage for Evolved. I think Dwarf this needs Evolved to make some major mistake right now. They need like two or three DPS deaths, even with the battle resist. That's that's just the minimum that Dwarf this needs to come back here. 
So as me now in execute range, 15% health and dropping fast. One more double technique is probably going to come out and they're going to need to chase the boss to it. And then after that, it will be over. Maybe not even getting that secret technique here. 3% left on the oh. boss and it is over. Evolved are going to take this game and this series and survive through to Sunday, eliminating Morpheus <laughs> 2 to 1. Wow, it does not get any closer than that, does it? That was. I mean, you saw Shelly lean back in his chair and take a really big sigh oh. of relief. Oh my gosh, that was a that was a close streets between these two teams. That was a that was impressive for Evolved. I mean, they're moving on, but I I feel bad for Dwarf. This uh, the the looking for group dream was uh, was certainly inspiring, and it, it still is because that was extremely tight. Like they played a really solid streets for the most part. That was really, really good from Dwarfness. I think if they show up in that last turn tournament, I would not want to. Uh, I, I would be worried. I, I'd yeah. be scared if I was another team. That they, they are looking really, really good. And they took Evolved to a third game here with all three games uh, looking really good out of them. So huge credit to Dwarfness. But it is, at the end of the day, going to be Evolved that escape this game and this series and make it through to Sunday. Huge congratulations to them. Well played. Good recovery from when things went a little bit wrong in some of these dungeons. A great job of staying in it as well uh, after the getting to that game three. Yeah, so at this point, Evolved, uh, Evolved moves on, but we've got a little bit of replay to look at. But uh, I, I'd be a little bit nervous, you know, in that next match if I were Evolved. Things need to be a little bit cleaner here. But there were some entertaining moments in this, this uh, dungeon worth there. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of entertaining moments in this dungeon. It's like, at the very beginning, you saw uh, Dwarf this. They got a little bit behind. They were trying to deal with the marketplace, with the, soloing it with that rogue. And I thought it was like a super smart strategy. They just didn't get it dealt with cleanly. And then Evolved, it looked like Evolved had like a 30 to 45 second advantage on Dwarf this. But they had a couple of issues with getting around, um, just moving through this area. They didn't get... Uh, they like had like a healer death and that ended up costing them a substantial amount of time and then i thought they were going to make back up a lot of this time by where they were killing this goliath just the the difference in killing the goliath in the corner this is the title's tip of the week killing the <laughs> goliath in the corner versus killing it not is going to be such a large difference of where these orbs were by the end of it dwarf this is orbs were just all around the room it was so hard for their their range dps to be able to cast um, as much as they reasonably wanted to. But even still, Dwarf This was able to just kind of clutch it out. They had a little bit more trash count. Some of their trash pulls were just slightly better. And if they were able to get around this mini boss without getting in combat, I think they would have won. But unfortunately, uh, the rogue, the rogue and their uh, shaman ended up getting caught by that mini boss. And no mind just, soothe. No mind soothe. Mind soothe. Nice diff. Mind soothe. That is yeah, the mind soothe diff right there. It's mm -hmm. crazy how much weird strategy and tech that there is in this dungeon it's just it's a brand new dungeon but there's a lot of stuff to be seen here just tragic though when you see a couple members flying up and then you see that uh you see the mob start to engage the uh the shaman and the rogue on the ground you're like oh no so close but yet so far uh do you think this is pre-stiff too to a certain extent still again yeah i do i think I'm... i think the mind soothe kind of actually was the reason they won there, right? If if you had a mind on the side of Dwarf this, they uh they could have won that series. We had a would have had a very close race there. They would have pulled the boss at roughly the exact same time. Both teams had pretty similar single target damage and uh would have been a great race, but unfortunately just wasn't meant to be. Mm -hmm. Not to dwell well, on too long though. Uh, evolved moving on. Do, do not forget, they had a, like an eleven thirty Necrotic Wake as the first map of this series. Right? Yeah. <laughs> They need to stay away from Tazimish, is, is my thoughts on this whole entire thing. <laughs> they are re the dungeons that Evolved has practiced on, You, it is very clear that they are super practiced on it, and they can put up top tier times. The dungeons that are maybe a little, they're a little bit less comfortable on, it's really clear. Like, these Tazimishes are not, their, at least, not always their strong suit. I think that they can get more consistent, and I expect them to make a pretty deep run tomorrow. They, they I could see them... Um, claiming that second place slot. It just, they need to be super consistent and they need to show that team that was in the Necrotic Wake as opposed to the team that were in the Tazimeshes. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, if you can't handle me at my Necrotic, or at my Tazimesh, you don't deserve me at my Necrotic Wake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Well Good said. Point. Yeah.
But so the uh, looking ahead, like uh, I'm, I'm curious what the maps are going to be for that one because I wonder how much they can actually ban out. <laughs> oh, well, there you go, cringe. <laughs> well, I'm familiar with this. Someone or something that makes you feel awkward, uncomfortable, or embarrassed. Uh, see also Dratnos and Tettles. This is one oh, of those. Do we dictionary have a words. one too? We can add me to well, that it's, list. It's too. one of those dictionary words that has multiple different definitions from each other, right? The completely distinct the definition number one and definition number two, right? Yeah, hey guys. <laughs> I uh, yeah. well, we've already sure. seen what pulling a Tettles is. What about Dratnos? Ah! Oh, there you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Say, you know, fix that in post after one of a real life <laughs> after one of a real life they, mistake. Production huh. loves me for that one. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, sleeping. six, seven, eight, yeah. nine, ten. I'm going back okay. to sleep. Good night. The lore behind yes. number three is when we have to like do our pre-show checks, <laughs> they need us to do our audio check, but I just try and speed run counting to 10 and clapping and then just turning off my, my camera again and going back to bed for the two hours between when I have to wake up and when the stream goes out. I mean, oh, you're bring, always bring like, that. you're under a blanket 90% of the time anyway, so d sometimes I feel like you could probably just lean back in your chair and just immediately conk out too. Oh yeah. Th there was another one there. There was a C also unhirable talent. What was that? Do we have I one didn't for see that, that one. too? No, uh, I don't know, know it was a number that. four. It was definitely there. I, I did see. I, it I don't know anything about that. Hmm. Mm. It I might remain a mystery. A I guess we'll we'll hold on to that one maybe. But uh, yeah, evolve moving on. Um, that means we <laughs> excuse me have just one last match remaining today. It is going to be incarnation taking on uh, evolved. I, no, not evolved. I'm sorry. Yeppers is going to be the next one, and um, it's going to be another one that. Could be fairly close, I feel. Uh, Incarnation looking incrementally better throughout the day, but still, are they enough to take down Yeppers? What do you think? Uh, it, it's one of those things that I feel like Yeppers is kind of similar to Evolved, where Yeppers has a lot of really strong potential if they can get super consistent with their maps. Hmm. Um, it, it just kind of comes down to, like, are they able to execute on their strategies cleanly? For Incarnation, they are basically full YOLOing uh, the weekend, and they're flying by by the seat of their pants. They they looked really good in their last series, though, and I would be incredibly scared if I were on the side of Yeppers. Yeah, that's right. But uh, we will have to wait. We'll have to wait just a little bit and see what happens next. For now, though, a quick break, and when we come back, the final match of the day here on MDI. Don't go anywhere. We'll return in just a few.
Mm, Doa muted. Uh. Uh, <laughs> oh. I was doing so well. I was doing so well. It was this great. Is, I only work well in a studio environment, man. When someone else can control all my audio for me, that's where I really excel. It that was kind of like, uh, hey, welcome back, everybody. It's Matt Mr. X, Tettles, Zyronic, and we're at the virtual desk. And oh, I'm well done. Doa, but I'm just repeating what Doa said. I'm Matt. Thanks. Thanks for that. No problem. Anytime. Yeah. All right. Well, since we're all we're all ready to go, everyone's looking. Everyone's looking. Tettle's at me. pretending to look at. I mean, well, we're we're on a virtual desk, of course. That's yeah. true. That's okay. This is a very yeah, uncomfortable though for me. Like, <laughs> why? Why is it uncomfortable? You guys, you look at me. Uh, why is this uncomfortable for you? <laughs> we're turning uh, the Brady Bunch for some reason. Oh, why, oh, why they gotta? Dude, why dude, they gotta do that? Bring it back up again. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm not that cringe. I'm not. Why that do they cringe, gotta do it? Please. Why do they gotta do it? <laughs> Oh wow! Oh, 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 right into right attack. into this uh, angel activation alert. Uh, there's there's been a lot. It's, oh, it scrolls down, down too. Oh my gosh! There's a lot you of know, them. Oh my goodness! There are uh, you know the tormented here indeed. Holy priest, you, you don't you don't have any movement. <laughs> you you know. It's not a yummy at the bottom there. Yeah, it's all. Yeah. Petzergling.com. <laughs> it's petzergling.com. <laughs> a lovingly crafted website by one of his guildies. There you it's go. Beautiful. And nothing says love like uh, publicly shaming your guildmates. <laughs> hey, I don't blame, I don't blame the healer from uh, Dwarf This. He was like, you ain't catching me on the angel site. I'm yeah, playing Rest right. of Shaman all weekend. He rage honks every single time that he dies. It's fine. Just <laughs> 20 out of 20 onk. Just come back. Yeah, you're good. Nobody saw Onking it. is not a real death. Yeah, nobody sees it happen. Um, it's just a cooldown. It's just a cooldown. It's made to be yeah. used. It should reset right. with every single dungeon start, honestly. It's, it should. It no. should. Or maybe after every boss kill. No, 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 no. More ridiculous. Yeah, like every boss kill. Yeah, Don't that, that sounds that good to again. me. Remember it should, what it happened should reset last every time boss they had pull. a way of resetting it? No, every boss pull? No. <laughs> that would be too OP. Yeah. It's a 30 minute cooldown for a reason. Oh, I don't know. It used to be an hour. Way back in the day, if you remember from. No, never mind. We're starting Do with Spires of Ascension yourself, this man. time around. <laughs> Tettles yeah. is here. He's going to call you old again. Anybody remember Totem Twisting? What Pepper's you Farm me? remembers. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> uh, so it turns out uh, Tazavesh was banned by Incarnation. Uh, Good ban. Uh, Miss was banned yeah, <laughs> by uh, Yeppers. So that means we're going to Spires first and Halls of Atonement if we need it. Gambit. Let's see if we get there. <laughs> I, I Gotta would love not, Spires. If I was either team, I would not want to see the Gambit at the end because we've seen just chaos in the Murloc area, I feel like, all weekend where like mm -hmm. some groups just end up like almost like bricking their run right at the start <laughs> like uh especially like with pressure going into a third app uh in this set i yeah I, I either team i think would not love to see that one i think the spires is like very scary for both of these teams uh they both ran spires of ascension already to me medium amounts of success there was a lot of sanguine issues on both fronts i remember the incarnation guys they ended up having just like a double goliath bathing in sanguine that that mm -hmm. cost them like a minute and a half or something like that just by itself the yuppers guys they ended up having like a full wipe in their match earlier today uh, versus echo in the spires of ascension it is not an easy dungeon it's very volatile and i, I think that the team that can play this dungeon the most slow and steady have the feel like the most uh, easy time with their sanguine healing, making sure that they deal with that super clean. They will probably have the best results in in this dungeon, and honestly, probably take the series. So the the Tettle's the tip too. is don't mess up, huh? Yeah, it's, the halls is nasty too. It's it go is. slow if you it's go slow if you need to is the tip here. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's our spires data for twenty the tyrannical. As you can see, thirty one minutes fifteen seconds fastest runtime on live. Thanks again to Raider IO for these stats. Um, 9.6 deaths, again, like, I, I'm a little bit surprised. I thought it'd be higher than that, frankly. On that, I mean, Tyrannical, like, a lot of the trash in here is nasty. Where yeah. Tyrannical, like, some of the bosses, like, aren't the worst. Um, like, I mean, they're, they're definitely not great. Uh, I would say Sanguine in here is probably your biggest issue, especially... Uh, in the Incarnation match, I think it was actually twice they had the Goliath. I think they had the Goliath and Sanguine mm -hmm. at the start in the 
you know, the double pack of the Goliaths and the Sanguine, so that's probably the toughest thing to deal with. Something that'll well, be extremely that way, yeah. useful for Incarnation, sorry, is they got given a blueprint on how to do this dungeon with these affixes earlier today. They got to see Echo run this dungeon, and they got to see a perfect way to do everything. And for a team like them, we keep saying it, they have great fundamentals but might not be as practiced for this season. Seeing somebody else do it pretty much perfectly is a pretty good way to get practiced on it yourself, and they've had a little bit of time to practice since their earlier match today. So maybe this Spire Zone will be a lot better than we saw from them yesterday. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, because when it comes down to it, like the you you know what the route is going to be, right? So then it is resting on those fundamentals, right? How do you kite out a pack properly to avoid the Sanguine becoming a problem? Echo did a fantastic job of doing that. You know, if Incarnation can replicate it, then, you know, I suppose they, they got a, a shot too, yeah. It's always a messy it, dungeon, it, though. It's just weird because... I think that this season, more than ever, they, these teams have more control over their mobs, like Blood DK and H Priest being in meta. You have like um, mm -hmm. single grip, you have mass grip, you have shining force. That's like a lot of utility that um, you are able to utilize to be able to get these mobs out of the Sanguine. But at the end of the day, a lot of it isn't about like those knockbacks or those displacement effects. A lot of it is about the just, like, pre placement of the mobs before like the Ether Divers start to die, for example, because those Ether Divers yeah. have. I don't know, 25% of the HP of the Goliath or something like that? <laughs> Some, uh, it's something in that range for sure. I wonder, uh, Yeppers earlier today ran uh, Windwalker on Spires. Mm -hmm. I wonder mm. if they try that again. Uh, they both, like, Incarnations run pretty much the same thing every time uh, with the Blood DK Holy Priest Warlock Rogue Hunter. Uh, and it looks like Yepers, they just haven't run the, at least today, they didn't run any of uh, you know, Rogue comps uh, in theirs. And yeah, you see them here right at the start. They're going to be running that Windwalker. All right. And now the, the match is going to begin between Yepers and Incarnation. Immediately, yeah, Incarnation running that Rogue in here. I, I actually do think that the Windwalker Monk is a slightly better pick. But with Incarnation, they were... They're just here to have like a ton of fun. These guys are super experienced. They, they placed very high in um, our last MDI. They were the fourth place team. And they, they are doing an excellent job uh, for an 18th seed. That's, what, that's the seed that they were coming into the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Dude, look at Yepers. They, they sanguined their Goliath back from 20% oh. HP all the way up to like 60. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's so like... Mob just has so much health to begin with, and then having it in the Sanguine and the Recharge, it's like, it's going to make this pull last so much longer, and they have to be even careful as well. Like, they still have one more uh, mob they kind of have to get and lie it down before the Castigator, and, you know, make sure they kind of don't end up in another situation with a Sanguine pull right on top yeah. of the Recharge, but look at how much time they've lost. Immediately, Incarnation already out to a quick lead. Something in... I think that they've lost something in the range of like 25 seconds just off of a slight misplay on that first pull. Um, we talk like week in and week out about these invisible time losses that you can incur. And it, typically it's revolving around how bolstering management works. But Sanguine, I think, is one of the ones that's like, it's very difficult to see how much time you are losing to Sanguine. And Yepper's right there, just 25 seconds down the drain due to just a minor uh, inconsistency with their strategy of how to deal with the mobs. And I'm curious what we see happen with both these groups, like, you after this hide. first boss. Uh, yeah. If Incarnation decides to just kind of skip some of the packs on the left and then just pull the cats to the right and then make up count later. Uh, or if they kind of go and grab both. I think with Yepers, right, with you have the Shining Force, you have the Blood DK, you have, you know, the Ring of Peace, right, with the uh, Windwalker. Like, you have a lot to knock some of those mobs out. All right, so Incarnation has started the first boss. They ended up getting uh, dealing with that trash pack right in front of it really well. They made sure to get everything dealt with. They, they are bringing that oh. Goliath right on top um, of the boss. They Basically, they just need to make sure that that Goliath dies off in the middle of the room. Uh, Kintara, like can fly around, and then the bird will plant itself in a weird spot. But the way that you mitigate any Sanguine healing here is you just make sure that that Goliath dies up in the middle of the room. Kintara can be moved pretty much freely, so it shouldn't... Uh, be too bad, very minimal segment healing, and Incarnation does a great job of making sure this pull is, was dealt with. Like, on the side of Yepers, there's a Warlock in a pod! Ugh. Ugh, that's never a good sign. As, uh, the scariest part with the Incarnation pull on this boss at in the beginning when they had Tara and some of the other mobs, it's, uh, it looked like Dorky like, dropped down to like 60% uh, HP and then he actually got knocked up in a storm, uh, which looked like <laughs> the like, 
scariest scenario uh, as we've seen uh, Storming claim the lives of a few people on Spires today, but uh, it looks like Serrated is back up, not in his pod any longer, but still lose a little bit of time. Okay, I, I think that Yepper's Warlock being in that pod, Serrated just pod tending while he was uh, in his CDs, whenever he also had that Bloodlust active on him, was Ugh. like such a massive damage loss. That's something that you hate to see. Um, he, he actually does have that Infernal backup, so he, he did just have a Blasphemy proc. He has that PI on him as well. Now you see that Infernal coming out. So maybe Yepers is going to be able to catch back up just a little bit of damage here. But again, we have to just keep talking about it. That first pull for Yepers really ended up costing them a bunch of time, and we're going to see just how much time uh, in, in the difference between the boss one splits between these two teams. And, uh, and Asuna has the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, Warlock, uh, just kind of like the uh, the big blasphemy and the Infernal it has it active, right? But you can probably save it for some of these trash mobs after, like the boss sitting at 3% yeah. now. You save that after, and maybe you can go a little bit bigger here if you're Incarnation. It's very... It it's, it's, so it's like really tough. I'm interested to see what Incarnation is going to do yeah. with this next pull because we've seen a lot of different variations. We saw Yepers try to go um, really big with this pull, doubling it up like we've seen in some previous MDI seasons where we saw Echo taking it a little bit slow and steady knowing that the Sanguine can cause potential problems if you aren't super consistent. It looks like Incarnation is getting a CC on some of those mobs. Dorky and the remainder of the, of the group on Incarnation. Line of sighting uh, all of these skirmishers here to make sure that everything gets grouped up. And from here... This looks like it's going to be okay for Incarnation. Not the greatest yeah. camera angle, I will admit, but uh, these skirmishers and the Aether Divers are going to be dying. They need to make sure that they die at the exact same time. Bolster killing these is imperative. Otherwise, you're going to have a sanguine catastrophe. Ooh, one of the skirmishers getting low, and you see Dorky immediately gripping it out of the group. That's super smart. And Incarnation pulls off their skirmisher pull really well. Where on the left side of the screen, we see Yeppers. They use their... Uh, they actually are doing the stealth claws, and they're doing a little bit different of a pull than what we saw from earlier. So they have adapted their route. Yeah, they've changed it up a little bit. Now, Incarnation is going to go back the other side. They're going to get some of these stealth claws and move on through. It looks like they actually, uh, judging, trying to see it from the camera angle, it looks like they CC'd three mobs up there, uh, I believe, uh, Incarnation. So uh, made it a little bit easier. Uh, you see on the upper side, just trying to knock those out with anything. The Shining Force, bring a piece out of the Sanguine Pools. As it looks like this one last stealth claw is actually going to walk through a little bit. Oh no, nice grip there, bringing it right across the thing. Uh, and I think that that's the power of the the Windwalker Monk compared to the Rogue. Like right as we were yeah. starting, uh, I wanted to talk about the Windwalker Monk just a little bit more. The Windwalker Monk just provides a decent bit more mob control with that Ring of Peace over what the Rogue is going to provide. So the Rogue, whenever we talk about their mob control, typically it's like single target lockdown. Um, with a lot of stun utility. Uh, they also have blinds, they have saps and stuff like that. But they don't have displacement effects. Whereas on the side of Yeppers, that Windwalker Monk with their Ring of Peace, they also have Leg Sweep and Terra. They bring a lot of mob control in a completely different way, but I think it's a little bit more advantageous for Sang. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's something more in line with like a, a Typhoon, right? To knock players around, you know, knock people out of the Sangwin where yeah, Rogue is basically just stun locking people down. Uh, uh -huh. you know, and yeah, Yepper's actually dealing with this next pack rather quickly. Uh, making really fast work of these Goliaths, and they get rid of pretty much everything else. They've gotten the uh, you know, herb buff going into this, so doing a nice job of getting these Goliaths. This is the one, this is the pack that's been trouble for a lot of people so far. Yeah, and it looks like Infernation's kind of taking theirs a little bit slower. They, they ended up downing um, the Aether Diver and kind of made their that first pack that they were doing have a disproportionate amount of HP. They also allowed their patrol to just get in a little bit better of a spot. That Stealth Claw and the Praetor are both at 50%, so that can cause some problems. But look at these. These Aether Divers are kind of melting. They just need to make yeah. sure that everything gets gripped away from those Goliaths before they enter that recharge phase. And right here, the first Goliath is entering the recharge, the second Goliath is entering the recharge, and this is looking a lot better for Incarnation than what we saw earlier whenever they were inside of Spires of Ascension. Yeah, and you saw, like, Dorky kind of, uh, you know, grab some of those Aether Divers to the left and then immediately try and kite, like, the other way to kind of bring the Goliaths out and have some of his teammates, you know, finish them off uh, before they could get there for that recharge. As uh, That's been, uh, you know, we have actually seen that even happen in Incarnation, right? So much cleaner out of them uh, than what we've seen uh, throughout the weekend thus far, specifically on that pole. But uh, Yepper's already across this as uh, they're going to be taking on this next pack with the Relic. Next pack coming up. Uh, with the Goliath, and then there's also the control. It's usually the path we see the spear on, although we've seen some yeah. groups saving it. 
Uh, it, it's really difficult to use those Kyrian Spears in this dungeon since uh, Sanguine is the active affix yeah. and like there's a lot of HP mismatches and so that's something that you have to be cognizant of. I'm interested to see where these uh, these professionals are going to be dropping that Kyrian Spear Imagine because like here with the size of this pole. I mean, you get the spear is really good here for the side of Yepers. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh, everything gets. Leg, you, you saw a leg sweep into a nice ring of peace to get those ether divers spread to make sure that the sanguine healing is mitigated. It looks like their Goliath did end up receiving just a little bit, but it, it's looking like it's going okay for Yuppers. They didn't even commit that spear or anything, and that Inquisitor is just bathing. The Inquisitor and the Skirmish are both just healing all the way up to full, but hey, honestly, as long as the Goliath didn't heal, uh, I'm kind of okay you with can... it. It's not, the, it's not the best, but, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> it's not ideal, but it could be worse. Uh, there's yeah. even the, looks like the Inquisitor to the left, uh, the prayer over there was going for a dip as well in the Sanguine, but it's gone now. <laughs> oh, it, Despawned. Going for a dip in the middle of April, oh. not advised. It looks the like water's still oh, cold. Goliath, isn't it? Everything's fine. Okay, so for Yeppers, yeah. it's looking like their pull is... Oh, man. Okay, but look at the, on the right side. Incarnation was already 30 seconds ahead coming out of boss one, and they ended up dealing with all of that trash a lot faster than Yeppers. Incarnation is starting to open up a pretty substantial lead. I would even equate this to somewhere in the range of like a minute ahead of where Yeppers is, because you have to look at the trash count differential. Yeah. Incarnation is 11% enemy forces ahead already. Right, because Incarnation went to that left-hand side and grabbed some of those casters, where Yeppers is going to have to make that up at a... A seven percent up, like later here in the dungeon. Uh, I believe from what we saw from them earlier, they didn't do like the full on like echo pull that we saw, but they did kind of you know, pull some of those mobs on the left hand side. It'll be a shroud here for incarnation as they want to skip that tough pack, go right to the boss. I I think that skipping most of those packs in the MDI is very common. I think that the squad leaders and just like the damage reduction they provide to their AOE. Um, to the remainder of the mobs like around them is something that's like you may want to do it on live because the pack isn't necessarily that difficult if you're looking at the pack like there's not a lot of heavy hitting mobs there's not a lot of like coordination that really needs to go into that pack but whenever you're thinking about it in the context of an mdi that's a slow pull and that's why you see these teams skipping it you see you even see yeppers that they don't have a shroud but they they this utilize like para and ring of peace to be able to get the mobs just a little bit further away and so then they also both teams engage Ventanax. Incarnation have already pulled Ventanax a little bit early, somewhere in the range of like 40% ahead on this boss. And so we're going to be able to see on this boss two split the difference between the two teams. But in addition to that, look at the enemy forces at the top of the screen. That is a massive gap between these two teams as well. Yeah, Yepers actually grabs the Vi here. So they want a, you know, a little bit more haste as opposed to like the CDR coming into this. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, the last pull to kind of skip that like champion. It's almost uh, like how you see groups that would do a miss uh, skip with on live, like without a rogue, where you kind of like the para and then rop or like an imprison and get by. Like it's really you know when you don't have the shroud, you can have the creative in that regard. But they get by down. They're still down pretty heavily in terms of percent on the boss as. Incarnation has Ventanax down to about 20%. Uh, but still, Yepers now with the Vi. They're going to have that for a little bit longer here and see if they can make some of that up. All right. V Ventanax is a boss that has gone through a lot of uh, different phases. I remember on expansion launch, this boss, even on like pretty like like 15s on Tyran was... Very, very scary. Um, it, it did it in, an incredible amount of damage. Right now, with the Warlock kind of being meta, it, it is a little bit scary because the ranged are always the priority. It's like Warlock plus H Priest. The ranged are always prior for getting the bleed, so you don't have like a mage eating every single bleed with like an H Pally. But at the same time, that bleed has gone through a, a considerable amount of nerfs and now is honestly looking pretty good. Incarnation down Vintanax rather quickly. Yepper is somewhere in the range of 30% behind. And again, I'm going to reiterate on it one more time. They are down a lot of enemy forces count, so it's it's going to take it's going to take a pretty big incarnation mistake for them to be able to catch up here. Yeah, you may look at it and say like, well, they are going to get the boss down like you know five to seven percent, uh, five to seven uh, seconds later. But yeah, they don't have as much of percentage uh, in terms of count. And uh, yeah, this boss for ranged is deadly, especially like when you have like a warlock and a holy priest who don't have great ability not a ton of like abilities that you can even cast on the move here uh, especially during when all the kind of orbs are flying around at this type of key level just, especially on tyrannical really really just kind of 
decimate you as a player, regardless of even if you have a defensive. So how are Incarnation going to attack this? So they go in to try and pull the Hellion into the next room, or are they just going to try and solo kill it off? I'm also interested to see where both of these teams are going to use their Kyrian Spears. So we haven't seen um, those used, but, but both of the squads are running multiple Kyrians, so they can save them for pulls later on in the dungeon. Of course, you can't be carrying two at once. Uh, so it's not like really an issue whenever you are you have that Blood DK plus that H Priest that are both playing that Kyrian, so you can, you can carry them and utilize them basically whenever you want. It looks like Incarnation, yeah, like you said, they ended up getting the Hellion a little bit low, started... Uh, they proc that Woe Drifter. I I'm surprised that they picked the Woe Drifter here, especially whenever they do have access to that rogue. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> a cast <laughs> going off from the Goliath as everybody drops super low, but yeah. and not getting one shot, which is kind of fine. Yeah, I mean, you have to use, like, uh, Yubi basically used everything there. Uh, Desperate Prayer, him, Apotheosis, like, uh, everything there to kind of uh, keep players up as uh, looks like they're going to be able to deal with this pack. And I, I think that is a really scary one when you pull the Hellion who already does oh, a ton of damage. Oh, what's going on for Yepper? Yeah, actually, yeah wait, where did, where did they lose a player here? He got, he uh, he looks like he body pulled the pack, but I couldn't tell if he was just like in combat with it and needed to die or like what happened. It, uh, but he just like walks, he dropped the Warlock Gate and then dropped, walked straight into the pack and then they mass rested. Um, all right, so looking at the left side of the screen, this is the most important point for Yevers. This is where they're going to be able to catch up, if anything. And this pull is insane. Look at this Kyrian Spear. It's been dropped. And, and this is a pull that we've seen wipe so many teams season in and season out in the MDI. They need to make sure that their Sanguine management is perfect. They do have access to that Ring of Peace as it comes out. They, they're spreading the pack. And look at these Greater Minnigs. They're going off. Oh, no, this is oh. going to be so bad for Yevers. Oh. oh, my goodness. Oh. oh. <laughs> they needed to make a play. They almost made a play. Uh, and then it didn't work out. But, like, uh, it, it started off really well, right? Uh, I know they, they had the Kyrian Spear down. Like, the damage out of the Windwalker was huge. The Ring of Peace was there. And then the Mending start to go off. And at that point, you are in big trouble. Uh, pretty much nothing you can do to come back from that. <laughs> It's just that, man, it's, it's so hard to angle Ring of Peace perfectly, and it's like once those mobs start to get spread like that, it's good for Sanguine management, but it's not good whenever you need to get the leg sweep on the, the yeah. bending cast, and it's like, oh, the mobs got spread. I mean, it's a, it's like they hit the sweep on some of them, but they didn't hit the sweep on all of them, and it, like once the greater mendings to go off, like, the pack is over. It's it's like the unfortunate reality of the situation. They did lose the spear, which there are only a finite number of in the dungeon. And now they're going to have to go super slow in this. And if you're on the side of Yepers, you're kind of hoping that Incarnation makes a massive blunder. You're going to need it. Uh, I mean, we've seen even, uh, I think, a group earlier, like, must to, uh, you know, pulling some of these mobs that Yepers is have. But you're going to kind of need that even for, like, if you want to do, like, the Triple Angel pull, which you're almost going to have to do to make up time at this uh, moment where uh, Incarnation on them from uh, got them down to below 50 percent so uh, they're kind of cruising at this point they don't have to do anything crazy to set up a good time here and take this map one all right so now we're um getting down to 40 percent incarnation needs to get to that 87 percent enemy forces count threshold before being able to go up top it looks like they're positioning a Riffreon to be able to pull into uh, some of these mobs off to the side whenever they do enter that second recharge phase uh, this is a fairly common strategy. We've seen this over multiple seasons now, where uh, basically once a Rift Round stops doing all of their mechanics, you just kind of pull the trash on top of the boss. They're going to kill the boss off before the trash ends up dying, so that's going to mitigate any potential Sanguine issues. And for Incarnation, they just really need to make sure that getting to that recharge phase goes super clean for them. Yeah, I think the scariest part is, you know, during the recharge phase, obviously collecting some of the orbs the boss is calling back in. And then just kind of like sanguine, like if one of those you know, mobs they pull into the boss dies a little bit early, that is a, a really bad scenario. But uh, they tried this pull the other day. I believe they were able to execute it well. Uh, like you mentioned, something you've seen players do uh, in the NBA in the past is uh, Junkrat going to use uh, Cloak to try and soak up some of those boards, but you did have Yoda dying here, so they're going to have to use a B res on Yoda. I think it's still fine. Like they do, they do still have one battle res available. This is in a dungeon where um, battle reses are typically valuable. At this oh, oh my God! They had it. He got knocked up by a storming, <laughs> and I believe the orb went underneath him. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> that, uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. I think if we recreate your comms, you hear Dorky saying, "Oh my goodness, I just got knocked up by a storming," and then the rest of the group goes, "I'm sorry, what just happened?" <laughs> As the orb, uh, I, I don't know the last time I've seen an orb hit the boss like that. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that was such a sick camera angle as well, like from the side as you just saw Dorky just go up in the sky and the orb just travels slowly into the boss and. They're super fortunate that everybody was at like full HP there because they get chunked down. Oh, I can't All wait right. to see that one again. That was that that was really funny. Um, so Incarnation does down a Riftrian. They get the remaining count that they need there at that 87% enemy force threshold that I was talking about earlier. We're on the left side of the screen. The Riftrian has just been engaged by Yepers. It's feeling like they're falling even further and further behind even after their full life. But Incarnation is not out of the woods yet. There is still one final pull that's like really dangerous for them. Would you expect them to pull a double angel here into a single, or do you think that they're just going to go all the way in for the triple? Pro knowing you had this type of lead, um, actually, like maybe you just go with the double into the single. We saw earlier uh, when a team was playing it safe, they did double into a single, and then they actually even lusted uh, and used the spear <laughs> on the single. Uh, okay. So we'll see what happens here as uh, we're going to see all three pulled. So all three pulled, that'll be the spear and the lust that goes down. This is a bear pull. All right. So, uh, <laughs> jokes on you. The bears don't ever play safe. The team incarnation, notoriously known for doing whatever they want to. <laughs> and they, they may be five minutes ahead or six minutes ahead, but they're still going to play their game. Um, you do see those multiple infernals out. I, I think that the lust and the double, they double spear back. <laughs> well, this is slight overkill, I think. So, for context, some teams last season didn't use a single spear or lust on this pack, and they used nothing and were able to kill the triple angel. Um, but this season, you see double spear plus lust. Yoda still ended up going down there, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and they have to be careful. Like, they're getting pretty high stats. Uh, and, and these bombs still have a decent amount of health. Uh, he missed out on some of the Hunter damage for a bit. Is Yoda's going to drop the 6% there? Uh, you may be able to heal him back up. Leave a, you know, maybe even a Guardian Spear use there. But uh, th this is getting scary. I mean, 20 stacks of this. The, the damage is going to just get so high. Not bad, though. Good kill for Incarnation. And honestly, yeah. at this point, they're kind of out of the woods. Uh, they haven't... So one of the things that we haven't really talked about in regards to, like, composition is how much value... H Priest plus Warlock provides, especially on a boss like this. Um, so Azuna does still have the Fell Hunter out, but we've seen teams in the past swap to that Imp plus the uh, plus the H Priest, and that al allows for a lot of dispel coverage on Devos. That basically allows you to rotate between mass dispel and that Imp dispel to make sure that you never have two stacks of that debuff out um, at a time, which can cause some deaths uh, whenever it lines up with the Abyssal Detonation. Yeah, the, the damage that comes out, uh, whether it's like uh, from the dot or even the dispel that you have to get. Uh, dot having a second one uh, in the group it definitely puts a lot of stress on the healer. Also, just the decision of who uh, gets the dispel. You also have the cloak uh, from the rogue uh, if that's available at that time. Is uh, Urfreon 13% on the side of Yepers. Uh, they don't have to get any more percent. I believe they got the packs uh, on that right hand side with the boss uh, down. So. Pretty much just going to have to, you know, once this boss gets down, they're going to have to go up top. You're going to have to commit the Lust and probably Spears to try and get that triple angel, angel pull, but you're still pretty far behind. Uh, this feels a little bit too little too late, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I would say so. I mean, I, I... Uh, the, the spot that would have been the scariest, right, is when we saw, uh, you know, Incarnation, they had the, the storming with the orb <laughs> knock up. That would have been a point where you would have been like, okay, we could make some time back there. Uh, and then when they lost Yoda on the Triple Angel and just building up those stacks, that would have probably been the scariest point at that moment. But uh, right here on Devos from like the 70% down, like th there's going to be a good amount of damage. Although uh, we did see a little bit earlier, I believe it was Clicks, right? He got knocked up from a storming and knocked out of the barrier. Uh, barring anything like crazy like that like you think incarnation's in a really safe spot i think it's i, I think it's rather difficult to wipe here in addition to that they do have that one battle res available uh, if you see deaths on this fight normally it's just like it's it's very infrequently like a full team wipe i think you would need to like miss a spear at this point if you're incarnation um 
So things are definitely looking pretty good for them. They need to just make sure that they are going through the motions on this, uh, dealing with these abyssal detonations, baiting these run-throughs into good positions, and, and just making sure that they are able to clean up Davos. Uh, but things are looking pretty good for them. If you look on the left side of the screen, you see Yepers have engaged their triple angels. They pop their lust. They drop their spear as well. They're, they're trying to make sure that they're able to uh, put themselves in a position to where they can catch up if Incarnation does make a mistake. But Incarnation has dropped to 37% on Devos. They're about to enter that uh, next intermission. And then once they start throwing that javelin at the boss, it's kind of as good as dead. Yeah, and uh, the seven deaths of the side of Yepers really hurt, uh, even there at the end. Did they have a second spear to use on the Triple Angel, just the one spear? Uh, they only used one because they used the other one on... Uh, they used the other oh, one that on that pack, pack that they, they wiped up, uh, Yeah, that wiping on, yeah. I mean, that, that definitely hurts, right? Because you may get past those angels even faster slash easier, uh, you know, with that second spear. Especially when you use it on a pack that you don't even end up killing in the end. All right, now Dorky, uh, they have uh, dropped all those orbs into the middle. Dorky throwing that spear at Devos at 18% HP. It's going to take a little bit to kind of chew through this on a 23 Tyrannical. Not everybody's cooldowns are going to be up. You do see that Infernal's not available yet. Uh, the Shadow Blades isn't up. Uh, I don't see Coordinated Assault on the tracker, but maybe Coordinated Assault is up. At the end of the day, though, Incarnation, they're just kind of going to go through the motions, and they're going to be able to take map one. This was quite impressive. They were able to really recover from their run. Um, earlier in Spire's Ascension. Honestly, this looked really good for them. I was going to say, this might be the cleanest we've seen from Incarnation so far uh, this weekend, where, you know, you, you've had such a clean run here. You just had a, a death, I believe, on uh, Eryphreon and then uh, on the Angel space, so you really had nothing. Uh, no wipes throughout the rest of the dungeon. Uh, you know, the route was great. The percentage uh, was kind of perfectly leading up all the way to the end. They will take map number one. 2508 on the clock. Incarnation looking good. Yeah, absolutely. Great start for Incarnation. And, and it was a lot of what we were talking about going into it, too, where it's how are you going to manage the Sanguine Puddles? Like, how is your kiting going to be in various poles and things? Because uh, there, there's multiple, probably, I think, good routes in this dungeon, but how you handle the Sanguine this weekend seems to be the key to it. And Incarnation did a pretty, pretty sick job. I kind of agree with Tettles, uh, where... I, I do like the Windwalker Monk uh, in the Spires of Ascension uh, with the Ring of Peace just to displace some of the mobs. And yeah. it, it really didn't even seem like the Sanguine was the issue for uh, Yeppers. Just some like uh, you know, big pulls that uh, obviously trying to pull off in a game against Incarnation where they know they're going to have to, uh, that just went a little bit sideways. True yeah, and I think so. one of the nice things as well was that they didn't really have to think too much about what strategy they were using. Both teams actually just kind of net decked their strategy from somebody else. Yepers took their strategy from Echo. Incarnation took their strategy from Evolved. So they both just had blueprints on, of what to do in this dungeon. Unfortunately for Yepers, they picked the harder one and just weren't able to make it work. But Incarnation made those work perfectly. They had a pretty much perfect run, perfect dungeon. A couple spot deaths here and there, but, you know, not too bad. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of see where Yepers is coming from, where it's like, if you can't replicate what Echo is doing, then, like, how do you have a chance of even winning the tournament, I suppose? But there are a lot of dangerous pulls in that. There's a lot of big risks taken. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why Echo excels, right? Is they can take those risks and then it pays off for them, whereas other teams, you know, see how hard it really is sometimes. I would have loved to have heard the incarnation comms when Dorky gets knocked up and the orb goes through. Uh... I imagine mm -hmm. at that point they know they're kind of like cruising and it's almost like a moment where it's like, oh, we have to focus. <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like uh, a little bit of a focus up moment. Yeah. yeah, you can start to see where the dungeon went a little bit wrong for Yeppers here. This pull did not go well for them. When Sanguine Icker is top of the healing meter, you know that something's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> and they actually ended up having about 1.7 million Sanguine healing over the course of this yeah. pull. Whereas yep. over on the side of Incarnation, they opted for a much safer pull where they actually dealt with the Ether Divers on top of this stair pack instead of on top of the Goliath, and they perfectly kited them out. We'll see in a second here. They had no sanguine healing whatsoever on this pull, except for maybe like one tick here or there, but they played this very, very cleanly, albeit slower than so what someone like Echo would do, but when you're not fighting Echo, strats like this can work. You just play clean and play safe. Now, coming back to that Windwalker Monk pick, 
it's definitely like a really nice strategy, a nice idea. The biggest problem with the Kyrian Spear on Sanguine is if you kill things in the Sanguine Spear and everything else is still stunned there, they'll all get Sanguine healed. And then you can re knock them out with the Ring of Peace. The problem is if nothing is dead and then you knock everything out, you can't AoE CC it together. So Greater Mending Cast gets off, there's still Hellions alive. <laughs> and everyone just instantly dies. And at this point in the dungeon, Incarnation was so far ahead that it was just too much for effort to come back from. I mean, we talk about yeah. how good that DPS composition is a lot with the the Destro Warlock, the Windwalker Monk, and then the, the Surf Hunter, but you really want the mobs to be stacked for all three of those classes as well, like into pretty tight stacks. And then once you start ring of piecing them away, the pack better be dead. And that pack was at like 50% HP, basically, whenever they were yeah. starting, whenever that ring of peace came out. And that's, that's really scary. Yeah, you saw like a, a few dark lashes get off there, greater mending, like there was uh, a lot kind of making its way through. I think you mentioned uh, that was like, you know, the, the leg sweep doesn't hit everybody. And then those casts are all going off simultaneously. So there's no way to be like, hey, I didn't get that one, you know, uh, it's just like impossible at that moment to really kind of control the mobs and get the CCs needed. I, I like, I really like the concept of it, um, you know, but the execution was kind of lacking a little bit there. And so because of that, Incarnation will get map number one. Streets was banned, so that means we're going to Halls of Atonement for, I want to say, like, the third time today? Maybe it's only the second, uh, but... I think this is the it's just second. second time. We yeah, saw it in right. Dwarf Fist and uh, Apes Together Strong. I believe, yeah, be a lot of other, I believe a lot of other groups are just trying to get it out. Uh, and we only really saw it in that series because it was the game one. Um, I, I kind of... Uh, I think the way... Incarnation really kind of controlled the cool pulls in that spires with the Sanguine. I think bodes well for them here on Halls of Atonement with Sanguine in again. It's well, a scary dungeon, though. Sang the combination of Sanguine, Grievous, uh, Fortified, that's going to be like very long time. A lo it's going to be pulls that take a really long time that require a lot of coordination. And, you know, again, that's why we see a lot of people avoiding it. Here's some of our live stats with that one. So there's a couple problems in this Halls of Atonement as well, which is what one of the things that people are avoiding this dungeon for. Number one, highest key level at 24, Fortified and Grievous, all of which are annoying on their own, but then you also add in the Sanguine management on top of that, and it just becomes a really dangerous dungeon to deal with. Also, yeah. the main comp that people are running with has no curse to spell. And if you don't have a curse to spell in Halls of Atonement, people are going to die to the random curses if you don't interrupt them all or CC them all. So... It's just a really nasty dungeon in general, but we can't talk about Halls of Atonement without talking about the Triple Shard pull and the Bear pull, because that is what Incarnation <laughs> was known for last season. Do you think yeah. they're going to go for this? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think the answer is most likely not. I don't think there's any way of doing the Triple Shard pull with, the, uh, with Sanguine. I just don't think that's a thing. It's Maybe call, asking call a, a lot from but I, your cooldowns I, and your healers, yeah. I, I do wonder what uh, each group decides to run with comp-wise, though. Because uh, both groups that we saw earlier, I mean, Dwarf this ran the Resto Shaman the entire uh, you know, weekend. Uh, but Apes Together Strong ran the Resto Shaman here for probably the D-Curse, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they both ran the Vengeance Demon Hunter. So I wonder what we see uh, in terms of, like, because really... You know, outside of like maybe a DPS or so, neither of these teams has varied far uh, from the Blood DK Holy Priest combo. Mm -hmm. True. Well, we'll find out in a moment as we uh, get ready to get into the map. But uh, what what sort of it's it seems like Blood DK is sort of like going to be the the default for a lot of this. But so the the question is ironic. Like, what do you lose if you elect not to take the DK? Like, what do you why why would you be willing to give that up? You know what? Honestly, I can't think of any major reason why you would right now. The only option I would even <laughs> I consider running would be a Vengeance Demon Hunter, and that's just because mm -hmm. they bring the debuff. I think Blood is just way too strong in general to not take right now, especially when you when you have Dorky on your team, right? That guy is a Blood DK guy. Right. I think the question for this dungeon specifically is what do teams bring into their comp that brings the curse to spell? You already mentioned the rest of Shaman being a choice earlier on. I think an actual really good choice is Ellie Shaman. I think it's really, really good in this dungeon. Ancestral Guidance for one of the Thrashes will just top your group off on its own. Has the Curse Dispel is generally a very good DPS class right now. Mm -hmm. And it kind of slots right into the comp for these teams. You can just take the spot of the Rogue. Where are you getting your Venthyr buff from? 
Where, where are you going to get the Venthyr uh, buff from, too? Your Warlock can play Venthyr. It's fine. It's not great, but it's fine. I guess, yeah. They can play anything. <laughs> it's not going to be <laughs> yeah, the worst. Anything Sh but Necro, Sh evidently. Chain Harvest. Yeah. Uh, they can play Necro. We, they played it last season. <sighs> yeah, where would you... Um, trying to think. You wouldn't play... Uh, like chain harvest if you're the Ellie shaman right you would probably play you wouldn't want uh, to. a transfusion i guess blood could technically play bit there they don't really want to though <laughs> with some of the size pulls you would do not having kyrian would be a little scary yeah well, um, kyrian is just damage yeah for blood to get uh it's the dancing rune weapon uh I believe they get like runic power from it Oh, do they also get running power from their thing? Oh, okay. cool. From their it's extra dot? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, okay, so maybe they can't play Venthyr then. All right. Oh. So no Shaman, maybe, is, is what we're saying. Or no no uh, Elemental Shamans. Well, it's cool to Durky did play Necro earlier today on accident. <laughs> so <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, we'll have to digest it as we get started with the map. Uh, we'll see if Incarnation can close this thing out 2-0. It kind of makes they sense both. that it's double our shaman, yeah. Yeah, they both off of the resto shaman. Uh, Vesper totem still really strong uh, in terms of uh, I know a, a covenant ability and choice, especially with the legendary, uh, and then being able to combine that uh, with the uh, Earth Ellie Lego, uh, as you see, uh, that's on the side. Uh, the Earth Ellie with the earthquake directly underneath uh, adds an ton of extra damage in the mix. Uh, maybe not as much as Holy Priest right now, just because of the uncapped AoE boon, but still really strong. Yeah, I, I do think that Resto Shaman is one of the healers that... They probably do the highest amount of DPS if they're able to commit globals into DPSing. I think that the double damage legendary is most of the reason that they're able to do that, whereas uh, H Priest does have to run that, that healing legendary. I think that this composition makes sense on both ends. Uh, they are still running that rogue on both fronts, that that will be the source of that Pentheer buff. Obviously, we, we were talking about cutting the rogue potentially and bringing in something else, which was uh, where you would be like, all right, where, where are we even supposed to get Pentheer from? But whenever they are still running that rogue, it just makes sense that they're going to be the people that are controlling those Stoneborns. And you probably needed the rogue for the Shroud, unless you're going to do like a woe skip or something along those lines, right? Um, you do skip a lot of uh, you know the dungeon from Halkius to Echelon. So looks like Incarnation goes to the right hand side, grabs that shard. Uh, a, a shroud here from Yepers as they went left first, uh, grabbed some percentage in the shard, and now working their way in towards the right hand side. I'm interested in the. I'm interested to see how much backtracking Yepers is going to have to do. I, I think that the their routing is. So typically, whenever we look at MDI routing, we really are trying to avoid as much backtracking as possible, and Yepers is going to have to cross the map one more time to be able to make it back over to that other shard, because they did leave that bottom that bottom left one um, over there for them. And uh, right, did Yepers tank uh. just die and release? <laughs> yeah, I believe so. Is uh, He is coming back into the fight. Uh, it looks like you, brought, you had the Earth Ellie in there. Uh, it, it was binding, too. Yeah, so... Uh, right away going to use uh, Spirit Link. Uh, you need to give, I guess, uh, some time to actually just kind of generate power, right? Uh, to your DK coming back in. Uh, that hands a rune weapon, but this is really scary for Yepers. Oh, man. It's, it's going to be so difficult for their DK to be able to gain uh, threat back on this trash pack again. Like, getting the, the threat off of, just off of this Warlock <laughs> is going to be very, very arduous for this DK. <laughs> as, 55k. As you... Like double is, the next DPS. I mean, it, it's looking all right. They're, they're still just kiting out the pack. They're making sure that they maintain slows from the Earthbind Totem um, on all of these Gargans. And it looks like Roth finally has a regain, regained threat on everything. Uh, Loyal Beast starts going off, but it does get stopped uh, by Lazelle from the side of Yepers. Uh, that was a decent recovery, but Incarnation has now started again, kind of similar to that Spires of Ascension. It's just like a couple of minor mistakes for Yepers. It's not a ton of deaths. It's not a full wipe or anything. But that allows Incarnation to really start to open up a lead. And when we uh, cast it a little bit earlier, it was like Apes Together Strong versus Dwarf This. It really came down to the routing between the two teams. Uh, you know, kind of just like the general pathing uh, of the map. And I believe Dwarf This, they ended up taking it. And they started on that right-hand side first, a lot like Incarnation, and then kind of working their way left-hand, grabbing this shard, and then, you know, a bigger pull down there uh, into the shard underneath. Uh, 
it just seems like you were mentioning like don't like uh, to see a ton of backtracking uh in terms of like you know the uh the mdi and yeah. where it seems like Yepers' uh kind of route takes them that way uh, it's one of those things that you definitely can so whenever we were looking at streets there was a lot of backtracking in streets but that's because there's yeah. a lot of rp that you would like to start in streets whereas for uh for this dungeon in particular halls of atonement we haven't seen much backtracking in any season a lot of the times the teams will do like a double shard pull up the left side or just go shard into shard on the left side uh kind of similar to what you see incarnation doing here where it just makes sure that they don't have to run all the way back over to that side where we're going to see yepers here after they're dealing with this shard um they're going to have to cross the map of course there is just a slight difference whenever you have to contemplate like where your offensive CDs are going to be available. And so that's going to be the difference there. But whenever you're not running like a Holy Paladin, there's no like Ash and Hollow to really think of. Uh, Warlocks kind of always have Infernal available to them. Vesper uh, Totem with like Anikos and whatnot is always available like every single pack. Uh, I don't respect healers, so maybe not that one okay. good. <laughs> so, 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 maybe, so maybe you're not too familiar. But hey, they do have it all the time. It's an ability. Uh, it does really well. Um, and yeah, with the cooldown reduction from Mechanicos, you have it up like almost like every single pull. That one for Incarnation actually got a little bit uh, sketchy. Uh, Yumi did not have like Spearling, no Healing Tide, no uh, Ascendance, and everybody was just getting stacked to the Grievous. I believe it was just like a huge Cloudburst totem uh, that ended up going off, just bringing everybody back up. Is uh, Both teams at about the same point in the dungeon, but Incarnation uh, a little bit higher on their percent and also making it uh, towards that shard a little bit faster. Interestingly enough, uh, Yummy on the side of Incarnation is running a, a weird legendary. He's not running that Earth Ellie Earthquake legendary. Hmm. He's running um, Chains of Devastation, where casting Chain Heal makes your next Chain Lightning instant cast and deal 50% increased damage. That's quite... How popular of a pick is that really for Resto Shaman? It, it's... It's like kind of coming into play. Uh, I saw there was actually a little bit of a meme build where you actually didn't even bring a Resto Shaman. You just brought another Ellie Shaman and you actually just ran that <laughs> and just spam Chain Heals uh, down with like Healing Tides. But uh, it's definitely coming up. You can actually just gain that uh, more often. And then also I believe uh, with uh, Resto Shaman, their tier set is uh, something that's connected to the Chain Heal uh, as well. Uh, so may have some extra synergy in terms of uh, connected to their tier set with that extra uh, chain heal buff. I believe it's something uh, in regards to uh, chain heal reducing the cooldown of their last totem uh, going into that. So you could end up you know, having more healing tides. Uh, I believe that uh, CDR also factors into Vesper totem, although you have it up all of the time. Uh, and chain lightning is probably the number one thing you want to cast with the Vesper totem. Uh, it just adds tons of extra damage to the table. Oh, a few other, a few more deaths on the side of Yepers. A little bit of Sanguine healing as well. I, I think that Incarnation is starting to open up a, a slight lead, kind of again, kind of similar to what we saw in that Spires of Ascension, where Incarnation, even before the first boss, looks like they're somewhere in the range of 45 seconds to maybe even a minute ahead in a dungeon that is historically very short. I, I would expect like a 24 fortified of this dungeon to maybe be like 15 minutes at the absolute most. And we're really on the back half here. Incarnation finally downs their uh, last shard of Halkius. They, they, they're going to do like one more trash pull while Halkius' energy is uh, charging up. You can see it at the bottom, the anima um, bar. So Incarnation just has like one final trash pull to deal with before um, engaging the boss. But this is looking really good for them. Yeah, they'll probably grab the Stoneborn Goliath from up top and then the one from behind and have the double for this pack. And uh, as you were mentioning that legendary with, you know, the, uh, the chain heal affects chain lightning, as you see just the chain lightning instacast going off. Uh, so the way their tier set works, like uh, crit, healing, uh, crit healing increases the crit chance your chain lightning, uh, chain healing, sorry. Uh, and then chain heal actually crits, reduces the cooldowns of totems. Uh, so you can obviously with the ability to just get constant instant cast chain heals uh, probably have a lot of these totems on uh, you know, a faster CD is you can actually see from the top of the screen a little bit like how like he, he's getting like chunks of some of the, of the uh, healing tides totems down at times so being able to work that back in the day. Alright so now Junkrat has engaged in, in mind control double bat 
Uh, if you do end up using your extra action button whenever two stone forms are active and you're just like mashing it over and over again, you are able to mind control two of them at once. And, and so now you're going to see Junkrat's damage. Look at that, 45k uh, DPS right here off the off the rip. Uh, those breaths from those loyal stoneborns are going to be tearing into Halkius. You did see Dorky grab that trash pack right on top of the boss. We're going to watch the boss uh, get moved right out after this heavy debris. Ooh, a nice binding shot coming out to keep the, the trash away from the boss. This is going to allow for a little bit better sanguine management. There aren't any displacements really in this... Uh in this group outside oh. of like the DK grip, so if there's anything that's like super bad, oh no, that Houndmaster just left it in the Oh, and you have the two right here in front getting really low as well. Oh, oh they're gonna foil. have to get creative where they move this boss. Okay, this is honestly not that bad. So they didn't heal the boss. Uh, that's the most important thing. A little bit of Sanguine healing, uh, about 450k healing from Sanguine, but 0% of that was on the was on the boss, which that was the obviously the most important thing. That Houndmaster did just kind of disengage into the into the sanguine, which you don't love, but you're not that upset about it. No, and I mean, Yepers, I mean, they gave such a great lead, right? I mean, Yepers hasn't even started the boss yet, as they're just going to pull Alkias as a... Did they not... Did they not grab both of the Stoneborns? Uh, no, no, it no, looks no. like they only got one. Uh, they, they did. Uh, Incarnation, Growl uh, dropped a Tremor Totem, walked out, hexed the patrol, and then the... Uh, so let himself get feared. He blends it with his own tremor, and he walks back. That was that was a weird play. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. That was very very cool. Normally I just yell for a dispel if I get feared, but as the healer, you're not really at the liberty of asking somebody else to dispel you. I guess. No, it's a really unique use of the tremor totem, right? <laughs> I honestly didn't even think of that. Uh, that's something you'd be able to do also for the rest of the shop into the mix is. Uh, the Shaman has been really effective in this dungeon in multiple different ways thus far. So that'll be Halkius out of the way uh, for Incarnation. They'll make their way up towards the stairs. Already at 81%. Uh, going to shroud all the way up to Echelon. Oh, okay. So they, they had to wait a second for that um, Stoneborn to expire. Yeah. Uh, they, since they grabbed it a little bit later, they, they needed to wait a second because it was going to cop out them. I think um, they're going like to try fate. and pull one of the Stoneborns from down low up to this boss. I mean, Dorky loves risky. doing that. Dorky does love doing that, but it is really risky. <laughs> um, we, saw, we saw Incarnation do it during TGP, but during TGP, you are uh, valuing those Stoneborns as an effective amount. Like, they're like a higher percentage of your DPS over the course of the whole entire dungeon just because um, they are just pumping out like a, like a higher percentage yeah. of damage on like a 29 and stuff like that. I don't think it makes a lot of sense whenever you're doing it on a 24 in this season. Yeah. So Incarnation electing to not grab that. But hey, we have that Resto Shaman that we talked about. This is one of the biggest reasons that you're running that Resto Shaman is the availability of that Dispel. And uh, Yummy on the side of Incarnation, not able to get out of that Echelon lead. Accidentally ended up getting hit by it, but uh, he was able to top himself back up. So it was honestly not that big of a deal. Yeah, and they are going to get the Ur buff here, just bringing everybody back to 100% uh, HP. The, the healing buff from Ur uh, allows them to actually kind of keep some of the extra you know, healing cooldowns that they would have probably had to use there. Like, you don't have to use a Link, you don't have to use the Ascendance. Uh, healing Tide still available. Uh, you can just keep the Cloud Burst and the Vesper Totems just rolling in the build that you're running right here. So, uh, Incarnation looking really good. It looks like Yeppers. Uh, deals with that first boss uh, a little bit more. Ooh. They're actually going to have to... The, whoa, they had a death here as well. I think it was a Dark Blade Frontal. I'm yeah. not 100% sure. That's like the only thing that would even make sense is like a Deadly Thrust death uh, at, the, at that point of the dungeon. Yeah, when... You know, Dranos was mentioned earlier, like, you know, with uh, the, the Star Seer, but uh, like, it's so difficult to see like the frontals on those and Halls of Atonement... Uh, I mean, this is a 45-24. They have a lot of you know, frontal cast, some of these mobs downstairs that, yeah, they would insta-kill you, uh, that type of situation, especially uh, what it doesn't look like. Yeah, uh, Lazel's cheat death was uh, already proc, so it didn't have that. All right, and now Incarnation has down the second boss of the instance. Yepper's still in that first boss area, dealing with uh, just a little bit more trash before even making their way to Echelon. Incarnation, I would describe this as a massive lead for them, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, Yepers has not even pulled Echelon yet. Uh, now using the Woe, they're maybe going to have a little bit of the Woe, the damage reduction here for the beginning. <laughs> it's, you're just so far behind. Like, it, it, I, 
I'd have to imagine, uh, I'd love your opinion, I feel like this dungeon would have to be one of the hardest to just, like, make up time on, because you have most of the percentage done. Uh, from this moment on, it's really just, like, a straight uh, shot? Like, I mean, what are you hoping for here if your Yepper's, like, a kind of a wipe on one of these pulls? Incarnation slams a bear pull into the third boss, and Sanguine heals at the pull. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, it's definitely within the realm of possibility. I've seen... I know that Dorky will do some weird stuff, so it's definitely not out of the realm of chance. They did they did kind of slow pull that first pack, uh, so they, they aren't pulling everything into this third boss, but they are at least pulling uh, some stuff. Uh, Growl, blink twice if you're pulling trash into the boss. Hold on. Let's see if he'll blink. All right, he's not blinking. Oh, wait. Hold oh, on, he's blinking. Once. Oh, okay. So they, he, Growl says that they are, but it looks like they're not. So maybe he's lying to us. Yeah, is uh, we did see one group uh, that Wait, pulled this all the way. Are. Okay, so here we are <laughs> going right into the boss. As uh, you're gonna have all that trash, the double relics that you have an Ur already up, uh, and they have the Stoneborns active. Yep, here they come. They're lagging a little bit behind. They're, this platform is not big to begin with. Like if you get some sanguine here, it is it is a, a, a lot of trouble. So they do have binding shot, but they don't have a like really good displacement. Um, so they don't have like Shining Force. They do have like a mass grip that they can use to try to move some of these mobs. But they have to be super careful about Sanguine Healing here, especially with High Adjudicator Elise, known for casting a lot of like these bolts. There's like a uh, bolt volley as well. There's a lot of interrupts that need to be going off here. So it it's all about Incarnation making sure that they're able to mitigate the Sanguine Healing on the boss itself. I, I think for like the trash, it's not great if like the Collectors or the Dark Blades are, are sitting in the Sanguine, but you really need to make sure that that boss is moved out. Yeah, you don't want to have to deal with the boss getting more health. Some of those, like, uh, no, the ghastly ghost coming out, and you're trying to find the, the lanterns and uh, everything. They get the vibe up here, uh, secondary. It looks like they've been dealing with this quite well. So uh, that large pull ended up paying off. A spirit link here as players are getting a little bit low. Uh, we're going to be able to top everybody back off. On the side of Yeppers, uh, they are just getting Echelon down now. So uh, we'll have to see how they kind of go about these next... Uh, wing of the dungeon. Uh, that was one where Incarnation kind of like pulled the ones with the bears. Junkrat gets really low from their side. Uh, and then pulled the next pack into the boss. We'll see what Yeppers decides to do here. The, the, interesting stat. Did you know that this is the first time that this dungeon, um, whenever the teams were allowed to play oh. it, they have played it. Every other time it's been banned. Yeah. And Yeppers going down. This is so... Oh, no. They're going to have a full yeah. team wipe. They looked like they were getting ready to shroud into High Adjudicator Elise, but they just have a minor hiccup and it's like once one death happens to your healer it's going to be a full team wipe for yuppers and this is probably going to be the end of the dungeon for them incarnation downing high adjudicator elise oh man that's i so hope sad. i get to replay that because it looked like uh it was the tank that went down first it looked like rafu may have taken the warlock gate uh in just kind of like put him in an odd spot like in between uh the doorway in the right and uh yeah this has been the this has been the dungeon that has been banned by a lot of teams thus far. We only saw it in the Dwarf this versus uh, Apes Together Strong matchup because it was the first dungeon in yeah. the match. Uh, where it couldn't have been banned. Yeah, I really hope that Zyronic gets a replay and so we can see what happened with that Shroud. Uh, but... But overall, I, I think this is basically just Incarnation's game. Um, they could even mess up this Inquisitor Cigar Room. This Inquisitor Cigar Room is, yeah. is not the easiest. So in a lot of seasons... Um, Moonkin's been fairly popular, and they're able to kind of like say. solo solo this room. Um, however, like with the season, it's just like with Warlock plus uh, Sub Rogue plus Surf Hunter. Like it's not great. In addition to that, it is on a twenty four. Like it, so, if you wanted to bring like a Stoneborn into here, like we've seen teams at, <laughs> at times double Stoneborn Inquisitor Cigar to where you're able to push it before. Um, any of the casts go off, but at oh. this level, it's not really a thing that you can do. So you're in a weird <laughs> spot where you have to clear the room with not a not a sick cop at dealing with it. So it takes a long time, but it's th they're still so far ahead to where any mistake in this room oh, is not going to do anything. And Yepers had to backtrack to go find a set of relics to get a whoa uh, uh. because they don't have the ability to skip, which uh, that is tough as a. Uh, you know, I think I think everybody's been there before, especially when you're skipping so much of the dungeon. I have an incarnation the other day when they skipped so much of the plague fall uh, and they were not able to get a Glavrock down the first boss, and they, they were in a ton of trouble. But uh, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> you know, we, we, hey, we we've all been there. Back out and, and, and reset. Uh, but uh, yeah, they do get by, and they just have Lord Chamberlain to go. 
Uh, looks like taking a second to Be get gone, ready before rebel. pulling in. Uh, you know, everything goes smooth here on Lord Chamberlain. I mean, uh, things would have to really kind of fall apart, uh, you know, in historic fashion, I think. Uh, reincarnation here where kind of just uh, going home free. How far do you think this team can go? Like, uh, we, they, you know, they had that poor showing the other day, but today they've been really clean. Uh, it's it's crazy because, uh, like, I've, I've talked to these guys a bit, and, and they, so for seasons past, they put in a ton of time into their practice. Uh, they practice for TGPs and stuff like that. But lately, they've just been doing live keys and just kind of hanging out as a team, uh, maybe putting in a lot less um, time. Oh, gosh. Uh, Junkrat ends up going down here. I think overall, though, like, the team is still uh, playing together a decent amount. Uh, and while they haven't put a ton of time and practice in on like these level of keys, they're able to still just have very clean and consistent runs. Uh, so to answer the question of like how far can they go, I think that fourth for them seems like really reasonable. But at the same time, if they get a top three finish, I wouldn't be overly surprised because this team is very talented. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think people after yesterday's performance would have been like hard pressed to see like a top three performance uh, out of them, but. Uh, today, their runs have looked uh, really smooth. I mean, obviously, earlier, way earlier in the day, but Baldi looked great uh, when we saw them. So uh, maybe some competition uh, for Echo as we move into tomorrow is uh, Lord Chamberlain, 41% uh, and dropping fast. I'm, I'm curious to see uh, uh, if this uh, build from Yumi for the Resto Shaman actually starts to come into play. Because uh, typically, like, the default Lego for you know, damage has always been the uh, Earth Elite Earthquake one. Uh, but some interesting synergies, like obviously with the Vesper Totem and Chain Lightning, uh, with that type of legendary. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of it comes down to how how many damage globals are you realistically going to be able to output. Yeah, I yeah. think a, I I do think You're that DK, uh, just like as a tank, is going way. to allow for a lot more viability of that legendary option with, uh, over other tanks because you don't really have to kill DK a lot. They're going to be mostly self sufficient, dude. Dorky is out DPSing Azuna. On, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Azuna's doing DK damage. He's doing tank damage. What is going on? What is Blood Death Knight? Uh, Blood DK out, uh, out uh, DPSing a Warlock and out healing a Resto Shaman. Just, uh, Blood He's, doing <laughs> He's doing tank damage. He's doing tank damage. Why is Growl's camera flipping over doing 360s uh, yeah <laughs> yeah Growl, blink twice if you just won the series uh, Growl, hey at least as soon as pulled ahead at the, the end you know <laughs> oh just blinked all right oh yeah, there we wow. go good job wow all right well that was uh that was a quite a performance by incarnationally two deaths in the end there they will move on uh they absolutely destroyed that uh that dungeon and yeah, I don't have any explanation for the blood DK thing, man. I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just frightening. That's all. Clearly, Warlock is in need of some major, major buffs. Yeah, we got to buff Warlock. Offset some of the problems. In the oh my gosh, I'm really Angry. tired. Warlock can't even, <laughs> can't even have Shut DPS up, tanks, Moonkin. <laughs> Warlock speaking, literally Warlock speaking. Don't talk. <laughs> Enhancement Shaman here. I don't know what my uh, real rank is in all of this, but. Uh... Why is, sure Why is the totem talking? Why is the totem talking? Why is the wind fairy totem speaking at us? Oh, that's harsh, I man. That, I that's harsh. Added a, no respect for wind shear. Come on. The wind fury totem. That's kind of crazy. No respect for our our incredible uh, interrupt cooldown. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, growl at seven point seven k DPS. Interesting. Huh. Not not bad at all. Solid. Did get out DPS overall by Zatsy, but remember, the Eppers didn't actually pull the final boss yet, so that'd be a big downgrade in terms of over overall DPS. True, true. We don't have the the complete stats there because the the dungeon wasn't uh, wasn't finished, but that's uh, it is significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? Before uh, before everybody started running like Holy Priest, right? Like uh, Kiri and Resto Shaman was like the go-to uh, you know, damage dealer in terms of like healers. Uh, I would say kind of like taking the Ashen nerfs like out of the equation, like once that kind of came through, like you know, Kiri and Resto Shaman was like, kind of the way to go. Uh, but mm -hmm. Holy Priest recently, uh, I know, and I think probably Holy Priest just because of the size of pulls people do here uh, in the MDI, like really kind of stepping up with the Boon of the Ascendant. And I don't want to be mean to you guys, but honestly, there wasn't a lot to 
analyzed this dungeon. It was just clean play from Incarnation and random spot yeah. deaths everywhere for Yeppers. You guys did ask for the the Shroud mistake. I didn't even see the Shroud mistake because honestly, I had it in my mind that I didn't really want to harp on any of the major mistakes from Yeppers. They were so far behind at that point. I think we might have gotten a clip of it at the end here. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. It, here looks it is. Like is this it? Yeah. Is this it? Yeah. They did shroud, but he. But the tank, oh. no, the tank just died. That's all. I think, That's I all think the tank was. just like died. Yeah. The tank oh, just okay. straight up died. Yeah. The yeah, shroud was for them to stay out of combat, so that their tank would only mm -hmm. be the only one that has aggro on anything with minimal help. But it just didn't work out for him. So. Unfortunate for Yepper, is going to have to see them gone. We're down to our final four, though, for tomorrow, though. Yeah. It's a pretty exciting final four. Yeah, that's right. We're going to see the bracket in a moment. But as I try to reconstruct it, looking at the one from earlier in the day, it's uh, going to be uh, Echo and Baldi in the upper bracket for that uh, match. And then down the lower bracket, we're going to have, uh, I believe it's going to be the Wizards which said Incarnation versus Evolved, right? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incarnation yeah, Evolved. Yeah. Uh... yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, never mind. My brain Evolved still want to dwarf this to go through, I guess. Yeah, which uh, I believe that Evolved uh, Incarnation uh, matchup is a rematch, right? I believe they met up uh, earlier yeah. on uh, in the bracket. I believe that like that was like their round once. Uh, it was the last like, match yesterday, yeah. Yeah, it knocked Incarnation down into the elimination bracket. So mm -hmm. uh, get another look uh, at that matchup. I, I fully expect that to be way closer. I think Evolved's played really strong, but Incarnation at a... a just a rough series against them. I, I expect them to play more like today and bounce back. I think we saw a totally different incarnation today than we did yesterday. We, we saw an incarnation with 24 hours more of practice, I think is what it came down to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think looking forward to tomorrow, that matchup between Evolved and Incarnation, the dungeon pool for their series is Plaguefall is the first match, so they're going to play Plaguefall regardless. But they have Court, Streets, Theater, and Gambit. So Three of the Kryptonite dungeons that Evolved has performed poorly on for all hmm. of today are in that. Both Tazavesh dungeons and Cortisars, so they're going to have to get practice in between now and tomorrow if they want to have a good shot at taking that series over Incarnation. What, what do you think the odds are that Incarnation beats Evolved in that series? Hmm. I think I think that Evolved is still definitely the favorite by like a decent bit, aren't they? Because they, I mean, they two owed them in the first... It, hmm. Do you have uh, I mean, they two owed them in the lower... Okay. Oh, I, d I do. I don't know where it is uh, at the moment. It's, it's, oh, uh, dang. If it's you're not incarnation, at the desk would you me. not Would you not remove Court of Stars? Like, just force Evolve to get rid of it? I don't know. It's such a tough I mean, choice with that with that dungeon pool. And we had best, We had both Tazavesh, right, in that one? Mm -hmm. Potentially, too? Uh, yeah, so you definitely want Evolve to play on that if you're Incarnation. Well, and Incarnation probably would have loved to get rid of the Plague Ball because that was the one in the Evolved series which went really sideways for them. Uh, yeah. And that's the first match of that series. Uh, yeah, so you can't. So you can't get rid of that. Mm -hmm. You'd want something obviously falling after that that you feel really strong about. Uh, and with uh, what I believe Evolved is being the higher seed, obviously, so better times on Streets and Gambit, you would look mm -hmm. at maybe trying to keep Court of Stars in, or seeing if Evolved is going to get rid of it. Um, it, it might be interesting, because like, if you are, uh, you know, if you're kind of looking at some of the dungeons that other people may not have put time in as well, it may be Court of Stars, right? So yeah. that might be a way to like kind of like even the playing field a little bit. It could be. That one's going to be exciting. We should talk a little bit too about uh, Echo versus Baldi as well, too. I mean, is, is that going to be a situation where we expect Echo to get through? Baldi looked really good today. I mean, they might kind of give him a run for their money, or is Echo just going to be the final boss by default? I mean, these are two teams that have gone against one another for so many seasons. It feels like every si for a long time, this uh, this Baldi team versus Echo was like the grand finals of like the whole entire season for a lot of years. Um, I, I, I do think it's going to be an incredibly competitive match. It seems like Echo had a slight edge in a couple of the in a couple of the like series that we saw earlier today. But at the same time, I do think that I think that Baldi can be incredibly good in the dungeons that they are really well practiced in, and they they looked quite strong. Well, here are uh, the affixes again for Group A. As you can see, there's quite a bit to deal with. More than anything, though. I think Sanguine is kind of the the big winner today, as far as like uh, most most devastating Hafex. Oh. I'm gonna give that award to Sanguine. Yeah, I mean that first match, uh, the first map with 
between Echo and Baldi is going to be the Necrotic Wake. I mean, those mm -hmm. are going to be... That is going to be fast times uh, between those two teams. I mean, that is going to be like an 11-minute... Uh, what, I believe Echo is like 11.42 today <laughs> with one death. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be super fast. I'm, I'm really interested to see what those teams ban and remove because... Uh, but Baldi at uh Baldi and Trials had like a almost like a fourteen minute streets. They saw uh you know Echo today do like an eighteen minutes one, so maybe you're okay with that. And then we've already seen uh Court of Stars out of Baldi and it went quite well. Although eleven deaths, but those were like mostly to the Inquisitor just kind of like coming up <laughs> out of the spawn again and again. Yep. Uh where I think uh, that series I think will be close. I think a lot of it could be like really kind of how the bands go and what the, each team decides to get rid of and try and like force the other to play i'm curious too to see if echo can kind of retake the uh, necrotic wake record from this weekend away from uh, evolved who beat them by uh three seconds today i think it was like what 12 39 or something like that yeah i was thinking in my head as as evolved beat the record i could think echo's sitting off there on the side going and i took that personally <laughs> <laughs> oh no yeah. That, oh yeah. no wait a they second might. <laughs> So we might see them just put out like a 10:30 necrotic wake out of nowhere because that's just what they're capable of somehow. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be sick, that's for sure. But a lot to look forward to tomorrow, uh, and don't forget you can also sign up for the Last Stand tournament. That's right. Uh, we're gonna see some of the teams that got knocked out today, hopefully playing in that one. But uh, you can also sign up for it as well too and have a chance to earn the encrypted banner of the opportune, which is great. Like I said yesterday to slam down uh, when a dungeon goes poorly, somebody leaves, the key is dead, you slam it down, you're just like, wasn't me. I got the banner. That's mostly what I get it for. invited. <laughs> <laughs> that's, don't well, that's true. You don't need to get invited, though. You mean invited to the group or invited to the tournament? Feral. Invited to a group, yeah, it's so hard feral. to get into groups now. Yeah, I, hey, I'm the enhancement you shaman, yeah, you, you, I know all about not being invited to groups. I can be like 20 huh. eye level up over everybody else in the queue, and they're like, nah. <laughs> they don't get it. You just gotta pump no your score up, Doa. That's what you gotta do. And we're gonna yeah, that's score. Right. We'll work on it together. Help me. I just look so just upset with <laughs> I, you. I'm like just, I'm so parent. upset. <laughs> I, I hate, I hate LFG because I have a warlock with four piece that was like 2,500 score, and I was still not getting invited. Pugs are just the worst. It's so hard to get into keys. Pugs are. You just need to name your characters like Real Zironic One, Real Zironic Two. You know, I don't know if that. that I assume that would help. TTV Zironic. <laughs> it does. Yeah, get I would TTV never do that. There. People <laughs> who put TTV in their name are the worst. That's a rant I can go on another day. Though. <laughs> We gotta wrap it up here. What, what do you mean? You what are you trying to say? Oh, self marketing. Yeah, you know. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah. He's not a fan of the old uh, the self marketers. But you know what? We're gonna self market ourselves right now. Come back tomorrow for the final day of the <laughs> Mythic Dungeon International. That's right. We got one more day to go. Four matches. It's gonna be awesome. Same time, same channel. Until then, thanks for watching, everybody. Go play some WoW. Have a good time, uh, and we will see you tomorrow. G